as well as a nexus between migration and violence. This conference is a second in the Mellon funded Sawyer seminar, seminar, rethinking the dynamic interplay of migration, race and ethnicity in the Caribbean and Latin America, which is a collaboration between the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies, the Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice and the Africana Studies Department, Rights and Reason Theater. Migration is at the center of some of the world's major challenges, global instability, climate change, deep inequity and access to resources and racism, among others. The Ukraine refugee crisis is the most recent example of quite a few recent examples of the traumatic and dramatic effect of conflict and war on people's lives, driving millions to flee their homes for uncertain futures in neighboring countries. I think what is so has been so dramatically um, revealed to us in TV footage over the last few weeks is how easy it is to become a refugee. Usually we think of, of um, forced migration happening to other people, not to us. And, you know, this gives us, should give us some pause to think about the dramatic ways in people's lives can be upended in, in, in from one minute to the next. Each new dramatic conflict shifts focus from ongoing conflicts with human suffering continuing outside of the gaze of the media. Aid agencies struggle to keep up with the new demands for help as famines threaten displaced populations or those struggling to recover from war in Tigray, Afghanistan and Yemen, Syria, among others. Of course, in our region, there is a slow burn of violence driving people to cross borders in search of stability, not to mention the violence that they experience along the way. Climate change, in particular, the intensity of hurricanes, floods, droughts, and other weather events has produced its own displacement, but has also aggra aggravated the conditions of those already existing in precarious situations. The COVID pandemic has also increased the challenges that these uh, people face. Women and children whose numbers among the displaced have been increasing are particularly vulnerable. Existing prejudices based on racism, class, ethnicity, gender, sexuality, also compound challenges that, such, that migrants face, often making the, marking the desirable from the undesirable migrant and how we speak of them and treat them as a result. Migration also places a huge burden on receiving states. Our conference opened yesterday with a keynote address by Panama's Minister of Foreign Affairs, Erica Munez, who spoke to the particular challenges of migrants making a perilous journey through the Darien Gap and the need for regional approaches, both to alleviate the immediate suffering but also to work on longer term strategies to address the root causes of migrations within the region. The plight of refugees, as we have seen in particular with the large numbers of Venezuelans fleeing political instability and Haitians fleeing, not just political instability, but also natural disasters across the region would suggest a regional approach is necessary. No one country has the resources on its own to address these issues. This is the second of two conferences I mentioned on migration that we have held under the auspices of the Mellon Sawyer Seminar on Migration. The first was held last November under the theme Migration, Race and Development in Latin America and is available on the YouTube channels of the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies and the Watson Institute. Yesterday, we launched the exhibition, Breaking Out, Immigrant Art from Steward Detention Center, curated by a Mellon Sawyer postdoctoral fellow, Christian Collins, with support from the Art at Watson Committee, 
which presents a poignant and personal perspective into the experiences of migrants held at one detention center. The importance of this exhibition, which we hope to have available online sometime in the future, is that it rescues the individual voices that are often lost in the enormity of numbers. It reminds us that at the center of the millions of people who are forced to move across borders in the region and into the United States, there are individual hopes and dreams. They are people no different from us. This conference would not have been possible with, without the guidance of a steering committee comprised of Professors Brian Meeks and Tony Books, who are co-collaborators with the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies on the, on the Melon Sawyer um, initiative. The other members of, of our steering committee include Jerry Augusto, Pablo Rodriguez, Andrea Flores, Rich Snyder, Lisa Biggs, Kevin Escudero, Patricia Figaro, Maya Gamble, and Maya Gamble Rivers. We owe a special debt to the work of Dr. Kristen Collins, our Sawyer Semner um, postdoctoral fellow, who has led the conference organizing committee that comprises Alexandra Miller and Karen De Paula Motor, our post, our doctoral, um, our sorry, our Sawyer Seminar graduate proctors, and our Watson Directors Fellow, Frank Batista Kunhart. Again, a special acknowledgement for Alexandra as well for her role in organizing um, the conference. We also owe thanks to Claxis Center the manager, Kate Goldman, and director of undergraduate studies, Erica Durante, who also contributed um, as a member of the Adad Watson Committee in yesterday's um, exhibition. I would also like to thank our CLAC student assistant, Felipe Felix Mendez, who was very important in helping us to um, reach out to Minister um, Moines, our keynote speaker yesterday, and Professor Ed Steinfeld, director of the Watson Institute for his remarks at yesterday's opening ceremony. I, I'm particularly grateful to our panelists who thought that our holding a conference on what we thought was an important um, topic, that they also thought it was important enough to share their time with us. We would not have a conference without you. I'm also particularly grateful to our audience who have shown up and we look forward to, see, forward to seeing you um, throughout the different panels today. I just want to remind you that there is only one link. So the link you had, if you, the link you're on now will be the link that you would use to access all of the panels. Also just want to give a heads up of the events we have today. At 9.30, our first panel will, for the day will begin. Migrants' identity shaping their new homes through development. And this is a fully Zoom panel, fully online. And it's followed by our 11.15 panel, Cultural and Racial Exclusions, Diaspora and the Construction of the Nation, which again is um, on Zoom, fully on Zoom. Then in the afternoon, we begin again at two o'clock with a hybrid panel, Migrations Across Generations and Regions, featuring Brown undergraduate um, student research. And last, last November, our first conference, I mean, our students, were just 
you know, amazing. And we really hope that you that you're able to turn out for that panel. At 345, we have the panel fully on Zoom. Lessons for Migration Studies, Centering Embodied Experience in Scholarship. And this panel will also um, have interpretation, um, Spanish interpretation. And our last event for the day is at five o'clock, again, a hybrid conference. And this is will feature a um, conversation between writers, Karina Saiz Borgo and Dolores Reyes. Um, Karina is from Venezuela and Dolores, Dolores is from Argentina. So we really hope that you join us for these events. Um, thank you very much. Um, I don't know if any, if there are any other announcements that I need to make. Okay, so we will sign off now, just hang around or come back to at 9.30 for our first event. Thank you all so very much.
and to feel. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Kevin Escudero. I'm uh, the moderator for today's panel. So we can go ahead and get started if that sounds good to everybody. Um, hold on here. So um, just wanted to say welcome and good morning to everyone. Um, welcome to today's panel, which is entitled Migrants Identities Shaping Their New Homes Through Development. Um, we have three panelists that are gonna be presenting uh, their work today. Um, and we're going to have about 20 minutes for each panelist. Then after each panelist goes, um, we will then uh, have a section for Q&A, and we definitely encourage folks to share your questions um, in the chat as part of the Q&A discussion, and folks can also unmute themselves uh, and pose their questions if you'd like as well. Um, I thought we'd go in the order that folks are listed in the program. So what I'll do is I'll give a brief introduction of the person, um, then I'll turn it over to them to do their presentation. Then I'll do the introduction for the next individual, turn it over to them, et cetera. Um, yeah, and if folks have any questions, uh, feel free to let us know. So our first presentation is by Jonathan Aposta from Brown University, who's giving a presentation entitled Rust Belt Survival, Immigrant Incorporation in a Post-Industrial New England City. And I'll just read a brief bio of uh, Jonathan. So Acosta's research interests include inequality, race, ethnicity, political participation, local governance, the relationship between civil society and the state, urban sociology, and political sociology. He's currently wrapping up a project looking at the political attitudes and ethnicity in Bolivia and starting a project on community study of Central Falls, Rhode Island, uh, or Central Falls, Rhode Island's most densely populated city. His hobbies include coaching youth wrestling, serving as a state senator in Rhode Island's 16th district and contemplating the meaning of life at the GCB. So I will turn it over to Acosta. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Professor Escalera. Let me try to get my slides up and make sure everybody can see them. And if that's good, then we'll go ahead and kick off. Um, is that good for folks? Can people see? If someone could send like a, a thumbs up or something. Can't really see anybody. Is that, is yeah, that we can see it. We can All see right. it. Perfect, perfect, perfect. All right, so we'll get it started. So again, I want to just say good morning and, and, and thank you for, for, for putting this together to the organizers. And it's a, it's a pleasure uh, to be here on this panel. Uh, the title of my presentation today is Rust Belt Survival, Immigrant Incorporation in a Post-Industrial New England City. This is preliminary work, so I want to open with that. Uh, as Professor Escalero mentioned, I am currently in the stages of conducting my dissertation. And so I'm very interested in, in getting feedback and, and learning from, from this space and from the folks here at this conference. Um, my name is Jonathan Acosta Opegi. And with this panel, I'll be situating kind of my, my bigger project uh, within the experience of how migrants in the community that I'm studying have been shaping uh, their new homes through development. So from the late 80s on, there's an emergence of a fairly large literature on Rust Belt cities and their decline. And some of this literature has suggested that immigrants have been or could revitalize these cities, but this literature stops at the city gates. Um, most of the work is has largely in urban sociology and the city is the unit of analysis. It usually doesn't tell us much about the immigrant families in these places, why they're there, what they're doing, their living conditions, job prospects and politics. So my project aims to link the urban literature with the literature on inequality and migration with a focus on the people who have been coming to these decaying Rust Belt cities. I ask what drew them there, what they do when they arrive, where they work and live, and what their uh, political involvement is. So I, I tend to use uh, quotes to motivate some of my projects. And in thinking both about the place, Rust Belt cities, but also some of the people, um, I invoke here uh, Calle Cruz's opening lines to their song Latino America in saying, Soy, soy lo que dejaron, soy toda la sobra de lo que se robaron. Or I am, I am what they left behind, I'm the leftovers of what they stole. So I'm going to briefly introduce folks to the Rust Belt for those not familiar with this region and talk about the crises associated with it, introduce you to the specific case. Um, 
about how some of the folks who have been coming here have started to remake the city in their own image, focusing specifically on pan-ethnic political power and political patronage. And hopefully we can have a, a fruitful discussion. Now, the Rust Belt pictured here is a term in its predecessor, Rust Bowl, that were coined in, by journalists and politicians in the early 1980s. This term refers to the area of the US spreading from New York through Pennsylvania and Ohio through the shores of Lake Michigan and is known as a region that was famous for the proliferation of rusting factories, declining home prices, population losses, high unemployment, and general economic malaise. And so the, the literature, as I mentioned before, briefly mentions migrants and migration as a potential source of stabilization, but doesn't currently reflect a serious engagement with them. Uh, previous work by Schreider in 2017 aimed to remedy this, but because of the lens that she was using, this kind of large-scale population data, she didn't find uh, large enough foreign-born populations in most Rust Belt cities to actually conduct a, a good analysis on them. And a 2013 report by Weiner noted that while Detroit and Baltimore, cities uh, known for some of the issues of, of Rust Belt decline, had seen exponential growth in the Latinx community, it wasn't enough to offset the general population losses. And so what most places were seeing was economic decline and population. So these folks lament there is a lack of city level research data on the Rust Belt's foreign population. So in comes central fault. A city located right next to the birthplace of the American Industrial Revolution. Slater, Maryland, right? it's a, a community right next door. And Central Falls followed the path of economic decline, decline faced by many Rust Belt cities. In fact, some of the kind of newspaper headline um, incidents speak to many of the issues associated with uh, the diseconomic malaise and, and social um, dislocation. So the city itself, um, tried going the, the route of profiting from mass incarceration, and in the early 1990s brought in a quasi-public private detention facility, which at the time the mayor predicted would bring in yearly revenues of $300,000 a year. This never quite panned out financially, and the facility itself has been plagued by several controversies, including several escapes, the death of an ICE detainee, and in the early 2000s, a contentious relationship between the growing foreign-born population and the administrators. Uh, this was highlighted by the New York Times article you know, titled, The City of Immigrants Fails Jails with Its Own. Um, if we look at another domain of life in the city, schools, uh, these have also become quite infamous. According to political scientist Domingo Morel, the, the state takeover of the city's public schools is now the longest in the history of the United States. The city, was, the city schools were first taken over in the early 1990s um, and have not been given back since. Uh, additionally, during the 2000s education reform, uh, Obama's race to the top era, uh, the city made headlines because they famously fired the entire teaching staff at the high school after preliminary achievement data showed that students were not growing academically. Um, the real rock bottom here uh, came in the wake of the 2008 Great Recession. The first municipal bankruptcy laws were crafted in the wake of the Great Depression uh, 60 years prior. And in that time, uh, they were applied quite sparingly. But in the wake of the 2008 Great Recession, there were 13 municipalities around the country that filed for bankruptcy. Of those, five were dismissed in court, leaving just eight that were granted, most famously Detroit and Stockton, but also Central Falls was one of the eight uh, municipalities that was put into bankruptcy and receivership. This led to a severe cut in public pensions and a slashing of the municipal workforce by a third, leaving serious cuts and, and drastic declines in city services. Uh, and this was all kind of topped off the cherry on top by the resignation of the mayor, uh, who was under a federal indictment and in time in federal prison. Now, what was happening with jobs during this time? So Central Falls saw a decrease from 40, uh, approximately 4,500 employees in 1958 to about 2,600 in 1992. There was a 43% dip in manufacturing jobs. And the city itself was especially vulnerable to manufacturing declines as, as late as 1990, 48% of the working age population was still employed in this declining and disappearing industry. But the puzzle that motivates a lot of my study is what happened with the population. And so despite a general loss of 33% of total jobs in the city and a 39% decrease in production jobs specifically from 1977 to 1992, the population in CF has grown consistently since 1980. This growth has been mirrored by a growth in the share of the population that is foreign born. And so it's really driven by immigrants. And I would argue that this 2019, um, 
percent foreign born estimate is actually off. As you can tell, the projected <laughs> uh, population in 2019 was much lower than what the census actually found in 2020. So again, this, this motivates my, my questions of why do immigrants, particularly Latin American immigrants, come to a scandal ridden, bankrupt, deindustrializing city in a cold and costly region of the US? And what do they do? Um, when they get there and due to that city specifically upon arrival. So I want to just very quickly show you some, some maps. Um, and, and I shout out S4 and John Logan and some of the folks at, um, at Brown that, that allow us to look at some of these spatial distributions. But this is Central Falls on a map. The city is about 1.2, 1.3 square miles. And what we see here is that in 1970, um, the, the, the city has different levels of percent foreign born ranging from as low as, um, you know, like two to 5% or five to 10% to as high as 15 to 30%. On March 5th, 1965, three Colombians arrived in Central Falls to work at Lion Fabrics on Roosevelt Avenue. They were recruited by the son of the owner of the factory who was looking for cheaper labor and, and skilled labor. After those three, com uh, those three men came, you, you see a process of chain migration where more and more workers and more and more families start coming. And you see a different type of dispersal of the foreign population across the city. So by 1980, um, the city overall is 23.5% foreign born. And it's way more dispersed than previous waves of Polish, uh, French Canadian, and, um, and Irish migrants. By 1990, the foreign born population reaches 27.7%, 27.5%. And by the year 2000, the, the origin countries shift from just South American, mainly Colombian, to Honduran, Guatemalan, Dominican, Cuban, Puerto Rican, Bolivian, Uruguayan, and Venezuelan migrants. Estimates from the 2008 to 2012 ACS suggest that the city is somewhere between 35 and 40 percent foreign born at this time. So let's flash back to those early 2000s when the migration patterns have started to shift and have uh, incorporated Central American and South American migrants. Now, at the time, um, this article was published by the New York Times, the city of immigrants filling it, uh, jail cells with its own. There was a, a city council who <laughs> famously uh, offered this poll. He said, if Spanish people were registered to vote, they could take the city in one election. A lot of them don't vote because they don't trust the government and a lot of them are illegal, so they can't. And this question of political empowerment is interesting because in the Rust Belt literature, there's very brief mention of the political incorporation of immigrants. In fact, in just one place, Wayner notes the exception of rural West Liberty, Iowa, where a Mexican American was elected to the city council in 2012. Now, despite having arrived in 1965, um, Latinos had no formal political power in the city until the year 2000, when the first uh, Colombian American councilman was elected, Ricardo Patini. But it would seem that Councilman Benson's <laughs> quote was, was somewhat of a call to action to, to the Latinos in the community. And following uh, Patino's win and council um, seat, in 2012, the, there were several others elected to the council and the city elected its first Latino mayor. By 2016, there was a Latino majority on the council and by 2020, there was the first Latina mayor, a Latina majority on the council and a pan-ethnic representation of Latinos consisting of Colombians, Puerto Ricans, Dominicans and Salvadoran. The city also had two of its three um, state delegates, uh, one state rep and one state senator who were also Latino. I am the, the state senator pictured there. On, on the right of the slideshow. And one of the interesting things that comes up here, um, especially when I compare it to other parts of the country, is that we tend to see a pan-ethnic base supporting or reifying the emergence of a single ethno-national political elite. And so I, I, I've spoken to uh, Professor Jose Isikson, who conducted a study of Dominicans in Providence some years back, and what he was finding was Latinos were voting for Latinos in office, but they were often mostly Dominicans. And so when we look to other places, you know, we see Latinos, um, or a Latino pan-ethnic base 
supporting a single ethno national group such as Mexicans in Chicago or Cubans in Miami or Puerto Ricans and Dominicans in New York. So the, this exceptional kind of pan-ethnic representation emerging from a pan-ethnic base is something that I've been trying to unpack a bit more. I, I, I've got the what, what I'm trying to figure out more is the how. And one of the things that conversations with Isikson have encouraged me to, to, to really consider and try to start to unpack is not thinking of pan-ethnic or, or pan-ethnicity as an either or proposition, but rather what are the limits and bounds of it, right? And so I think a lot about now pan-ethnic solidarity and competition. And as I've had the opportunity to, to be in the field, this is the community that I live in, um, I've been taking many ethnographic field notes, um, I've started to see some of the, the limits here. And so while we were out canvassing uh, for the mayoral primary, one of the things that a, a resident said was, you know, I want a Latino, but if we elect her, she's gonna replace us with her people. And the us in this case was Colombians. And Colombians having been the first who arrived were kind of seen as the, 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 the privileged group to have first access. Um, and they were the first to have a councilman. They were the first Latino mayor. Um, and, and this sentiment was actually kind of reinforced in a phone call with a council person a few months after that election, who said, you know, three Puerto Ricans were appointed by the mayor in the first few months in office, expressed in, the, in a sense of, of frustration. And this is, is particularly interesting because after the early 2000s, as the migration streams changed, there were less and less Colombians and Puerto Ricans who had been the kind of vanguard early arriving group in the city. So their political success was contingent upon a pan-ethnic base support and, and now has started to, to see some of the distresses on that uh, uh, identity. I, I finally, before we, we have an opportunity to chat a bit more, want to talk about local reform and the way in which these elected officials have started to think through remaking the city in their own image. And here, I think a lot about previous community studies, you know, uh, folks like Dahl and, and who governs looking at, at Connecticut and, and previous community studies um, like French Canada and transition, where we think about who's in power and how uh, particular pathways or avenues to social mobility were opened or closed over time. And so city jobs were largely seen as a, as a way for economic stability. And it was, it was something that previous migrant groups to the city of Central Falls and to other Rust Belt cities used in order to, to, to access mobility pathways. So things like the fire department, the police department, the city uh, department of public works offices, jobs that provided pensions and, and um, health insurance were, were avenues for, for growth. But when Latinos came to Central Falls, they were not able to access those same avenues at first. And so in the 1990s, after having been here for 30 years, there were no Latinos in the police department or in the fire department. And in recognition of this, we have ordinance 928-2015, the ordinances in the city are based on the date in which they're passed, that was on public diversity sponsored by Councilwoman Gonzalez. And what this innovative ordinance did is that it looked at the point system that applicants to the fire department and police department receive. And it was a, 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 a very innovative kind of long negotiating um, ordinance because what the councilwoman was forced to do was work with the police union, the fire union, unions that had been captured by these previous ethnic groups um, that had used them as this pathway for social mobility to say, hey, how do we get more representation of who's here now? And it was a very delicate process to try to get them to agree to the ultimate, the, the provisions that were ultimately granted in the ordinance. And what it did is that it gave points to city residents. So slight extra points, uh, a kind of preference have you for being a resident of the city, which as the de demographics of the city shifted, um, kind of had this unintentional benefit for Latinos. But it also had a language component. And, and here I found it really innovative because what they ended up settling on was that you would get extra points if you spoke a language spoken by the at least 10% of the community as measured by the last census. And the concession here was to say, look, this community from its incorporation in 1895 has kind of always been a migrant community. Who the migrants were has changed, but um, 
if we include this provision that's not based on being able to speak Spanish or Portuguese, which are the two languages that based on the last census you would get points for, but rather it would be an evolving ordinance that could adapt to shifts in migration patterns um, was something that both the fire department and the police department were willing to agree to. So in 2017, Councilman Solano introduces Ordinance 313-2017 that aims to do the same thing with all the other city departments. And so the 2015 ordinance only did this for police and fire. The 2017 ordinance offers a preference in hiring for city residents and those who speak at least uh, the language that's spoken by 10% of residents as measured by the last census. Looking at tax stabilization agreements, which has kind of been the, the, the de facto approach for development in many of these urban cities. Um, in 2013, there's an economic expansion incentive program that offers a 10 year tax break that's tiered by firm size that bring in new jobs to the city. So trying to counter this loss of jobs that the city has been experiencing for the last 30 to 40 years, what it does is if you, it offers a 10 year tiered system that decreases by 10% starting at 50 or 60 or 70%, depending on the size of the firm, but also gives you an additional 5% of a tax break if at least 20% of the jobs are for city residents. These were revisited and expanded by Councilwoman Rivera and then Councilpersons Vega, myself and Rivera in 2019. And what I'll note here is with the exception of the 2013 bill, uh, excuse me, ordinance that uh, doesn't list who the sponsor was, all these reforms were proposed by Latino office holders. And so I am again, repivoting to this broader project that I'm working on, trying to figure out who has been and is coming here during this time and specifically what are they doing? So where are they working if the factory jobs that they had were not, um, they were no longer available. And I'm also thinking through what are the geographic and social mobility trajectories of these folks? Right? Do they experience upward mobility and how? And does it involve leaving the city? The city is very small, as I mentioned, it's only 1.2 square miles. And, and so it's very possible that um, as Colombians left and maybe experienced some form of social or geographic mobility, they were replaced uh, by these newer streams of migrants, uh, but, but that's yet to be borne out. No one has data or has collected data on this. And finally, we're looking at politics and whether or not they've been able to be successful. I'll very briefly cover some preliminary hypotheses that I have, and then I'm, I'm happy to engage in a, in a deeper conversation. So one of, the, one of the things that I've been thinking through here, as I alluded to um, the previous waves of Colombian migrants, is thinking about stepwise migration and whether or not the city is used as a place to kind of start your life in the US. And then once you've accumulated enough uh, uh, economic or social capital moving on to somewhere else, right? So the city becomes kind of a perpetual hub for um, early migrants into the country. And when I think about mobility, uh, I, I'm really looking to test Jose's theory of the Dominican experience in Providence, which he deems stratified ethno-racial incorporation, right? So do these things, do the, do the patterns differ um, for Latino migrants compared to these previous groups? And so I have access to city records and um, we'll be tracking, you know, from the first arrival of French Canadians, how long does it take them to get representation on the city council? How long does it take them to buy a home? Um, I, I know through the work of Marta Martinez, who, who uh, participated with the organizers of this conference a bit, um, that it, it was actually a Spanish family uh, from Spain who owned the home where many of the first Colombian migrants who arrived were, were renting out of. And, and so trying to figure out, um, you know, are the pathways, in what ways are the pathways similar or different from previous waves of working class migrants? Um, and is that um, different because of their ethno-racial identities is something that I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in looking at. And finally, um, this question of, of political incorporation and political agency and, and the bounds and limits of this, this pan-ethnic identity. I'm, I'm thinking a lot about making Hispanics and how people come here and come to see themselves as part of this larger group um, and, and why that is. So when, when does my Dominican identity trump my um, Latino identity or vice versa? Um, and, and the other thing is really gauging the success of these rent seeking or political incorporation uh, legal reforms that the, the members of the city council and of local government have been able to institute. So what is the take up rate for the, the tax break or the tax stabilization agreements that we look at? Um, 
how has the composition of the police and fire department changed? And so I have a letter of collaboration from the mayor who's allowed me to work with uh, the director of human resources to see. I can tell you anecdotally, um, something really interesting has been that at the funerals of, uh, of police officers or firefighters, you usually have a kind of honor guard um, or the entire department that's not on duty at that moment come out and, um, and honor the, the, the deceased. And you can almost visually see the moment in which Councilwoman uh, Gonzalez's ordinance went into effect because usually um, the departments line up by rank. And, and, and rank is based largely on seniority. And, and so you see when the police and fire start looking more Latino or start looking more like what the community looks like today. Um, and, and that's uh, really jarring to see, but I, I wanna have the empirics to speak more, more about it. So I'll, I'll stop there. I, I've said a lot. And like I said, I'm really interested in engaging in a greater dialogue with, uh, with the participants and, and, and thank uh, Professor Goldman, Professor Lewis and Professor Escuero for the opportunity. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for that presentation. Um, super interesting stuff. So we'll move on to the next presentation. Um, and again, if folks have questions, feel free to um, put them in the Q&A function or the chat, uh, and we will get to them um, afterwards. Um, oh, I think you're still sharing screen. Okay, perfect. Thanks. Um, so our next speaker is uh, going to be Dr. Marlene Gaynor, or Gaynor, sorry, I apologize if I mispronounced that, uh, who is a cultural and social historian of the Black Atlantic with a particular focus on North America and the English speaking Caribbean during the 20th century. Currently, she is the William Lyon Mackenzie King Postdoctoral Fellow at Harvard's Weatherhead Center for International Affairs. She is, a, she is an associate editor of the Gotham, the Center for New York City History, an architect. Uh, of Islands North, an interactive curated recreating Black cultural and spatial identities in Toronto. And in the coming year and thereafter, she will be an assistant professor of history at Washington State University. Um, and her presentation is entitled, Welcome to Jamaica, Manifesting a Local Tourist Culture in Jamaica During the 70s. So I'll pass along to you and uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Kevin. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Think. Can everyone see my slides? Yeah, that's it's sharing. Yeah. Okay, thanks. <laughs> um, okay, so good morning, guests, my fellow panelists, and our moderator. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to share my work with you today. This presentation is a work in progress where I am examining the development of a local internal tourism in Jamaica by the Jamaican government in the 1970s and how these policy reforms shaped and influenced the ways in which Jamaicans both near and far experienced their home, travel and leisure in the late 20th century. Among the British West Indies, Jamaica was the foremost leader in establishing tourism over the long 20th century for many reasons. One, Jamaica is geographically close or closer to Canada and the United States by steamship and by plane. Two, Jamaica as an island is larger than Trinidad and Tobago, Bahamas and Barbados with hundreds of miles of beaches available for hotels, resorts, and tourism industries. Three, with its hot summers and temperate winters, tourism could be a year-round affair. What made Jamaica shift from an exclusive money destination for the white, rich, and famous was the advent of the jumbo jet during the mid-70s by uh, Boeing and Airbus, which made direct transatlantic flights possible uh, during the mid to late, basically from the 70s moving forward, as visitors arrived in Kingston and Montego Bay by Pan Am, Air Canada, Avianca, British Airways, Delta, and more, many Jamaicans also use these same flights to leave the island in search of opportunities, family unification, and leisure around the Atlantic world. Of course, 
the colonial British government, which invested in the transatlantic slavery and the English plant uh, plantocracy laid the foundations for a tourist industry well before emancipation in 1834. So during the slave trade, visitors could arrive by ship but did not find accommodations outside of taverns or staying with friends and family. It was until 1834, which they, uh, the government began efforts to create a local tourist economy by giving economic incentives to foreign investors and um, covering their debts and having uh, duty-free imports and things like that. So from the beginning, the money and the profits, just like the plantocracy, plantation economy, um, even in the tourism economy, the profits left the island and did not remain in the local community. Um, everything went back to the metropoles. So my main arguments, when the People's National Party, the PNP successfully defeated the ruling Jamaica Labor Party, JLP, with the majority of votes in the 1972 general election, the new prime minister, Michael Manley, brought radical changes to an island only 10 years in independence. Immediate reforms included a national minimum wage, price controls on staple goods, and free education up to the college level, making Manley and the PNP favorites of the underclass. During the PMP's tenure from 72 to 1980, one of the most impactful reforms included creating a local tourist culture. I argue that the new tourism campaign served two objectives. First, uh, the national airline Air Jamaica and the Jamaica Tourist Board, uh, JTB, relied on local and internal tourism from Jamaicans near and far to sustain the economy during the late 1970s. Second, the new tourism created a culture of leisure by creating, maintaining, and promoting tourist attractions across the North Coast and Kingston area. Um, I argue that with levels of, high levels of unemployment, underemployment, poverty, lack of certain opportunities, and worries about the growing um, socialist turn in society. Many Jamaicans left for Canada and the U.S. by the hundreds of thousands. There were many who were left behind or stayed behind because it seemed the only work available was on the former plantations and current resorts. The same planes that brought visitors to the island created space and routes for Jamaicans to go to Miami, New York, London, and Toronto. And so, and so Jamaicans and the diaspora became cornerstones of the new tourism, coming back to Jamaica with better financial situations, with enough funds to spend on leisure, becoming tourists themselves. What is new tourism? The Minister of Industry and Tourism, Percival James Patterson, introduced this campaign early in their, in their um, as a government. Quoted in the Jamaica Gleaner on March 20th, he says, quote, I believe I was chosen for this post because I come to it with a French, fresh mind and no inflexible preconceived ideas. New tourism had three principles. One, distinguish service from servility. Two, do not demean the status or dignity of Jamaicans through advertising. And three, Tourism has to be devoid of all forms of racial discrimination or social snobbery, end quote. Patterson argued for tourism to create interlinkage between agricultural and social welfare. He believed that Jamaican farmers could grow and harvest foods exclusively for hotels and resorts, and that more Jamaicans would view uh, tourism to be positive, tourism and visitors, if they knew how much it could help them plus the young people who are underemployed, those with unrecognized creative talents could provide entertainment in hotels becoming positive representatives of the Jamaican people. One of the major components of new tourism was Patterson's focus on creating leisure for the local population. He argued, quote, 
Too often the Jamaican feels he is a stranger in his own land. If he can be facilitated to enjoy a Jamaican North Coast vacation, he will welcome the tourists as a stranger wishing only to share his own good fortune, end quote. The government intended to build public amenities across the country with the expectation that all would enjoy them refurbish public parks, public beaches, and renovations to attractions like Duns River Falls or a Colonial Falmouth would attract locals and visitors alike, um, those by plane or by cruise ship, while increasing profits for the government. Working with the tourist board and island hoteliers, the government also looked into developing the eastern town of Port Antonio in Portland by adding more guest rooms, rafting activities on the Rio Grande and a tour of the local maroon com uh, community. In addition, they, uh, the tourist board negotiated with hoteliers and the Jamaican civil service to give vacation packages as incentives and rewards for their employees. The need for local participation became a priority during the mid seventies with the OPEC um, oil crisis after the Israel Iraq war and the recessions and um, the IMF needs the IMF loans which crushed Jamaican's economy and its foreign trade. So with the new tourism, it changed the concept around these private spaces created in Jamaica, such as Montego Bay, which was considered little Miami. Um, in terms of no, uh, nightclubs, hotels, and casinos, and hotels which did not welcome um, darker-skinned Jamaicans. At play was racism, colorism, shadism, equating dark-skinned people with the lower class and formerly enslaved, um, particularly as these spaces accepted the U.S. dollar, which many locals did not have. It further excluded many Jamaicans. So with the emphasis and persistence of the new tourism, plus the reluctance and the migration of workers leaving Jamaica en masse, many of these hotels changed or you know, would be in financial dire straits. In 1975, Patterson spoke to parliament to describe the state of tourism. He introduced the National Hotels Act as the government became one of the largest landlords on the island. Uh, more funding went into the Jamaican Tourist Board, which had offices in London, New York, Toronto, Miami. More money went into advertising and travel agents. While world tourism declined by 10% overall, Jamaica was able to record a year of growth of 2.3% in the tourism sector. Uh, U.S. citizens traveling abroad fell by 5%, and many airlines were forced to cut back on air routes. And so... Um, even though there was a 3.5 increase in stopover visitors, many of these visitors would end up being Jamaicans returning home, um, going back and forth between uh, the country and their adopted homes and spaces in the Atlantic world. Scholar Jenny Berman argued that post-colonial Caribbean economic development with its continued emphasis on foreign exchange earning industries like tourism are directly related to constant flows of immigration and transmigration, end quote. So while the PNP attempted to save the economy, they really could not stop the outbound migration of a hundred, hundreds of thousands or at least 10,000 per year going to Canada and going to the US respectively. Um, tourism definitely as Jamaica's second largest, uh, second largest economy behind bauxite, um, it sustained the economy or helped keep Jamaica from falling into dire straits. So when you see these posters of the happy smiling people or the sensual breasts and buttocks, it only, it showed a part of Jamaica that only existed in the imaginations of the tourist board. Uh, it was combating the global image of Jamaica as a dangerous, violent place. Um, but it also gave the impression that Jamaican women would be willing um, 
and eager participants in foreign visitors and their sexual harassment. So by the end of the decade, foreign visitors from the Americas dropped. Articles from the New York Times described Jamaica as, quote, an angry, insecure third world state with an almost bankrupt economy that barely supports its 2 million citizens, end quote. And that, quote, once away from the North Coast resorts, the ubiquitous presence of machete-wielding peasants is intimidating to white visitors, end quote. This U.S. media played on historical tropes of the backwards violent native to describe situations that obviously covertly included their own government and the CIA. Um, yeah, if you know, you know. And yet Jamaicans in the diaspora returned home to visit family, to handle business affairs, or even because they wanted to, um, because they had the ex uh, extra income, expendable income. So Air Jamaica, as the national airline, became the popular airline for Jamaicans, um, representing this popular modern cultural image that the Jamaican government wished to share with the world. So Air Jamaica's reputation as a great airline also helped to rebuild or kind of repair Jamaica's global image in the world to combat the, the violent type of imagery um, promoted by the Western media. So it included a lot of things like fashion shows, free alcoholic cocktails and Jamaican cuisine. So the idea of the Jamaican vacation started um, as you departed from your own, your own cities. So uh, while other airlines, like I mentioned, Delta and Pan Am cut service to Jamaica, Air Jamaica was required to increase their flights and their capacity because so many seats, at least 70%, were bought by Jamaicans were traveling from home and abroad. So the Jamaican government, the PMP, needed uh, Jamaicans in the diaspora to return home and invest in their country, not just through remittances, but to take the airline to book a stay at the hotel to spend money outside of just seeing their family. So, yes, uh, the new tourism basically, uh, while Tourism itself catered to the wealthy and middle-class foreign visitors from Canada and the US. The new tourism created um, opportunities for migration inadvertently, but also created spaces for Jamaicans to see their country in a new light. So to end this, <clears throat> Michael Manley and the People's National Party lost decisively to Edward Siaga and the JLP in the 1980 election. Socialism and new tourism was out and diplomatic economic ties with President Reagan and foreign investors were back in. Siaga quickly sold off many properties and then you also saw the advent of all-inclusive resorts which made secure exclusive vacations private spaces, again, that excluded local Jamaica. So you see the change in um, advertisements. I'm gonna show a little bit of this. You should be able to see the difference, shifting emphasis from local tourism to foreign visitors, emphasis on foreign visitors, but make it Jamaica again. That kind of seems familiar. Maybe a lot of Americans might see the correlation, but what were Jamaicans supposed to be returning to? What did Jamaica look like before if they needed to make it Jamaica again? To Jamaica. We will raft you into the sunset. What so is what to We'll match your cricket. We want you to join us. We intoxicate you with hibiscus. We made it. Come back to the way things used to be. Yeah, so that's my uh, talk. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much for your time and have a nice day. 
Uh, yeah, thank you so much for that presentation um, and looking forward to the conversation shortly. So we have one more presentation um, by Danny Bahar, uh, who is giving a presentation entitled uh, Insights from the Venezuelan Ven Refugee Crisis, the Effects of Migratory Amnesties. And I'll read a brief bio. Um, Danny Bahar is an Associate Professor of Practice of in of International and Public Affairs at Brown University's Watson Institute. Um, an Israeli and Venezuelan economist, he is also affiliated with the Growth Lab at Harvard Center for De International Development, the Brookings Institution, the Center for Global Development, CESIFO, -E uh, Group in Munich, and the IZA Institute for Labor Economics. His research sits at the intersection of international economics and economic development, in particular, his academic research focuses on the diffusion of technology and knowledge within and across borders as measured by productivity, structural transformation, exports, entrepreneurship, and innovation, and other factors. So I will pass it along to Danny for presentation. Thank you so much. And again, if folks have questions, feel free to put it in the chat and we will get to it after this. Thank you, Kevin. Um, and hi, everyone. I'm really um, glad to be here. Um, are you seeing the slides? I guess you can just yes. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you. And um, I think um, I, you know I'm, I'm I will I will follow up with with all the other the other two great presentations. Um, I, I excuse myself. I'm an economist, uh, so I'm gonna also be showing a bit more. Um, I mean, my, my my presentation is gonna be a bit more focused on. So more like economic outcomes, um, and and but I think are quite complementary. And 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 here I want to kind of move our conversation um, to Colombia, um, which is a place um, that has really learned a lot in the past five or six years about um, about immigration and how to actually deal um, with with this huge issue that it that becomes like integration of a huge population. Many of them vulnerable that come, um, uh, you know, in in out of the soil. And just to give you a little bit of context, um, um, on kind of the refugee crisis for which we have like a, a decent data uh, in, in modern times. Um, here, I, I I've been following this for a bit, and and here, for instance, I I, I have just the figures of the different refugee crises that have happened in the past uh, decades. Um, and how they evolve in terms of the number of people, um, the size of this refugee crisis by, uh, you know, from the year that conflict starts. And it's kind of hard to point down, in some places it's hard to point down when conflict starts, um, particularly in Venezuela where there's no war, uh, but it's, it's more of a political conflict. But, but, but nevertheless, once you kind of um, decide on, on, on how to do that, you still see some interesting facts. So first of all, Venezuela, as of now, um, these are numbers for 2021, but 2022 just increased. Um, uh, as of now, it is um, the, the second largest refugee crisis uh, in the world, um, the largest refugee crisis in the hemisphere. Um, Six million people plus have fled from Venezuela. Um, and, and let that sink in for a second. I mean, uh, you know, that, that, that's not something that we in our hemisphere maybe thought it was gonna happen. Um, and this is a crisis that's comparable only to the Syrian refugee crisis. Of course, I, you know, I couldn't ignore what's happening in the past few weeks and the unfortunate events in, in, of the invasion of Russia and Ukraine. And um, when you put that in context, you know, I'm, 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 unfortunately, I think one of the things I at least wanna be spending a lot of my time is thinking about the Ukrainian uh, refugees too. Um, because uh, it's still not the largest refugee crisis, but it's for sure the fastest uh, pace, uh, fastest growing refugee crisis um, in modern history. And, you know, as of today, there are more than 3 million people who have left in just less than a month or fled less than a month. Um, so anyway, but I'm not going to talk very much about that. But the, the other point I, I do want to mention to, um, uh, I'm just going to, you know, I've been I've been tracking a little bit about the funding for refugee crisis and and the two things that I think are comparable between the Venezuelan refugee crisis and the Ukrainian refugee crisis, as opposed to the Syrian one, for instance, is the funding. And I think that um, uh, 
with the forecast that I think is not relevant anymore by the UNHCR that there are going to be 4 million refugees out of Ukraine and the pledge of raising $1.7 billion, um, which is just a pledge, that approximately results in, in less than $500 per refugee, which is similar to the level of, of Venezuelan refugees, quite low compared to like the funding that has gone to Syrian refugees, for instance, which is, which is you know, seven, eight times larger. But anyway, just to give you some context about more context about this refugee crisis, this is the largest refugee crisis in the hemisphere, the second largest in modern history. Um, it, or, it doesn't originate in conflict or war. It originates really from, from a deep political and socioeconomic crisis in Venezuela, in which um, uh, a cruel dictatorship has taken it, it's uh, um, has created enough um, a, of, of an economic crisis that is completely man-made manufactured by those in power, uh, but also accompanied by repression and, and a lot of political um, persecution such that it has really resulted in this massive refugee crisis. Um, and, and, and even if in Venezuela there's no war, <laughs> the one thing that it's, um, that, that it's uh, almost an indisputable fact is that whatever socioeconomic in, in this in the index that you're gonna look at Venezuela, um, it behaves, it looks like a country that has gone through war. Like GDP in Venezuela has gone down by more than 70%. The value of the currency um, has been reduced by 99%. Um, you know, infant mortality has gone up dramatically. It's the only country in Latin America in which infant mortality has gone up that much. Uh, and, you know, I can continue to say. But, but one of the things that characterize this crisis in particular is that, um, you know, the, the, the public services that the government is supposed to provide are also collapsing. And, and one very public service we take for granted usually um uh, is the right to identification so in venezuela it's very hard um and very costly for instance to get a passport for, for a venezuelan citizen to get a passport is, is, is something that you know it involves in many cases bribing government officials there's there's shortage of, of material this shortage like it's it precedes COVID quite a bit it has nothing really to do with supply chain shortages we're used to now so, so what this means is that you know many of these Venezuelans who are fleeing, they actually live without passports, without identification. They 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 walk through the borders, not through official uh, border crossings. And 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 I want I'm going to focus today on Colombia. is is the largest host of Venezuelan refugees, hosting today um, 1.8 million Venezuelans. Um, um, but of course, as you can see here. It's um you know it's quite spread across the whole continent. Um, there's one million Venezuelans in Peru. Um, Chile is also quite a big recipient, five hundred thousand people. Um, and throughout throughout the continent, of course, in the U.S., there's a big Venezuelan community too. Um, so anyway, so Colombia hosts nearly two million Venezuelans, one point eight to be more precise. Um, it, it has really opened. I mean, I think Colombia is is kind of a model. The way I see it in terms of policy for 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 integration of Venezuelans, um, and and I think they opened their doors for two main reasons. The first one, which is hard to measure, but I, I've heard many Colombians from government or from civil society saying it is kind of an historic responsibility that Colombia feel towards Venezuelans. Uh, Venezuela hosted over four million Colombians, uh, you know, in the 1980s and 1990s, fleeing violence from Colombia. And now, uh, and Venezuela was a very, a country very open to migration. In fact, I would even argue that it was kind of the poster child of immigrant integration in the continent since 1950s or even before. Um, and, and, and now, you know, the tables turned, right? So now Venezuela is a net immigrant country and Colombia is suddenly a huge receiver of immigrants, something that, that they were not really prepared for from a regulation standpoint of view. But, they're very, they, they believe that this is a, a historic responsibility they have um, uh, with, 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 you know, Venezuelan brothers and sisters, how they actually, you see that jargon all the time in, in government officials, which is really moving. Um, but the other one is smart policy. And I think that Colombians have understood something that, for instance, in the U.S. is not in our public, in our policy narrative yet, unfortunately, is that immigrants represent huge opportunities for countries to grow and to, and, and to become more dynamic and to you know increase productivity and innovation and entrepreneurship, et cetera, et cetera. So I think Colombia is, is really thinking that in the medium to long term, this could be a really important boost to, to their economy and to the hosting communities. Um, 
Um, but, but they encountered a, a big issue, which is that many of these immigrants, because of what I said before, um, on, on the difficulties of getting a passport in Venezuela, they, they are undocumented. So, so as of now, there's, we, think, we think that there's about 1 million Venezuelans, like about half of the Venezuelans in Colombia are undocumented. Um, and, and, and the response of the Colombian government to this uh, challenge um, has been, I think, an example to the world because they've actually run um, two amnesty programs in which they are basically giving um, undocumented Venezuelan immigrants um, a, a regular migratory status. Um, uh, to, to, and it's actually happening as we speak. As we speak, the, 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 mass, the most massive rollout uh, probably in modern history, it, and it, uh, one of the largest one, if not the largest one, is, is, is giving one million Venezuelans um, a regular migratory status um, and the ability to stay for 10 years, renewable with full rights to access the labor markets, with full rights to get social benefits, etc. cetera. Uh, this is the second amnesty program they run. The first one happened in 2018, which is the one I'm gonna speak about because it's the one for which we already did some studies. Um, and, and, and basically they implemented, at the time there were like 1 million Venezuelans in Colombia. So it was half of what we have now. Um, and, and they actually knew that at the time there was a big population um, that were undocumented that didn't really know quite the number, but their first response, and this is just, you know, two years into or a year and a half into the, few, the huge inflow of Venezuelans into the country, they decided to run a, serve, a, a census just for Venezuelan undocumented immigrants, just to, you know, just to know a little bit about them and, and, where, they, and where they were. Um, they, they call the census the RAM, Registro Administrativo de Migrantes Venezolanos in Colombia. It's a registry. Um, but the interesting thing is that 450,000 people registered to this. And um, this happened between April and, and June of 2018. And then a few, few weeks before ending uh, his term, um, it, it, in July of 2018, president, outcoming President Santos, who was the Nobel uh, uh, Peace uh, Prize winner, um, the, the Peace Nobel Prize winner, he announced that all the people who registered, at least 450,000 people, will be able to um, apply for, a, for the PEP, the PEP, the Permiso Especial de Permanencia. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a temp, it's sort of like a TPS in the US in which it will get two year, a two-year visa, which is renewable, um, providing access to labor markets and, and to public services. And, and then President Duque implemented the measure. And I think this is a nice thing to, to, to put forward, to, to, to keep in mind, because um, this one of the few, if not the only topic in which there has been um, con, you know, con, continuity in terms of, um, of government policy towards Venezuelans. And there's an election in Colombia happening this year. We really hope that's going to be also be the case for the next administration. But anyway, you know, I, I, I started with, with some fabulous co-authors, a little bit what the effects of this migratory amnesty have been. Um, and I want to share some of these insights with you. I'm not going to get very much into each question in particular, but just kind of the main results. Um, and, and I'm saying this because also in the context of the U.S., this is a very important question. In the U.S., there is uh, the estimates around uh, 10 million immigrants who are undocumented. And I think it's a very important policy question that, that, that people, uh, at least politicians, I think, try to shy away from. Um, and, and I think part of the research agenda here is to show, like, what are actually the gains that could happen if actually immigrants who are undocumented actually get, have the have received a permanent migratory status or even a temporal one. And just intuitively, before I go a little bit into the details, the, the main argument here, which is very intuitive, is once a person has a regular migratory status, um, it has, that person has much more certainty of the future that you know, they're not gonna be able to, they're, they're not gonna be forced to leave uh, the port, for instance. So, so that you know, triggers a bunch of medium to long-term decisions that are beneficial not only to the person, but to society as a whole, such as investment, um, not only in terms of money, but investment in education, the education of the children. Um, it, it provides empowerment to certain vulnerable populations, et cetera. So, so that's a bit what I want to talk about today. Um, the, the, the reason, so I'm going to talk about labor markets very briefly. I'm going to talk about some results on female empowerment we found. I'm going to talk about entrepreneurship. Uh, which are which are I think are three very different but also very important uh, you know behaviors or, or, or social outcomes that are worth uh, keeping in mind. 
the interesting thing, just I don't want to get too much into our obsession as economists with causality and correlation, but I think the interesting thing you just to mention is that the, the nature of this rollout allows really to say something about causality in our estimates, just because the way it works, which is this graph to the right, is that depending on which state you registered in this RAM, in this process, you were given a window on when you can actually go and get your visa. So some people, um, you know, had more days to get the visa or less days to get the visa, and, and we exploit that variation a little bit to really understand uh, the outcomes. So anyway, so this is a little bit how this RAM looks. These are the points where people register in, in, in so it's quite comprehensive of the Colombian territory, you know, especially when you take into account uh, density of population. And this is a bit uh, on the right, it's a bit like how many people actually got the, the PEP as a share of the local population. And, and it's not surprising that in some municipalities, especially those near the border, you have um, a, a much higher presence of Venezuelans, uh, but also like spread out around the big cities. Um, you know, the, the first question that, that, um, that, that always comes to mind in these circumstances, I think in policy discussions in the US is like, what happens when you give undocumented immigrants a right to work? Um, and uh, I don't tend to use the term legal or illegal, but this is kind of a derogatory picture because uh, I, I think that um, the point that, um, that, that people who use this language usually is saying, well, they're gonna come and take your jobs. Uh, they're going to lower your salaries, right? And, and, and I think this is an empirical question. And it's an empirical question that we are actually were able to show in the case of Colombia. And I'll just summarize, you know, we, we look, for instance, at what happens with the wages and employment and, you know, a bunch of labor outcomes for different populations, for, for Colombian workers, for Venezuelan migrants themselves, and for Colombian returnees, which is, which is a portion of Venezuelan migrants who have Colombian citizenship that came back. And just to summarize, for you, the results, um, they are zero. I mean, there's really no impacts, if any, it's very negligible impacts of, of, of allowing uh, or giving the right to work to these people in the formal markets to other workers in the economy. In fact, there's a bunch of papers that show that the impacts could even be positive because they um, produce some occupational mobility of, of, of the native population. But anyway, so in terms of labor markets, you know, we are, I think we, here we're showing this paper very convincingly, I hope, that um that 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 amnesties don't really result in 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 a damage to the labor outcomes of, of locals. Um, the other aspect we, we, we were super interested in looking at is, is a little bit about uh, you know empowerment and and one way that it's not a perfect way but one way we thought we could measure this um, uh, decently enough is by looking at the reporting of crimes not not the not committing crimes but reporting of crimes by Venezuelans. Um, so here we kind of also exploit the same thing. And, and what we find is that um, once Venezuelans get more, get this, um, get this regular migratory status, they tend, they increase the reporting of crime. Uh, and these, you know, keeping constant the, the totality of all crimes, right? So there's just kind of a, a, an increase on, on, on the composition of who's reporting crimes. And, and this is particularly driven by female migrants, uh, immigrants. As you see in this graph across time, I mean, the, the, once they have a regular migratory status, they, they report more crimes. And mo most importantly, I think a lot of these crimes, uh, uh, most of the result is driven by reporting crimes of domestic violence and crimes of uh, on sexual crimes. So, so our interpretation of these results um, is that this, the, there is an empowerment um, story here in which um, uh, women who, who we, uh, migrants who are women who, uh, might be uh, vulnerable, they feel more empowered to go and report uh, abuses that are happening against them once they have the certainty that they're not going to be deported, for instance. Um, the final thing I want to share with you is, um, is, is, is about entrepreneurship. And, and I think entrepreneurship is quite an interesting economic outcome or social outcome, not just because, um, I mean, not just, it's, it's just not another economic outcome, um, such as marketing, you know, labor markets or, or you know, human capital accumulation, things like that. It, I, we, we think it's particularly important because I think entrepreneurship says a lot about long-term investment, right? Because if you are going to create a firm and you're going to invest in a firm and you are, you know, take the risk of investing in a firm, um, you probably will want, you know, you want to make sure that you're going to be able to appropriate those benefits or the, whatever gains you're going to have in the medium to long term. Right, so given the immigrants, which by the way, immigrants 
to begin with are more entrepreneurial than natives. That's something that has been documented, but given um, immigrants who aren't documented the, the, a regular temp migratory status uh, can really boost their uh, confidence that they're gonna be able to really appropriate whatever business idea they have. Of course, it, this has society, societal benefits because it creates jobs, it creates dynamism in the economy, et cetera, et cetera. So what we did here is that we really go at the individual level, right? And we really look at, at people who, who register in this census, uh, but maybe who register five minutes before or five minutes later, and they got a different day to actually get the visa. So exploit that the, the, the difference um, that it's essentially kind of random. Um, and we, you know, match this like, tens of millions of observations of all the business register of Colombia, like all the businesses that were ever founded in Colombia, um, we, we, we were able to match to these Venezuelan migrants. We found 400 firms that were um, that were created by Venezuelans who, who actually were in this process of, of getting a regular migratory status. And, and, and furthermore, we find that actually it is the fact that they got um, a visa what really boost them or what, what, what really cost that they actually went on and created a business. Um, and, and, and I think these results are beautiful because these businesses will, you know, create jobs and these businesses create more dynamism. And, and it really, um, it, it, it's a bit of a deeper socioeconomic outcome, in my opinion, that, that, says, that says something much bigger um, about, uh, about, you know, the future um, dynamism in the economy. You know, these are not Googles and Amazons, uh, right? But but um, but it's still entrepreneurship, right? So so we have things such as hairdressers, um, in the firms and, and retail, and food and beverage uh, retail and manufacturing of food, and and and, uh, and so, so so these are not you know these might be like small pop and, sh pop and mom shops or these be still restaurants. It's still entrepreneurship. Um, but 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 I think the point here is like imagine what these people could actually do if they had some seed funding, you know, access to credit, business training, right? They could really do uh, firms that that probably have a lot, you know, that have mo a lot of potential much 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 quicker in the process. Um, anyway, so um, the, the the last point I want to make, and hopefully the takeaway that I would like you to have is that. Um, you know, refugees bring tremendous gains to the economies if the right policies are put in place. And we just actually released yesterday a blog post on this, um, focusing on the Ukrainian refugees um, that I invite you to read if you have the time. Um, and, and I think these regularization policies, these policies that, that provide a regular migratory status are, are critical um, in, in creating a lot of these benefits that refugees can bring uh, to a country and to the world as a whole. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you, everyone. Um, okay, great. There's some questions coming in. Um, so yeah, thank you again to all the panelists um, for great presentations. Um, and also, I think everybody's kept on time extremely well, which I very much appreciate. Um, so we have uh, ample time for Q&A. So again, if folks want to put their questions in the chat um, or use the Q&A function, and it seems like we do have quite a few questions. So um, maybe, and I'll try to see them as they come in, but I think the first one, uh, Patsy had a question, um, and I don't know, Patsy, if you wanted to pose it or I could read it off. Um, I, I can ask it because I also had another one for um, Danny. I, I just want to say thanks to the presenters. This was a really, really very um, rich and interesting um, panel. And the first question I had um, for Marlene was the difference between what the government was trying to project about the increased accessibility are trying to make the tourism industry more accessible to ordinary Jamaicans. And, you know, well, how ordinary Jamaican is defined and whether that goal was ever won, um, given the high levels of inequality that existed, that was ever really available to the majority of Jamaicans. And I wanted to ask Danny, and thank you so much for this in-depth look at Colombia as an example of how to treat um, immigrants from neighboring countries as a positive um, 
see the positive potentials for that. And also um, as a model for how we can see our own humanity in how we embrace others. Obviously, one thing that regular, regularization does or allowing people to become um, regular is it allows them to work, to participate um, in the economy in ways in which they would not otherwise be available to. But we know that there are also additional barriers um, when migrants cross countries, especially um, professional qualifications that restrict the ability of migrants to make meaningful uh, contributions to the level of their training. I remember at the height of the pandemic, I think it was the World Health Organization asking countries across the region to relax their, their regulations for doctors because there are so many Venezuelan doctors and health professionals in these countries who are not qualified to work. So I just wanted to know if there's an accompanying movement for um, recognition of qualifications that would allow these migrants to play a far more um, beneficial role in the Colombian economy. Should I, should I go ahead and answer right away or are we taking, yeah? Thank you, uh, Patrick. That, that's a great question. I couldn't agree more with you. And I think, I mean, just a couple of reactions. So I do think that the, in the Colombian case, they are doing some work on accreditation um, when it comes to certain professions, but I agree with you. This is, some, this is often a lot of red tape and, 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 and a big challenge for many countries because you know we're still, even in the globalized world, we still don't have a straightforward way to recognize, for instance, professional skills or educational achievements across countries in, in immediately. And I think that this could be, um, I mean, thinking a little bit big, big picture, I think this, this should be one of the important goals of, of, of the efforts of, of, re, of, um, of, um, of, of providing some uh, framework for global migration through the UN uh, Compact for Migration, for instance. Uh, but I think we're not there. And I think that there are uh, cases of uh, in Colombia in particular, but it's still very, very behind. But, but I do want to mention too, according you know, a little bit um, building on, on your comment is that often these things are also not, not enough, right? Because uh, you know, finding a job is hard. <laughs> it's hard for everybody. It's hard for, you know, it's hard for people in this chat who probably we all went to schools and we, you know, had so imagine for people who come to a country that don't have any network, then so, so, so I think that um, just also having the paper itself is 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 just like a, the bare minimum, and um, and in that sense, I just you know I, I you know whoever is interested, we can of course keep the conversation. I, I'm just starting a big project in Colombia to really tackle a little bit more that question on 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 where are actual immigrants integrating in which industries and which there's not, and some geographical variation to really. You know, it's, it's kind of more of a policy work too, to, to, to give an idea of the government of where, where are these bottlenecks, because I think a lot of these difficulties happen, even if we have all the papers and the perfect accreditation system, there's a lot of informal networks that drive the integration process, and, and, and we must tackle that as part of, of the, you know, regular uh, frameworks that, that, that I exposed. Thank you for the question, Dr. Lewis. Um, there, I don't believe I said anything in terms of, well, I think for, to understand the tourism industry, it is, because it is such an important industry in Jamaica, it ends up being a very large employer. Um, but employees are still extremely underpaid. Uh, you can imagine what happened to a lot of people during the pandemic with the closures and lockdowns. Um, in terms of an ordinary Jamaican, I'm not sure If an ordinary Jamaican, I'm assuming the working poor or what have you, would have access to the same access to hotels and resorts just through the cost, right? But 
you have now, especially in the 21st century, many working class, professional class who enjoy resorts because they get special local prices and deals. Um, you see a lot of this during the pandemic when the only things open were um, the hotels and resorts in the exclusive tourist zone on the North Coast in Montego Bay, which you are you see this preferential treatment for visitors, for tourists with the current Jamaican government. Um, a lot of friends that I have, a lot of family members in Jamaica were able to take advantage of um, hotel stays at like the Holiday Inn, Sunspree and other resorts during the pandemic because nothing else was open. Um, you see a lot of uh, Jamaicans and other West Indians um, being able to enjoy hotels and resorts like their parents did not have the financial advantages to, um, especially if we look outside of hotels and resorts, you see a lot of spaces being refurbished or supported by the government, such as the mineral baths in Milk River or Bath Fountain. You see the Rio Grande in Portland and other um, places like Appleton or uh, the Luminous Lagoon. So they have a local price and they have a, a foreign price. You also see the Higlas, um, people who are selling uh, local handicrafts and things like that. There are special markets in Ocho Rios where the cruise port is. Um, but then again, these are heavily over surveilled by law enforcement or um, other entities in the government to ensure that they are not harassing uh, foreign visitors. So there are subversive ways and covert ways for working class Jamaicans, if they are involved in tourist industry, to make money, to be involved in the tourist industry. And then there are outlets within the tourist industry um, to have further opportunities. So if you are a part of sandals or you go to golf tournaments or you're involved in certain tournaments, you can get scholarships. Um, for instance, my cousin was able to train as a golf caddy and represent um, the Jamaican golf team in international tournaments. So the, the tourist industry for a small amount, a small percentage of people create also paths to getting visas to migrate to London, Toronto, um, and various parts of the United States. Um, this percentage grows larger as time moves forward, but I don't know if depending on how you define ordinary, much of the Jamaican class would not have access to every part of the tourist industry, at least many of the parts that are promoted by the Jamaica Tourist Board and the current JLP government, the same one, same government that created Make Jamaica again and really catered to Reagan and the, um, neo-colonial, <sighs> yeah, that situation. <laughs> Thank you, I appreciate yeah. that. Thank you. Um, yeah, if we wanna turn to Kristen, if you wanna ask your question, um, or I, I could read it too. Um, okay, I, I can go ahead and read Kristen's question. So. Um, Kristen asks, uh, thanks so much to all the presenters. I found the cross-regional conversation really rich and interesting. I have a question for Jonathan. Could you share some of your preliminary conclusions about when and why pan-ethnic or national identity becomes salient for Central Falls residents? Uh, thank you. And, and uh, um, Professor Scott, if it's okay with you, I might try to answer Jax's question uh, that they submitted over the, the Q&A portal at the same time, because I, I think it's, it's relevant. I, I'll, I'll say that, you know, I think that part of this is, is this competition um, issue. And, and in the same way that there were previous 
you, you know, European ethnic groups that became white um, and that became white in relation to what was, you know, deemed not white. And in the case of Central Falls, it was this, this like trickling initially of, of first Portuguese and then Portuguese and Colombian and then Portuguese, Colombian and Puerto Rican, and then, you know, so on and so forth, Latino immigrants that Latinos find themselves in a position where the, the only way to win is is to be Latino. You, you can't win as as just Colombian, or you can't win as just Dominican. Um, you you need to to be able to appeal to this broader group. And and to to address the question that that's here, um, I, I think gender here is really important um, for a variety of reasons. But my, my work kind of picks up the 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 baton that Louise, the anthropologist Louise Lamphere had set down. Um, on Central Falls. So she, she conducted a community study at the time in the late 70s, early 80s um, in Central Falls on the transition of from working daughters to, to working mothers. And, and what, what she finds is that um, the, the previous waves of, of mostly European migrants uh, had a dynamic where women entered the, the formal labor force, but then upon marriage would, would exit and, and move to, to the kind of reproductive labor sphere or, or the domestic labor sphere. And what she found was that Latina, in this case, uh, Colombian women were doing it all. And so from when they got here, they were working in factories. And, and this is really important to the way in which um, Latina politics develops in the city. So in, in, in a, a kind of country where Latino politics is, is dominated by men. Um, it's the case in CF <laughs> that Latinas have emerged as, as, as very powerful um, in the political sphere. And, and I, I don't think it's a coincidence that it's also a place where they were part of the formal labor force from the beginning as well. And so even though it's Ricardo Patino who wins the first council seat in the year 2000, prior to his run, um, there's a woman, Silvia Velasquez, who was considering a run in the, in the early 1990s, um, happens to be my mom's best friend and roommate. So I, I lived with Silvia from, from 95 to 98, and then again from 2000 to 2002. But, but so, so women were always kind of part of the, the movement in a way that, that is, I think, somewhat unique. Um, the, the second uh, point that, that, um, that Jax brings up is this question about American born or, or, or really kind of second generation. And, and, you know, the gap, the first folks who run are, are foreign born people who are able to, to, to gain legal status and then run for office. But when, when you look at it today, um, the composition is this, it's, it's the American born second generation folks who are running for office. And one of the things that I'm trying to do in my project is that I'm interviewing um, high achieving high school graduates from the year 2004 to 2014. And I'll explain why in a second, but I identify them using uh, high school graduation booklets. So Jax, if, if you went to a CF high or you know somebody who did and they graduated within that year span, please let me know. And, and the, the logic behind using the 04 to 14 thing is, is twofold. One, um, it's that the, the kind of five year graduation period that, that we tend to think about where if you graduate from high school, you know, you, you measure out five years after if the person had gone to college, that would be whether or not they, they graduated or not. That puts us at 2019 right before the pandemic and when the world you know, blows up. But the other thing is it's also before the, pro, the proliferation of charter schools in the city. And so prior to um, the, the kind of early 2010s, um, CF High was the only place where you could go to school. For the most part. So there was maybe, you know, a few exceptions of people who would really scrape together cash or send their kid to private school. But for the most part, everybody went to CF High. And so this was the only kind of pathway. And, and so to see whether it is the case that the, the high performing students stay um, and, and become leaders in the community. So we look at some of the folks that the guy who was the, the first Latino mayor had gone to the local high school, went to college, came back. Uh, the woman who was the first Latina state rep had gone off to college, came back. Um, the, the guy who replaced her, same thing, same story. What I'm trying to figure out is to what degree are folks now um, deviating from traditional pathways of social mobility? So the, this, the, it, in a place like CF, the story has always been like, you're here and as soon as you can leave, you do leave. Uh, and so it's kind of a place where for the most part, the only people that are there are the people who can't go anywhere else because they can't afford to live anywhere else. Um, but now you start seeing this, these second generation kids who are going kind of acquiring social capital and, 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 and other forms of capital, but then coming back. 
Um, and I'm trying to see whether that's a pattern or whether these folks are somewhat exceptional and just using kind of politics as a, as a different mobility pathway. Awesome, thanks for answering both questions too, um, that, that helps. Uh, so we have uh, two questions that came in for Danny and so maybe I'll, I'll pose those and then we can um, wrap up since we're uh, towards the end of time. So the first question is why is the, um, the international amount pledged by other nations to help in the Venezuelan refugee crisis uh, when compared to other situations? And then the second one is, Colombia has clearly seen the largest influx of Venezuelan immigrants, yet other countries in Latin America have received Venezuelans too. Can you compare and contrast those differences, uh, those different experiences? Um, yeah. I'll, I'll answer very quickly. So I think um, the, the first one, you know, I can just offer you my opinion, which is like Venezuelans are not walking to Europe. Um, so uh, as opposed to Syrian refugees who I think the European Union um, try to contain um, those flows to Turkey and not much beyond that. And I think that that, that motivated a lot of the funding. But, you know, I, I don't really have evidence on that. It's just kind of an opinion. Um, the, the, the second question, I mean, I, 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 you know, it's quite mixed. And I, I do think that Colombia actually um, stands out and, and because you've seen in other countries, particularly when you take into account the number uh, of people arriving, that when you see other countries and, and different experiences, you see a lot of back and forth. So like in places like Chile and Peru, um, which are big recipients, they, they've imposed visas uh, at different periods of time. Um, uh, and they, you know, knowing that it's really impossible for a Venezuelan to get a visa. Um, and then you had a country like Mexico, which was not, um, which at the beginning did something that was really interesting. It was the only country that was actually adopting de facto the Declaración de Cartagena, the Cartagena Declaration, which, which kind of expands on the definition of what a refugee is. And, and it, it moves away a little bit from the war conflict language. And it also includes situations where there's massive violations of human rights and so on. I think Mexico, de facto, was actually giving um, the, the actual refugee status to Venezuelans who receive it. But now Mexico also imposed a visa uh, following what I think is a very hypocritical view of the US government, like asking uh, other countries to deal with, you know, to try to stop the inflow of refugees. I think that the US government, even this administration for which I had big hopes on this, went to Colombia to ask Colombia, who has received like 2 million people, uh, if they can help them stop the, the, the flow from Haitians, which I think is ridiculous. And that was Secretary Blinken, by the way. Um, and just finally, uh, and, and then you have a country like Brazil, which I think they've been very, you know, very uh, open with their policies. But, but there again, like, it, it, you know, it's hard to compare because Brazil has received only 300,000 Venezuelans, which is a large number, but, you know, for the size of Brazil, it's like, it's minimal, right? So. So I, I think it has been quite mixed, but I do think that Colombia really stands out in, in being consistent, um, you know, across time, across even governments from very different ideologies on, on, on trying to do the right thing. Um, so I had questions, but I, I think we're definitely <laughs> short on time, so I will hold them uh, and maybe email folks, but I just wanted to say thank you to uh, the folks organizing the conference um, at the Center for Latin American Caribbean Studies, uh, for the Watson staff who have helped us navigate this virtual world as we continue with the world the way it is, um, and then to all the audience members as well for asking questions and being very involved. Uh, and thanks also to the panelists for your amazing presentations and really thought provoking um, comments and ideas. Um, so I guess we could end a minute or two early if that's okay um, and not try to add another question in, but yeah, thank you so much. Uh, and I hope folks enjoy the rest of the conference. Um, yeah.
Testing, testing.
All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Okay, excellent. Um, welcome back. This is the second panel of today's, um, the second day of the conference. Uh, this is panel number five, titled Cultural and Racial Exclusions, Diaspora and the Construction of the Nation. My name is Itohano Saimwese. I am Associate Professor in the History of Art and Architecture and Urban Studies and Affiliate Faculty of the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies here at Brown University. And I will be moderating this panel, which I'm very excited about uh, this morning. Um, as a reminder, uh, the format of the panel today is um, uh, introductions. Uh, I, I will do introductions of the speakers as we're moving through the, uh, through the panel. Um, and we will hold questions until the end of the panel. Uh, those of you who are joining the conference, please enter your questions or comments uh, in the question and answer function on Zoom. So with that, we'll go ahead and get started with our first presentation. Our first speaker is uh, Paul Joseph Lopez Oro, um, who will be presenting a paper titled Garifuna New Yorkers, Hemispheric Ent Entanglements of Blackness, Indigeneity and Central American Caribbeanness. Dr. Paul Joseph Lopez Oro is an assistant professor of Africana Studies at Smith College and the 2021-2022 Miriam Jimenez Roman Fellow at the Latinx Project at New York University's Department of Social and Cultural Analysis. His research and teaching interests are on Black Latin American and US Black Latinx political mobilizations, Black feminist LGBTQ plus activism and ethnographies in the Americas. He's currently working on his first book manuscript, tentatively titled Indigenous Blackness in the Americas, the Queer Politics of Self-Making Garifuna, New York, which is a transdisciplinary ethnographic study of how gender and sexuality shape the ways in which transgenerational Garifuna New Yorkers of Central American descent negotiate, perform, and self-articulate their multiple subjectivities as Black, Indigenous, and Central American Caribbean. Uh, with that, I'd like to welcome Dr. Oro. Please take the mic, so to speak, the virtual mic. Welcome. Uh, good morning, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very grateful for the opportunity to be in your company today to talk a little bit about the history of Garifuna New Yorkers, um, as well as uh, the larger Black Central American diaspora in the United States. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen for a little bit. Um, give me one second. I wanna just have an image as I'm kind of talking to you a bit about Garifuna. All right, so um, I want to talk to you guys a little bit today about the more of the larger, broader history of migration from Central America's Caribbean coast. Um, Garifuna folks are Black indigenous communities whose ethnogenesis in St. Vincent and whose um, Cimarranojes and, and Maronage um, identities and political subjectivities as Maroons in St. Vincent, um, and particularly out of the product of what in you know shipwrecked West Africans and uh, Carib, Arawak, indigenous peoples on the island of St. Vincent um, marks their Black indigeneity in a really particularly different way that it has in, in, in other Black indigenous communities throughout the Americas. And one of the particular moments in 1797 with the British exile from St. Vincent to Central America's Caribbean coast is that we see multiple ways of distinct diasporas for Garifuna folks from St. Vincent to Central America's Caribbean coast, particularly to Roatan. Um, and then from uh, Central America's Caribbean coast in particular, there's this um, 
uh, migration at the 20th century because of the United Fruit Company's banana enclaves um, and this push, right? So there's this transnational push at the time, um, but also the Caribbean coast, right? The Caribbean coast becomes an incredibly um, hemispheric space, an important uh, diasporic space for migrations to the United States. And one thing that um, I'm interested in having a conversation about today in dialogue with uh, other panelists, but also with the broader themes of the conference is also to think about um, migration from Latin America and the Caribbean um, as one that pertains to peoples of African descent, right? That in fact, uh, Black Latin American folks are migrating on a daily basis, right? That the US-Mexico border is actually a Black space, right? Um, and that Black space is not one that doesn't necessarily only get conjured when we think about Haitian immigrants right? Um, or when we think about continental Africans on the U.S.-Mexico border, I think it's important to also center uh, the histories and the politics of Black Latin American immigrants who continue to be invisible on the U.S.-Mexico border. In particular, I wanted to talk today a bit about Garifuna, New York, um, particularly because there's two things that are happening with the literature and the scholarship on Central American immigrants in the United States. Um, there's a particular silencing and erasure around Black Indigenous communities from Central America when we think about the broader literature available on Central American immigration, but also in particular, Garifuna folks um, participate within a hemispheric project of Black indigeneity, what I'm calling indigenous Blackness, right? So in this particular kind of broader book project, I'm thinking about indigenous Blackness as a particular uh, political imaginary that's not only solely rooted in St. Vincent as an ancestral home for Garifuna folks, but how um, Garifuna folks are also disrupting our understandings of Blackness and indigeneity simultaneously, right? Um, and one thing in particular about Garifuna folks, Garifuna folks are not the only Black Indigenous peoples in the Americas. There's a long history of Black Indigenous communities throughout, right? So thinking about the Palenques in Colombia, thinking about the Quilombos in Brazil, um, thinking about the Maroons in Jamaica, thinking about the Seminoles in the South, the Gullah and the Gichi in the Carolinas, right? So one thing, that Garifuna folks have quite literally modeled uh, for us in the Americas is how do people of African descent who negotiate an indigenous identity and certainly claim and assert an indigenous identity use their blackness and indigeneity simultaneously to make land, right? Um, and that land um, is not one necessarily rooted in the physicality of a land, but um, it's one rooted in the 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 notion of ancestral uh, territories right ancestral land making which i think it's incredibly important as we think about um Garifuna new yorker communities that have been present since the 50s um are continuing right uh continue continuing this hemispheric project of indigenous blackness, right? So the first image I wanted to share with you all is this image of a ancestral set and an ancestral ceremony of remembrance of gathering. An ancestral gathering of meeting, right? So this is in Orchard Beach, the Bronx, this is in June. Um, and this is a way of really being able to bring intergenerational, transgenerational very from the New Yorkers into conversation with one another in particular, um, particularly because here's a public performance of that even us, right? Here's a, a public performance of an embodied ancestral memory um, as an archive, right? As a, as a space of thinking about what does it mean, right? To, to have the Black Atlantic as the backdrop, right? Um, in a community whose uh, not only transgenerationality, but also the distinct moments, right, of Garifunanis in the city of New York, right? So in particular, this image really captures both the, the cultural, the theoretical, and the political labor that Garifuna women and um, LGBTQ plus Garifuna folks are doing at the forefront of preserving culture, right? And I think what's incredibly important about this image, it's really telling to us about how um, ancestral land making is not necessarily bounded to the physicality, right, of land, but is actually in, in bounded to the embodiment of ancestral knowledge production. And I think what's important about the, the locality of Orchard Beach, the locality of the Bronx, right, and the Bronx having one of the largest Garifuna communities in the city of New York um, after Eastern Brooklyn, particularly 
there's an interesting kind of juxtaposition between both both communities, right? So the Bronx grief in the community is a relatively 1990s kind of phenomenon, while the Eastern Brooklyn, Canarsie, Bedford Stuyvesant, Brownsville is more of a 1950s, 1960s phenomenon, right? Which has a lot to do with just different migration patterns um, and also just different localities, right? Um, Brooklyn at, at one point in its history was one of the largest docks in the city. Um, and and if Garifuna folks are entering the United States, right, the belly of the Imperial Beast through the United Fruit Company, um, those, those 50s and 60s communities are settling, settling in Brooklyn, right? Um, and the Bronx becomes a different reality with the explosion of garment factories in the 90s. And I think it's important to, to always contextualize those different histories in the city. Um, but I wanted to, to spend a little bit of time before turning it over to uh, my fellow panelists to, to talk about this image um, as this image of representing under not only understudied histories of Garifuna Central Americans, but also understanding how public performances of Garifunanes marks a certain kind of indigenous blackness that's grounded in St. Vincent, that is grounded in Central America's Caribbean coast, that's grounded in Orchard Beach, right? That is grounded in multiple spaces. And I think about the work of political theorist, Richard Eiten, who really reminds us about the importance of diaspora as this anaformative impulse, right? As this, as diaspora being this, this, um, impulse to put all places and spaces into conversation with one another, right? To not simply think of diaspora as this cartography or this map where you're just putting dots of where Black folks are located, but also deeply thinking about what, what does it mean to put St. Vincent, La Ceiba, Bluefield, Livingston, right, Dangriga, um, into conversation with each other, right, into conversation with New Orleans, with Brooklyn, right, so thinking about the, the kind of larger U.S. city hubs of Garifuna folks, right, which is Los Angeles, Miami, Atlanta, New Orleans, New York, Chicago, San Francisco, right, so what would it mean to put all of these different spaces together, and in particular, Garifuna New Yorkers being one of the not only the largest Garifuna communities outside of Central America's Caribbean coast, but it's also one of the most um, politically active when it comes to the project of Garifuna cultural preservation. And I think what's incredibly important and what we learned from Garifuna New Yorkers in particular um, is that this work is transgenerational, this work is gendered, this work um, is also very much um, living in the afterlife of mestizaje, right? Um, and this work is also very much living in the afterlife of mestizo, mestizo multiculturalism, right? To, to, to kind of verbally cite the work of Juliet Hooker, right? To also think about what is this project of preserving Garifuna culture throughout the diaspora, but also what does it mean to also preserve Garifuna culture within nation states that continue to imagine and understand Garifuna peoples um, as alien, as outsiders, as marginal, as peripheral to their national identities? Um, because one thing that's really clear here is that this image also really captures not only the, the preservation of Garifuna culture, but also the negotiation that Garifuna folks do in the US when it comes to being read as Caribbean to being read as Central American. So thank you so much for your time. I very much look forward to the conversation during the Q. Thank you, um, Dr. Oro, Lopez Oro. That was, that was a wonderful presentation. I'd like to move us forward to our next speaker, Richie Daly, who will present a paper titled Analyzing Discursive Present Representation and News Coverage of Venezuelan Migrants in Trinidad and Tobago. Richie Daly is a Trinidad Trinidadian Afro-Latin graduate student in the Individualized PhD program at Concordia University in Montreal, Canada. They previously worked at UNHCR, Trinidad and Tobago, and as a Trinidadian NGO's Ministry for Migrants and Refugees, serving asylum seekers and refugees. Their research interests include forced migration and critical mi refugee studies, and they hold a Bachelor's of Arts in Film from the University of the West Indies at St. Augustine, a post 
graduate diploma in gender and, excuse me, gender and development studies and a, a master's of science in gender and development, both from the Institute of Gender and Development Studies at St. Augustine. Please welcome Richie Daly. Um, and uh, Richie, please go ahead and take the mic. Good morning. Uh, thank you for the introduction and this space. Um, my, my paper today abstracts from um, my master's research project um, that centered on uh, the, well, the construction, analyzing how exactly news media sources within Trinidad and Tobago constructed, um, discurs discursively constructed the Venezuelan migrants and refugee. It relies heavily on um, the methodologies uh, of the Erasm project um, out of Lancaster University um, and is something that I hope to uh, build upon in my PhD studies. Um, so a bit of background, uh, Trinidad and Tobago is just 11 kilometers off the coast of uh, Venezuela, off the eastern coast of Venezuela um, and is very close to the states of Delta Macuro and Sucre. Um, and historically, there's been a lot of movement between both of these spaces, both via formal routes and irregular routes. Um, and uh, currently, uh, Trinidad and Tobago is experiencing uh, an increase in the number of Venezuelan migrants and refugees settling, uh, well, arriving to the territory in search of international protection due to the uh, well-reported socioeconomic and sociopolitical crises uh, in Venezuela. Uh, though, new, um, if you were just to go by numbers, the volume of Venezuelan migrants and refugees within Trinidad and Tobago, uh, I guess, pales in comparison to those arriving to other Latin American states like Colombia and, Venez um, and Peru, uh, the number is statistically significant for a population of, of 1.3 million. Um, persons and is um, also Trinidad and Tobago provides a, a, a unique context, I would say, for the Venezuelan migrants and refugee in the sense that Trinidad and Tobago is an Anglophone country um, and also has not ratified, although it's ratified uh, the uh, 1951 Convention on the Status of Refugees and uh, the 1967 Protocol has not implemented any local legislation to kind of provide pathways for actually providing um, international protection to uh, any asylum seekers and refugees in the territory. Though to address the, the rising volume of Venezuelan migrants arriving into the space, uh, Trinidad, uh, the government of Trinidad and Tobago implemented uh, temporary like Venezuelan migrant refugee exercise, notably the exercise was mandatory. Um, and in the exercise provided about like 16,523 Venezuelans with the uh, work permit exemption, which allowed them the legal right to work within the territory, but also did not necessarily provide any children who were registered with uh, access to the public education system or any person's registered with any kind of like comprehensive healthcare um, and is always subject to renewal. Currently, it's still unclear whether or not the, because uh, the original, the term of the work permit exemption was originally just one year. And since then it's been renewed by the Ministry of National Security. The Ministry of National Security is also, despite the increasing volume um, of Venezuelans arriving to, the, to Trinidad and Tobago, they have decided to, uh, halt <laughs> implement like doing any further registration exercises um and so that that's been the key the context um so the my so my research kind of built on well collected about like 808 um articles from three major local news sources um print new sources, print or rather written new, source, new sources because one of these sources is primarily digital. Um, and I did a corpus linguistics analysis and then uh, a critical, this 
discourse analysis of like some articles in the out of the corpus. Um, so the corpus is like representative and is largely centered around like themes about crime, Venezuelan womanhood, uh, detentions and deportations, um, COVID nineteen, and also the Venezuelan migration rec uh, reg the migration migrant registration exercise. Um, and it collected articles spanning the period April 2018 to December 2020. Um, to note uh, from the uh, the actual just uh, raw analysis through the um, corpus linguistics tool, uh, the major categoric word, the that the primary categoric word that was kind of identified within the corpus was police and secondary to that was Venezuelan. Um, and the pronouns that were more frequently used in terms of the reporting were uh, the plural, the, the, the plural usage of they um, and uh, over the course of the corpus, what was most over the, over the, period of time that's being analyzed because I did like a sub like created sub corpora for each year um police kind of recurs as the uh major categoric word that is kind of present um and in terms of like a keyword analysis which kind of like analyzes the statistical significance of the language is actually being used um the Venezuelan, of course, then supersedes as the major categoric word. Um, and but like a, the a lot of the top 10 terms that are like that are used uh are often oftentimes refer to like either criminal acts or um some interact some form of state apparatus. Um so you have like trafficking, anti-crime. Um, immigration Detention Center, or the acronym for Immigration Detention Center, as well as different rankings for different like police um, or defense force um, members. Um, in terms of multi word terms, like uh, what was most interesting is that, like, again, notions of like the in engagement between uh, the Venezuelan migrant refugee and the like wider state apparatus, this kind of also recurs. Um, you have a lot of illegal entry, um, trafficking unit, immigration division. Um, and interestingly, but to note, refugee convention, refugee status, and asylum seeker do occur within the um, top 50 kind of multi-word terms, but they they are definitely less prevalent than like terms like illegal, um, illegal Venezuelan or um, like basically, so then theme these, again, these themes of like securitization, detention, criminality kind of recur. And of course, news media is used to report on like, uh, I guess, important events. Um, uh, and so they do detail a lot of like government functions, but it's just interesting to know that like of, most of the article, most of the articles collected in the corpus kind of uh, indicate like some rep rather they represent the illustrate rather sorry the, uh, some uh, interaction between state apparatus, be it judicial or actually just um, state security and uh, the Venezuelan migrant and refugee um, with specific reference to like, women and girls and the representation within the corpus, a lot of it refers to um, <laughs> vivid kind of graphic descriptions of uh, some form of either sexual violence, attempted sexual violence, or the notions of sexual exploitation. Though the term Venezuelan mother also is somewhat, rel is, is high, high in um, statistical significance across the corpus, which is, interesting um, because most of the references do, most of the references within the corpus tend to be relatively degendered and kind of referred to like uh, general um, Venezuela and using like pronouns to kind of distinguish 
who or like the gender of the individual is being referred to. Um, so like, uh, bef- like there's in using the collocation analysis, which I think was a, which is a much richer kind of resource because it provides actual context and just like excerpting words from a, from a ma- from mass massive reams of text. Um, you kind of realize that the I, I input the adjective Venezuela uh, to to understand uh, the words that most frequently co-occur with this term. And the terms that were more frequently co-occurred were many and illegal. Um, the semantic preference for the adjective illegal occurred uh, over 341 times. And it also co-occurred with the term immigrant and Venezuelan. Um, and in, this is in contrast to the term Venezuelan refugee. Um, so it can be said like the semantic prosody for like framing Venezuelan migrants and refugees as illegal or framing their existence in perceived illegality um, as opposed to refugees, individuals in need of international protection um, who should not be penalized for the the irregular entry to a space um, is telling. Um, So the data that it was um, gotten through the, like the data that was, that is available through both the corpus linguistics analysis and the discursive analysis is vast. So for the purposes, like from here on, I'm just gonna really focus on like one kind, one event, which was the reporting, um, the reporting on statements by the chief immigration officer to the uh, parliament um, on the status of the number of Venezuelans entering the country and also the conditions of ID of the immigration detention center. That part was more backgrounded in terms of the general reporting on the event. What what frequently occurred is uh, throughout the articles um, from two of these news sources, Trinidad Newsday and Loop News, is there was like a heightened focus on numbers and uh, also the t- using like uh, present participles. So like coming or arriving, um, which kind of serve as like an aggregational linguistic mechanism, but also kind of serves to just reinforce a continuous state of growth or continuous flow, inward flow to Trinidad and Tobago of Venezuelan migrants and refugees. Um, and the, the ways in which uh, the articles also like relayed this information kind of used particular were like uh, verbs in in uh, in in with reference to like uh, the statements made by the um, chief immigration officers. Terms like revealed, as opposed to like uh, I guess more neutral terms like reported, uh, kind of suggesting that like this information that the chief immigration officer was kind of bringing to the to the parliament and the Sea Nation was kind of a secret that was kind of being off like obfuscated. Um, and this kind of like this continued reinforcement between like uh, secrecy and like the the hidden nature or you know the uncertainty about the numbers of Venezuelans actually in the within Trinidad and Tobago um, kind of just served to it also depersonalize the realities of the individuals in yeah. In, on the move and maybe the underlying reasons for those movements, but um, just so to just kind of like sensationalize and highlight the fact that there's, there is a volume, especially at this time for context, there was, there's, there was like multiple sources that could not, and still to this day cannot actually pin down the number of persons. You have uh, the government stating 16,000 all the way up to 60,000 and then recently, um, other politicians kind of went with even larger numbers. Um, so, Hello, like, Richie. I'm sorry to interrupt. Just as a reminder that uh, you can, if you would wrap up in two more minutes, that would be wonderful. Not a problem. That's actually so. I mean, I again, uh, notions of illegality and securitization, um, they kind of 
recur again throughout the reporting of the of her statements and there's actually deliberate backgrounding of like the real concerns um addressed by NGOs at that same presentation of like uh the prolonged detention times uh the poor psycho allegations of psychological and physical abuse those things are kind of backgrounded in terms of uh continuing to reference uh the individuals as possible illegals or possible or like possibly in breach of the law and uh so the the majority of my uh master's research honestly just kind of focuses on the mecha mechanisms and the language and the actual textual sources um, and doesn't really deviate from that to provide like an additive analysis of like the broader cultural context and the the race uh the implications of like race and class um and also the cultural legacies of um neocolonialism and colonialism on these spaces and the nature of this movement the situation is obviously ongoing and um, individuals are now being reported to be departing from Trinidad in back to Venezuela. Um, so for me, I guess it, going forward, I definitely want to uh, kind of probe more at the beyond just notions of uh, illegality, but also releasing it to kind of like the dependence on petrochemicals at both Trinidad and Tobago and Venezuela share and that ongoing diplomatic tie and how that is kind of allowing for the continued uh, emphasis on securitization as opposed to notions of international protection and humanitarianism, even though those can be critiqued. Um, so yeah, that's it in brief. Thank you. Thank you, Richie. We're looking forward to learning more in the Q&A session. Okay, we'll move on to our next speaker. We do have one missing speaker. Um, so we'll have three, I think, uh, for today. Uh, our next speaker is Shalene Gomez, who will present a paper titled Competing Nationalisms, Venezuelans and Spanish Speakers in Postcolonial Trinidad and Tobago. So tying in well with uh, what we just uh, heard. Shalene Gomez, PhD, is a soci sociocultural anthropologist at the University of the West Indies St. Augustine campus in Trinidad and Tobago. A senior research associate in the Department of Anthropology and Development Studies at the University of Johannesburg, her monograph, Cosmopolitanism, Cosmopolitanism from the Global South, uh, published by Palgrave Macmillan in 2021, traces Caribbean cosmopolitan sensibilities through Rastafari imaginaries of and migration to Ethiopia. Research interests include mobilities, post-colonial religion and spirituality, ethnography and narrative, as well as the politics of race, class and gender. Uh, please welcome uh, Dr. Gomez. Um, and Dr. Gomez, you may take the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that um, warm introduction. Please uh, call me Shaleen. I came in a bit late. I am so sorry that I missed um, the beginning of Richie's presentation, but I certainly hope we'll have a bit more time in question and answer um, and in our discussion uh, to discuss some of these overlapping um, issues and problems that may also arise um, in some of the thoughts that I'm offering today. So this is uh, thinking through how to approach uh, this um, work on what I've called competing nationalisms, uh, following on from my initial ethnographic study, thinking about um, imaginations and how Rastafari have physically moved um, to urban Ethiopia and imagine themselves um, in the image of uh, His Majesty uh, Emperor Haile Selassie I, but also who imagine themselves as belonging across these various uh, polities and across these various borders. Um, so this is drawing on that, but also thinking through competing nationalisms, as I'm currently working on an edited volume jointly with uh, Scott Timke, who is an economic sociologist to think about race, class, and nationalism in the post-colonial Caribbean. 
So today I'm offering a few thoughts, uh, drawing upon the movement of persons from Venezuela to the small island of Trinidad in the Southern Caribbean to start to think through um, competing nationalisms. And studying this movement can help us to reveal how inequalities of various sorts are perpetuated by post-colonial nationalism. So when I refer to post-colonial nationalism in this context, I am thinking of the narrow parameters of belonging within collectives of imagined communities that constrain nationhood and have very real effects on people's lives through state mechanisms. So from my disciplinary training in social anthropology, I tend to look first at the, to the empirical, um, and then I start from the particular to build up wider ethnographic pictures in identifying patterns of social and cultural life and how these cross-cut experiences of populations. So in this presentation today, I focus on the reproduction of systemic brutality in the post-colonial present within South-South migration and how this brutality is observable in what I call the competing nationalisms at play in this most recent Venez uh, migration of Venezuelans to Trinidad. So I do this by presenting a vignette of migrant survival in Trinidad and Tobago. This is again uh, me starting to think through uh, competing nationalisms as a sort of anchor for looking at how various kinds of systemic brutalities are shaped and experienced. Um, and so I draw from the story of Ernesto, a Venezuelan migrant man. This is a pseudonym, of course, um, with whom I have not yet spent a great deal of time. Um, but I uh, will be planning to do a bit more of this empirical data collection and do a bit more of this field work uh, in Trinidad, as hopefully uh, as the year progresses. And so through uh, vi this vignette of Ernesto's survival in Trinidad in particular, I center survival rather than aspirations for a better life that are often thought to be the central motivation for migration. So certainly betterment of this sort is typically the, the motivation for intra-Caribbean migration and Caribbean migration to wealthier destinations in the global north, their destinations of North America, the UK and Europe. So in the case of refugees, asylum seekers, and some migrants from Venezuela to Trinidad, it is the struggles for survival, to stay alive and to meet basic needs for food, shelter, and safety that are most immediate. So as we are well aware, immigration is nothing new um, to the Caribbean and specifically to the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. Quite a few people are migrants coming from elsewhere. Um, uh, with approximately 3% of, of what was at the time about 1.2, 1.3 million people uh, recorded as immigrants. So largely from other English speaking Caribbean countries, but also from Nigeria, India, and the Philippines. Um, as Richie has also mentioned, there are uh, varying numbers of present day Venezuelan migrants in Trinidad and Tobago. So these range, of course, um, from the low thousands to the tens of thousands. But it is a comparatively small number compared to uh, the 5 million, for example, approximately Venezuelan migrants in Latin America and the Caribbean in general. And so to return to Trinidad and Tobago, most of the population are also descended from forced voluntary and coerced groups brought to the territories in the post-conquest era. I think a few brief remarks about Trinidad and Tobago's history here will help to contextualize these, the kinds of concerns. So historically, the extermination, enslavement, and selective integration of multicultural indigenous populations that accompanied Spanish colonization in the 16th century was followed by a French plantocracy in the 18th century and British conquest in the 19th century with limited sugar and cocoa production primarily, but not solely through African enslavement and South Asian indentureship. Historical migrations between colonial Trinidad and Venezuela, most significantly in the 19th and early 20th centuries, as persons came as both workers and owners of cocoa estates, have not left sizable numbers of actual Spanish speakers in Trinidad. 
Given this modern history of migrations, what is new in this movement from Venezuela to Trinidad Tobago, um, and in particular to Trinidad, is the scale and the protracted circumstances of this economic and political crisis. What is also terrifying are the prospects for worsening political and diplomatic relations, as well as regional conflict. Of course, this is changing now um, in the context of current conditions in Russia and Europe and with US neo-imperialism. In considering related points of mobility and stasis then, some migrants are more vulnerable than others, as we are very well aware of. Yet mobility is key to survival, as well as to meet the varied labor demands of countries and capitalism. Correspondingly, the managed mobility of the state serves to reproduce the rapid glamorization and then demonization of categories of mobile people, as Nina Glickschiller and Noelle Salazar remark. Such policies differently affect migrants. So consider this glamorization of mobility under globalization travel for leisure, for work, intercultural contact, these are all highly valued um, to a degree, as well as accessible for more people at present than 40 years ago, for example. But some persons on the move are nationally, socially, and morally constructed as desirable versus undesirable, or those whose labor, skills, and social capital are desirable initially, and then become unnecessary or redundant and who then risk becoming undocumented when permission to work or reside expires. So the point I'm sort of circling around here is that the managed mobility of the state and the differential incorporation of migrants are also manifestations of systemic brutality. And so within this comparatively small migration from Venezuela to Trinidad, these sorts of inequalities cross-cut experiences and the trajectories of Venezuelan migrants. There are differential capacities to mitigate the risks of migration and resettlement. And some enter by plane and go through immigration control at the international airports in Trinidad. Um, now Venezuelan nationals are required to have entry visas, um, which were not necessary before 2019. But others throw off life vests when they land on the beach, often in southern Trinidad. And this is also the story of Ernesto. Ernesto's experiences are unique, as well as demonstrating the commonalities of shared experience with migrants navigating narrow institutional frameworks of belonging for everyday survival. Ernesto, his brother, and their families live in a rented two-bedroom apartment in urban Trinidad, and they, uh, he arrived with his wife, brother, his brother's uh, wife, two children, and also he now has a child, braving the ocean in inflatable dinghies, risking the short yet choppy journey from Venezuela in 2018. Shortly after settling in Trinidad, Ernesto confronted hostile verbal, res verbal responses sorry, from locals tinged with xenophobic sentiments, ordering him to go back from where he came from, for example, while he was doing routine activities such as going to the neighborhood shop or walking around trying to find odd jobs to earn money. So even though there were moments of uh, kindness and a shared humanity, for example, uh, Ernesto's landlord was nice, he was amable, his apartment was sufficient, these encounters were disquieting, they were threatening. And, and so currently migrants from Venezuela are the main scapegoats in Trinidad. They are blamed, and of course this, these uh, contexts are always changing, they are blamed for various ills, like introducing COVID-19 into the country, rising unemployment, and decreasing wages. Stereotypes are tied into narratives and their involvement in crime. They are blamed for the breakup of marriages because so-called loose migrant women seduce and steal, quote unquote, local men, right, from respectable partners or partners who are framed as respectable. Um, arguably, Venezuelans have replaced migrants from Guyana and the Eastern Caribbean islands who were drawn to the prospects for work in oil and its derivatives in Trinidad from the early 20th century, and likewise selectively labeled as bad foreigners and categorized as illegals. This, of course, is now changing with the economic situation in Guyana. So this isn't to deny that illegal activities do take place among locals and migrants alike, but to emphasize that it is migrants who are trying to survive, who confront the brunt of such micro prejudices, as well as state policies on detention and deportation, while the state also offers migrant registration schemes to benefit from their labor. 
So within this vignette, macro level conditions are noteworthy. Trinidad and Tobago's well-developed oil and natural gas industry, as I mentioned, is also subject to international commodity price fluctuations. And of course, there was an additional decline with COVID-19. While government data is limited, unemployment and underemployment um, are visible and acute problems. These conditions, therefore, make it easy to criminalize certain groups of migrants, such as those who arrive by boat from Venezuela. Um, in short, the migrants trying to survive. So it wasn't until Ernesto's labor benefited the community. He started working on jobs. He developed um, better relationships. He got to know, he became more familiar with people um, working on jobs or, and also working in construction that the harsh words in the neighborhood receded. Um, they, didn't, they weren't eliminated, of course, completely, but they did recede. So these days, Ernesto said, I work at construction. Um, and this, again, is on and off. So work will be steady at least for the next few months, or it was steady, and it has picked up. It's unclear the kind of work Ernesto did when he lived in Venezuela. But since living in Trinidad, he's established that he's skilled in construction, masonry, and painting. But the quality of his work isn't reflected in the thickness of his pockets. So 200 sometimes, 200 TT dollars is at most, um, is the most he's made in a day, for example. And he may work three days a week on average. <clears throat> Excuse me, while he seems content with this, being able to pay the rent after joining funds with his brother who does the same type of work, this monthly sum is less than what is reasonably required to support a small family. So, Minimum wage in Trinidad Tobago is $17.50 um, an hour, which is approximately $2.50 US. Um, he and Ernesto and his brother also support an ailing mother in Venezuela sporadically when they can. And sometimes, of course, work doesn't come. And this is precisely what happened during the lockdowns in Trinidad and Tobago. As well as since uh, neither Ernesto nor any member of his family is a national, there was no way to access government social programs for financial assistance. Wearing a face mask and carrying a bottle of water, Ernesto would walk door to door seeking small jobs to help feed his family. So in 2020, he had decided in the middle to the end of 2020, um, and this has now changed, but at that time he decided to tell his landlord to cut the electricity. He wouldn't be able to pay for the luxury of light, he said. So he preferred his family to sweat in the still dark night sheltered and then brave the street though. But amid this kind of strife and particularly during these acute months of 2020, some neighbor, neighbors helped the family. Um, and Ernesto developed a sense of indebtedness to them for helping to pay his rent, bills and giving him food. Outside of Ernesto's neighborhood also, community groups have come together and organized food collection and delivery to migrant families, not only from Venezuela, but again, these are fulfilling the basic needs. Um, this collective effort at the community level, an organic cohesion of sorts, which complemented the capitalist demands for wage labor, also starkly contrasts to popular anti-migrant sentiments. For now, Ernesto can provide for his family. But at any moment, this can change. If he or his landlord finds himself a member of an anti-migrant mob, if his boss is unable to find him work, if state authorities decide that he is ineligible to apply for refugee or asylum status or work registration, Ernesto and his family will likely find themselves again struggling to survive. To conclude then, Gradients of migrant acceptability and therefore unacceptability emanating from Anglophone nationalism and Trinbagonian multiculturalism shape how Spanish speaking Venezuelan migrants are discursively and institutionally situated in the post colonial present. These dynamics demonstrate how othering functions on a continuum rather than as a clearly defined local foreign dichotomy. In effect, this nationhood embraces the state's management of mobility, um, and that's particularly important for a petro state like Trinidad and Tobago, which requires international labor, and in turn criminalizes vulnerable migrants, thereby reproducing vulnerability at a structural level who do not and cannot seek uh, the state's permission either to enter or exit. Um, and so the byproduct of these beliefs, um, I'm starting to argue, 
is the systemic brutality of competing nationalisms. And I will end here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shalene. Uh, fascinating work that you're doing here. Um, so I'll give everyone a few minutes to just kind of, you know, reflect on, on what has been going on. I don't see any uh, questions yet in the chat or in the Q&A um, function, but I do have some questions. So I will start with those questions and then we can proceed to any questions from the um, audience. Um, so my first question is for Dr. Oro. Um, I'm, I'm hoping you can say a little bit more about um, what you refer to as a making land practice. Um, you said that this was not about the physical land, which is, an, I think, an interesting point to make, especially in relation to indigeneity here in North America, um, for instance. Um, you said it was not physical. You contrasted uh, this making land um, with a kind of notion of ancestral territory that was embodied. Um, so I wanted to ask you to just elaborate a little bit more on that. And then with the image that you showed us, you know, in the background from Orchard, where was it? Orchard something, Orchard Beach and, and the Bronx, um, there was, you know, a, an image of the sea. So I wondered about water um, in relation to land, um, you know, if, if that is part of, you know, um, Garifuna identity or how Garifuna identity sort of relates to the notion of water, to notions of islandness, to the notion of land. Um, so that is the question that I have for Dr. Oro. And then perhaps while he's ruminating on that, um, I'll ask a question for Richie and Shalene. Um, so I have two questions for you. Um, the first has to do with, I'm wondering to what extent is identification as Caribbean part of a response by Venezuelan immigrants or migrants um, to Trinidad and Tobago? Um, a kind of embrace of Caribbean identity. Um, and I'm asking this question, drawing on my own experience um, in the 1980s meeting Venezuelan immigrants. So, uh, you know, earlier sort of uh, moments of migration from Venezuela who spoke to me and uh, about a common and shared uh, Caribbean-ness, which I had never thought about as, uh, you know, Venezuela as kind of part of this Caribbean. I'm West Indian from Barbados. Uh, so I, th that was a kind of moment of shock for me to, for, for someone to sort of, you know, sort of make this claim that we had a sort of shared common Caribbean-ness. Um, so I wanted to ask you if, if you have any, you know, data or any uh, sort of thoughts on, on this idea of embracing Caribbean identity as a, a response, a way to sort of mitigate, if, if, if possible, um, you know, the, the, the difficulties of, of migration. And then the second question has to do with language. Both of you spoke about the tensions that emerge because obviously Trinidad and Tobago is um, an Anglo-Caribbean society and sort of, uh, you know, Venezuelans are, are, are Spanish speakers. And so I wanted just to ask you to reflect on the question of language a little bit. Thank you. And we can go in whatever order anyone wishes. I can definitely jump in. Uh, thank you so much for the questions. I really uh, deeply appreciate the engagement. Um, I do want to address the land, the the land question, particularly because I think what what lessons we learn from Garifuna folks in particular um, is this disruption around the ontological impossibilities for Black folks to be Indigenous in the Americas, and I think what what's really important here and what the what I'm working through is to also think about what would it mean for us to understand people of African descent in the Americas, particularly survivors of the Middle Passage, to be indigenous to the Americas? And what would that relationship, not only to the physicality of land, but to also the embodiedness of ancestral territories have, right? So this is not only just building on the on, on my interlocutors who are Garifuna activists and um, Garifuna activists activists in New York City and Central America's Caribbean coast, right? But even in Colombia, in La Toma, Francia Marquez, who's 
going to possibly be the first black presidential candidate uh, to be in Colombia talks about her ancestral community as indigenous, right? As indigenous to La Toma, right? That the Middle Passage made them indigenous to the region. And I think it's incredibly important to see how Garifuna folks are really disrupting this, uh, this continued um, ontological impossibility for black folks to have land, right? Access to land, right? But also, and particularly even in the context of Latin America, right? The context of Latin America is that the majority of black folks in Latin America are living in rural communities who also understand their rural communities to be ancestral to their blackness, right? To be part of what they understand their blackness in relationship to the nation state, right? So Garifuna folks in many ways know, know this choreographed dance, right? This choreography around indigeneity and blackness in a way that allows them to fold into the nation state, right? And particularly I'm thinking here the, the groundbreaking work of Juliet Hooker, where she writes about Black exclusion, indigenous inclusion within the multicultural movements of Latin America, right? Garifuna folks had had to strategically position their indigeneity, not in opposition to their Blackness, but in simultaneous conversation to their Blackness, right? Um, so this is where land making becomes really important because you don't have ancestral territorios, right? You don't have ancestral lands in New York City. So this is where I turn to public performances of Garifuna and it's of how how do public performances of ancestral remembrance, of, of gatherings, right, of bringing ancestors into the spaces of New York City really helps us understand how very from the New Yorkers are making land, right? The discursiveness, the metaphor, the political imaginaries of land into Orchard Beach in the Bronx, right? into Rockaway, right, Rockaway, far Rockaway Beach in, in, in Brooklyn and Queens, right? So this is where I'm thinking about also, you know, the Black Atlantic is really present in that image, right? And it's really important. Um, and I'm not trying, and in fact, when I bring up the Black Atlantic, I'm definitely not necessarily just thinking about Paul Gilroy, but also thinking about the work of Omi Sheik and Natasha Tinsley, right? Where she really disrupts uh, the queerness of the Black Atlantic for us, right? To also really think about what would it mean for us to have a, a, a different sense of what queerness could be, right? As a practice of resistance to normative structures of violence. Well, this image for me that I shared is entirely queer, right? It's an entirely queer image of seeing Garifuna folks and particularly Garifuna New Yorkers who are transgenerational, right? Folks who had been in New York City since the 50s, folks who were born and raised in the 90s and 80s and folks who just arrived, right? Um, coming into a space, into a public space to really perform their garifuna is something that, um, I'm really drawn to, and it's something that I think really gives us a different understanding of diaspora, but also migration, right? And I think it's important to think about, particularly when we think about Black folks migrating, um, what is it about Blackness that remains non-immigrant? What is it about Blackness that also in the, in the United States gets to also be read as something as if immigration isn't a black issue, right? Um, and I think there's something important here that Garifuna folks are constantly teaching us is that, you know, these caravans, when we see it on, on CNN and MSNBC, you don't really see a lot of black folks, right? And in fact, you would, if, you know, folks don't know the region, they'd be like, oh, so it's a mostly mestizo region. In fact, Central America is a mostly black and indigenous region, right? The caravans are mostly mestizos, but guess Guess what? The Black and Indigenous communities organize their own caravans, right? Because of the anti-Blackness, of the anti-indigeneity that happens in these spaces. So I think it's important to really think about these, um, these constant movements. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Shaleen and Richie, would you be interested in responding to the earlier question? Yes, thank you very much. Um, so, uh, Richie, if you don't mind, I can go ahead. Um, okay, great. So, I think uh, one of the things that I also keep coming back to, and I'm going to be talking about this a bit more um, in a keynote that I will give uh, in the summer at um, an anthropological society, is the question of a Caribbean ecumeny. So I think this ties in both of your, your questions very neatly. 
um, because it is again, and again, I am very sorry I missed Dr. Lopez Oro's uh, talk because we also have in this volume that I am um, that jointly editing, we also have a contribution um, on contemporary Garifuna um, in Honduras. Um, but hopefully we can always speak later on. But the the thing that I keep coming back to again is the is the question of the Caribbean Ecumeni. And as a socio-cultural area shaped through modernity, shaped through proto-capitalism and capitalism, and the lived kind of multiculture of the plantation America, that has also been very uh, exploitative and created degrees of subordination, repressive systems that have transcended geographies, um, but have also then presented opportunities for new kinds of um, cultural patterns to emerge, new kinds of worldviews to emerge. And so I think this is where um, Venezuela, to a degree, can certainly be seen as part of that um, Caribbean ecumenic, right? That sociocultural area that also in anthropology as a specific discipline allows us to rethink culture as homogenous. So uh, pre, certainly uh, pre-conquest culture, we have a great deal of archaeological evidence was the heterogeneous. Um, and the kinds of messiness of, of Caribbean um, lived multiculture that came along with capitalism and proto-capitalism, I think, allows us to understand how there are um, patterns that we see replicated, even while there are very specific um, experiences, very specific as well trajectories. And so I think I do also very much um, think through, and I'm going to think through a bit more as well, the idea of the Caribbean Ecumeni, um, because for to, to a degree, um, there is a way in which uh, histories of Venezuela, um, colonial histories of Venezuela, have shaped systems. And certainly there are great political and economic divergences as well as similarities, but there are also a great deal of cultural and social similarities. And so the language, for example, a simple thing, um, because uh, Anglophone nationalism in, in uh, Trinidad and Tobago, just as an example, is very narrow, right? So it's seen as this um, English speaking Anglo-Saxon or as Lloyd Best would say, Afro-Saxon um, dominated um, country there, but there are also patterns in which there's a formal standard English language, but there's a colloquial English, right? So in Venezuela, there's formal uh, state language, Spanish, and there's also colloquial Spanish. Um, so I don't know if that answers very well the question about language, but certainly I think the idea of the Caribbean Ecumene helps us to think through these historical ties, um, along with changing geopolitical conditions as well. So thank you. Thank you. Richie, do you have any thoughts to share on this? Yeah, so um, the point about language and perhaps so like the notions of like competing nationalisms, something that I also observed uh, through in certain reporting, especially um, on statements by the prime minister in response to international organizations, criticisms of reforma and uh, like detention practices um, of the Trinidad and Tobago government in relation to Venezuelan migrants and refugees is this like kind of enactment of uh, I, I call like a post-colonial slash decolonial kind of rhetoric in 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 the name of uh, defending um, Trinidadian sovereignty and um, in terms of kind of positioning Trinidad and Tobago's uh, decision to uh, enact certain forms of brutality um, as a um, as a post-colonial like you know uh, like a post-colonial act in in terms of like enacting like uh, the the power to self-determine and the power to to govern as one sees fit, um, which is an interesting <laughs> um, development um, and it continues to recur um, in terms of in terms of like the the tensions between international organizations on the ground and the Trinidad government. Um, and in terms of like this notion of an anglophone and to your point, and so building off of that point too, in terms of uh, certain re, uh, 
interviews that I've done in relation to another people, um, what I've observed uh, there's this notion of Caribbean identity within the communities of Venezuelan migrants and refugees. Um, it 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 varies across the spectrum. I think it is very much affected by race. Um, certain Black Venezuelans may concept may have uh, have expressed um, a different affinity for integration and um, also just different possibilities for integration within Trinidadian space. Um, and you also have like this kind of also this resistance by certain members of the Venezuelan community in terms of using the term Ingleses to refer to Trinidadians. Um, and Ingleses, they generally used to refer to Black Trinidadians uh, in, in, in the interactions that I've had. Um, it's not, um, and the, the use of Ingleses uh, is kind of their, their own pejorative in response to the Trinidadian, uh, <laughs> the Trinidadian use of Spanish to refer to all um, the, the Venezuelan migrants and refugees um, and Venice, which has also been deployed in the media in different instances, in fact, in front page headlines um, uh, to refer to these communities. So there's, but then you have in another instance, there's a, a artist, a Venezuelan artist in Trinidad. Her name is a um, musician. Um, Maya Real, and she uses Caribe side oftentimes to refer to herself and her music um, and her cultural production and is very open to like the notions of like uh, continued collaboration and um, like fusioning like uh, traditionally Trinidadian music forms with uh, like more Latine kind of cultural production so I think it's it's a complete it's evolving um and so it's a very interesting thing to keep tabs on yeah thank you um Kristen Collins has a question for Dr. Oro do you see differences between the ways that Garifuna people are subjected to and experience anti-black and anti-indigenous violences in Central America and in the United States Well, while we're waiting for Dr. Oro, um, are there any? I'm other... so sorry, I didn't catch that. Oh, I'm so okay. sorry. My yep, my Wi-Fi came in and out. Okay, but that... absolutely. Um, this is from Kristen Collins. Do you see differences between the ways that Garifuna people are subjected to and experience anti-black and anti-indigenous mm -hmm. violence mm -hmm. in, in Central America and in the United States? Oh. Well, absolutely, absolutely. There are vast differences. You know, one thing about grief in the communities on Central America's Caribbean coast is that, you know, the Caribbean coast in Central America had always been both this, um, this geopolitical space that had been really abandoned by mestizo governance, right, from the 18th and 19th century. There was, and also because of British colonialism, there had always been this very, um, very complicated relationship to Spanish colonialism in the interior. So I would say what's the vast difference that I see in Garifuna communities um, and their political struggles in Central America's Caribbean coast is more about land, land rights and land dispossession, right? Particularly um, in Honduras, there's these foreign capital investors that are really just have their claws into the coast and they're really building these resorts where, um, essentially they're displacing these uh, territories, right? These ancestral, I mean, so the language of ancestral territory comes directly from Garifuna land activists, right? Um, and this is actually a constitutional negotiation. This is a treaty that Garifuna folks work with the Republic of Honduras and Honduras isn't keeping their market, right? They're not keeping their end of the bargain. Um, so a lot of it is a land dispossession. And, and when I say land dispossession, uh, I wanna really emphasize the vibe islands of that land is possession, right? Um, which is not just materially or culturally or economically, it's also the, the physical violence, right? People are being dis disappeared, right? If, if there is a resort that wants certain parts of Garifuna land, uh, 
families will disappear, right? They won't make the nation headlines, right? Um, and this is where a lot of the political activism that's happening in Central America's Caribbean coast and Garifuna communities also it stays internal, right? If that makes any sense, right? So a lot of a lot of you know the disappearances really shapes that. So um, what I also see in New York is this other flip side, right? That there's this other kind of flip side around um, an investment in multiculturalism, right? Which I think most sociologists of Black immigration would say, oh, this is a distancing to African Americans. What I would like my work to do do is actually disrupt this immediate narrative of like, well, they're just dissing themselves, you know, ethnicity becomes the shield and, you know, black immigrants get to say, well, no, we're, we're Jamaican, we're not African American and use ethnicity as this way of making alterity and difference. And in fact, what I actually think a lot about in my work is um, what does it mean for Garifuna folks and other, right, Spanish speaking black immigrants to be in the company of African Americans, right, to be in the political, social, cultural company of African Americans, right, because Garifuna folks get to find um, solidarity through culture, right, get to find solidarity through um, ideas of the African diaspora being present, right, so there is, you know, um, a Garifuna table at the Harlem African Festival, right, so like thinking about those different, you know, moments, right? Thinking about the corner of the Schomburg Center, 135th and Lennox, right? Thinking about these intersections um, are really important in the context of the U.S. And I think there's such a need to preserve culture, Garifuna culture, because there's such a, a concern for the loss of it, right? And I think that that loss is something that really propels folks. I mean, the loss of Garifuna culture in the context of the United States is similar to the loss of Garifuna land in the context of Central America. Great, thank you. Um, Alexandria Miller has a question for Richie. Could you speak a bit more about your methodologies and potential, potentially other areas of analysis you may be considering in which it would be uh, incorporate, that would incorporate other sources outside of news coverage? So your methodologies and the potential for other sources outside of news coverage, limitations, advantages. Um, so for the purposes of the research project for my master's thesis, I relied heavily on corpus linguistics analysis and um, critical discourse analysis, primarily um, closer Ravenix kind of three-tiered framework for um, the investigation, uh, investigating uh, the production of othering through um, media sources. Um, and like Paul Baker's like blend of corpus linguistics and um, uh, discursive analysis um, for the purposes of for illustrating similar, similar themes uh, generally centered around like othering. Um, and so, what that means is that yes, it's very textually driven and sometimes text is um, can hide a lot of the like source, like the wider cultural context and also the legacies of migration that these two spaces kind of share. Um, and so now I'm, I've caught a lot of people with um, a colleague that kind of instead utilize narrative analysis um, of and so in that, in that instance, we kind of interviewed over um, a number of Venezuelan women, kind of we wanted to focus primarily on the ways in which um, femininity, um, racialized femininity in particular, was being, uh, was understood and also being constructed by them and, and how notions of femininity and gender were kind of, uh, shaping or perhaps uh, rather not just shaping, but also um, being resisted um, by the women within the communities. Um, and so, but and to that point, I'm now kind of more <laughs> trying to do uh, more sociocultural uh, research. I'm at the very beginning of my PhD program so things are relatively still vague um, in that regard but it um, 
yeah, it kind of like a, a critical geographies approach and also a critical refugee studies approach. I especially enjoy a critical refugee studies approach because of the focus on like the refugee or the migrant as an intentionalized being, um, as opposed to uh, a productive member of the community that we're trying to kind of place. Um, and so that's it in very brief. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Shaleen, would you like to go ahead and ask your question? Yes, thank you. So um, from Alexandria's question, but also when uh, Richie was, was replying, I was thinking also um, about this question of methodology because um, and collaborative work, um, but also producing the production of knowledge, right, and scholarship, because um, one of the things I drew on from these remarks that I just gave was a a blog post that uh, a postgraduate student and I, Elron Elahi, had co-authored for the Sociological Review. Um, and it was really uh, centering um, Ernesto's uh, experiences as both very unique, but also shared. And one of the things that we also, we all discussed was the, was co-authorship, right? With Ernesto and under his, uh, under his real name. Um, because as an undocumented migrant as he was at that time, that could have been a way to um, perhaps leverage some kind of publicity that would help um, move forward his asylum um, case. But again, there's a fear um, of, of, of persecution, right? Um, and so thinking through the kinds of ways um, that knowledge is produced, it's also produced very collaboratively, but then who gets the credits, right? Um, and how particularly in cases of uh, forced migration and refugee and asylum seekers, uh, this is also something, something to consider. So this is less on more of what I work on, but I wanted to ask also whether um, Richie and uh, Dr. Lopez Oro um, have done this kind of collaborative work, um, particularly if you're working with refugee and asylum seekers and thought about these kinds of questions. Thank you. Or should I say anyone else in the audience? <laughs> uh, it was a good question. So I don't think that's that's the problem. There may be some problems with Wi-Fi and, and so on. Yeah, we can always come back to it if we have time. <laughs> okay, I see a message from Dr. Lopez Oro. I think. <laughs> um, would you care to um, uh, just briefly like paraphrase the question about collaborative work with the communities? Okay, yes, thank you. So uh, thinking about um, production of knowledge, but also scholarship and how um, uh, authorship and co-authorship works when you're working with um, refugee and asylum seekers. So when you're working with people who may be able to leverage um, that kind of publicity, uh, thinking about, for example, ethnographies that are done uh, in this way, right, between anthropologists um, and documented migrants, but there's also a fear um, of being persecuted, right, by the state. Um, have, has anybody done work on this or what are some thoughts on this? Um, I think that's a, a very relevant tension that is kind of uh, uh, central to the considerations that I'm making moving forward, um, especially because I have personal ties to the community members and I ultimately you know want to um, center their narratives and um, their perspectives um, and so but sometimes uh, at, at least in the past I found uh, the the hesitancy remains because of the precarity of the situation and because the context is so fluid um, 
that people that that at least my interlocutors have been kind of hesitant about to what degree they want to own the production of knowledges that they are like actively involved in. Um, so I think, uh, I mean, I, I think that will just continue changing, especially because the context, it's now a situation of protracted displacement, people like their pendulum movement, like I, I don't know to what degree um, the interlocutors that I've spoken to would be willing to take a more forward facing ownership of the knowledges that they've co-created. That might be different in Dr. Lopez Oro's case with a community that has been here, as, as he said, since the 1950s, um, but I'm not sure he's able to, to hear us. Um, no, I hear you guys. Okay. No, it's a great, sorry about that. No, it's a, you know, I think a lot about this question, particularly because, yeah, so Garifuna folks have been in the States since the 1950s, but because of what's constantly happening in Central America, right, uh, the government corruption, the, you know, Central America is always this isthmus that's always in crisis. So there's this constant movement, right, of folks still coming. And I actually get called upon to do a lot of asylum cases, a lot of calls on asylum and providing some expertise on like the anti-Blackness of Central America. And I think what's really exciting to see that is that I made these asylum cases, you know, I turned to, to establish, you know, Garifuna organizations, which by the way, I think, you know, it's important to also know that one of the oldest kind of Black Central American political organizations like Organización Fraternal Negra de Honduras, or FRANE, which Miriam Miranda um, coordinates as a head of, is one of the oldest Black political organizations in Central America, right? It actually emerges around the same time that Marcus Garvey is in Limón, Costa Rica, uh, UNIA, right? So I think it's important to, to not only highlight that long, rich history, but to also highlight the fact that co-authorship and and working with interlocutors is really possible because of the work that they're doing, right? Of, because of the political activism and both the political and intellectual commitment that they have about making sure that Garifuna folks are at the forefront of that scholarship and in that, of that work. Um, particularly because I know that there's this ongoing concern in Garifuna communities of how um, mostly white, non-Black anthropologists have come into those spaces um, and have written books and then just kind of disappear, right? And that's something that's constantly talked about, constantly brought up um, because Garifuna folks are actually really, really one of the communities that are really well researched. Um, there's a lot of material out there on them, um, but it's mostly not by Garifuna folks, right? So that this is the kind of tricky part of all of this too, right? Is to also, you know, give space for Garifuna folks to have authorship on their own in that space. All right, thank you all for wonderful presentations and a great discussion afterwards. Um, hopefully, uh, you know, we can continue responding to each other and sort of engaging on these questions even beyond today's, today's meeting. I think with that, we have to um, wrap up for now. And um, I guess I'll hand it over to Kristen and uh, Kate. Thank you, everyone.
Good afternoon, everyone online and our audience here at the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs at Brown University. Second, I think there is. We're just having a quick, like, small problem. Hello? Yeah, I think it, it works now, right? Okay. Good afternoon again, everyone online and uh, everyone here at the Watson Institute for International Public Affairs, Affairs at Brown University. It is with immense pleasure that I welcome you this afternoon to this undergraduate panel entitled Migration Across Generations and Regions. This panel is part of the conference, Histories of Migration and Violence in Latin America and the Caribbean, organized by the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies, CLACS, here at Brown, as part of the Mellon Sawyer Seminar in collaboration with the Department of Africana Studies and the Center for Study of Slavery and Justice. My name is Erica Durante, and I am the Director of Undergraduate Studies for the Latin American and Caribbean Studies major. I'm joined by my co-moderator, Professor Lucila Nehamkis, COVID visiting professor here at Brown this academic year. It's our honor today to introduce four of our Brown undergraduate students and discuss their outstanding research with them and with you. Our panelists will explore different routes and experiences of migration across generations, multiple countries of the region, and Latinx migrant communities in the US. Guided by ethnographic research and activist work, these emerging scholars will combine insights from different fields of the social and life sciences and highlight issues of gender, race, inequality, violence, and public health. Our panel will be divided into two sections. Each student will present for 15 minutes. I will introduce our first speaker, Sofia Borges, and our second speaker, Ana Palomo, and we will have a quick, I mean, sorry, we'll have a 10 minute Q&A after the presentations. Professor Nehamkis will introduce Sami Plesia and Robbie Combs, who will discuss their papers during the second part of the panel following the same structure. If you're attending this event online, please feel free to post your question whenever you wish using the Q&A feature on Zoom. Well, if you are here in the room, you will have the opportunity to use the microphone to ask your questions. It is now my pleasure to introduce Sofia Borges. Sofia is a first year student at Brown University and is originally from Miami, Florida. Sofia's mother was born in El Salvador while her dad is half Cuban and half Colombian. Sofia will pursue her college education at Brown in international public affairs and Latin American and Caribbean studies. She's interested in public policy and equity work across minority communities. She worked with Brown Elementary After School Mentoring and the Every Vote Counts Coalition. Sofia. Sofia's presentation today is entitled Female Migrant Communities Across Generations, Roles and Regions. Hello everyone, um, as Erika said, my name is Sophia. I'm a first year here at Brown and I um, I'm a first year here at Brown uh, and I am very excited to present my project with you all. Um, please excuse me one second as I get this set up. Okay. So my project, as Erika mentioned, is entitled Female Migrant Communities Across Generations, Roles, and Regions. And my name is Sophia Borges. As a part of this project, um, my main goal was to discuss a largely female um, migrant community that I'm aware of as a case study for the event. And for the event, and I wanted to talk about the characteristics and um, responsibilities of individuals taking on distinct roles in this community and how important that is to sustaining um, said community. Uh, with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, so for the original context and objective of this project, it was an uh, audio-based archival project that was a final project 
for a class I took last semester with Erika. Um, it was a general class about Latin America that we explored through a, um, a literature, through literature as our lens into Latin America. And during that project, I interviewed migrants of very different identities from very different countries, very different regions. Um, I covered uh, the Caribbean, South America, and Central America with that project. And it was generally, the goal was um, to just document um, the stories of these migrants and share them and give them space at a university like Brown. I didn't really provide much context or an analysis. It was um, mainly just I served as a medium of getting their story to you all here at Brown. Um, for this project, I changed it so it could be more specific to um, some identities of migrants and uh, some re one specific region and one specific community of a different, a distinct role. Uh, specifically, I wanted to research the role of older sisters in female migrant communities. In this case, the case study was one of mostly female migrants, and I interviewed and looked directly into the lives and responsibilities of the eldest two eldest sisters in this community. The case study is one from El Salvador, uh, Central America, more specifically Chinameca, El Salvador, which is a part, um, it's pretty close to the capital. It's a small uh, community in um, El Salvador. And I was looking to see if there were any generational consistencies to the roles played by these older sisters, what that looks like, um, and, if they took and if they took on any roles that would be considered in a more Western lens of that of a parent. And I was looking for um, any changes or patterns in the roles they took on within this community over time as the generations um, continued and over regions as they moved locations. So. This is a documentation of the case study that I did originally. I, um, the first project, the, the first documentation I took on for this was to map out the family tree of this community. I wanted to see what that looked like. And the way I got to this was that I spoke to them and I asked them to document their own community. I asked, who do you consider as a part of your community? When you left El Salvador, when you left Chinameca, when you got to the States, who, did, who consisted of your community, who supported you throughout this process? And this is who they came up with. So um, there's Marta, who is the um, mother that I interviewed for this project, and Sedma, who is the daughter. Marta is the eldest of seven. She has, um, sorry, she has five sisters and one brother. She's the eldest, yes. And she had Sedma, who is the eldest of three. And I wanted to speak to them about that. Another important note that I want to make, if you look at the diagram, the only two men that they mentioned in their lives were, or in their community that they created, was Marta's father, who was a part of her community in Chinameca, but didn't come with them to the States, and Sedma's father, who also um, was a part of the community in Chinameca, but also did not come with them to the United States. So the community that I'm looking at here is largely female. It is almost entirely female when we look at it in the context of the United States and what that means. Um, I think that's a very important note um, to make that distinction, because I don't know if it can all be translated. So. The next step in documenting this family and this community was to document their um, movement from region, from country to different locations. So uh, Marta originated in, or she was born in Chile, and her migration, um, her migration began there. Uh, she began this project, she began moving her family at the age of 19. She had given birth to Sedma at 18. She um, flew, flew to Tijuana, Mexico, where she um, crossed the border illegally with the Coyote into Los Angeles and made it all the way to the United States, um, all the way to Manhattan, I'm sorry. And when she got to Manhattan, she then, for four years, she um, waited to receive documentation. And then she returned for her daughter um, in El Salvador, in Chinameca, after four years without her. Uh, I think, and then later on together, when uh, Sedma was about 15 years old, after migrating at four years old, they came to Miami. And I think there's uh, important things to note here. Number one, is that Sedma was left in the care of a female migrant community that already existed in China Meca de Salvador. Um, Marta had uh, five sisters, uh, two of whom were, all, were in China Meca at the time that she left, and that was who Marta was in the care of, for, or who Sedma was in the care of, I'm sorry, for those four years. Uh, I also want to make a quick note that the three places that Marta um, chose to live in the United States for periods of times are Los Angeles, Manhattan, and Miami. Uh, Manhattan, she lived in Washington Heights, and Miami, she lived in Hialeah, uh, both of all three of which have very large migrant, specifically Latino migrant communities. And um, it was sort of a matter of fitting into that already built structure that were very, re very much resembled the structures that exist in Latin America. Uh, she found a comfort in um, 
in that prospect to be able to raise her family around like-minded individuals from her own community. Uh, so the final and most uh, expansive step of this project was to conduct interviews with Serma and Marta. The intention was to learn their migration stories and to try and understand their role that they took on within their, fam fam for their family and their female migrant community. And the questions that I referenced in this project all spoke to their identity as an older sister. So the first question I asked were, um, what were your responsibilities? This is a very straightforward question that I wanted to hear their simple responses just to understand what they had to take on to keep their community going. Um, Marta explains that she says, mis responsabilidades eran mantener el negocio y cuidar a mis hermanas que fueran al colegio, al colegio que estuvieran peinadas y bien vestidas y eso era todo. She goes on to say that mi papá era el brazo derecho, mi, mi mamá y papá, pero yo era el brazo izquierdo. Uh, Sedma explains that um, her responsibility was to care for her youngest um, sister, who's named Gabby. She was eight years younger. Uh, she explains that she took care of her from birth and was almost her, like her child. Um, and Sedma also had to keep the house. So the large themes and patterns when we look at their responses is there's a, a reference to the importance of cleanliness and presentation and what that looks like. So in El Salvador, um, Marta had to make sure that her um, siblings had their hair brushed, that they were dressed well for school, and this pattern continued when she got to the United States. There's importance in presentation when you're building a sustainable community and when you're sending your kids um, out into this new space. Uh, the responsibilities they mentioned are lar would largely be considered that of a parent or adult. When we look at um, the Western world or the more, or the United States even, um, Marta had to take care of a family business and take care of her siblings, while um, Sedma just had to take care of the siblings at home. They use words like job or trabajo or responsibility um, and almost identify being an older sister as a job as much as it is an identity or a role in the family. Uh, they sort of reference it with the separation from, um, from just an identity of you as a member of this family to a, a position that you have responsibilities for. Um, and a, as a subset of that, there is a possessive nature over the way they speak about their siblings. This is my sister, this was my responsibility. She was my baby is a very common theme. Um, and there's a possessiveness and a pride over the way they turn out and what that looks like and how that reflects on them. And also similar to many parents, specifically mothers, these older sisters have a re do reduce the work that they did. So Marta goes on to say like, that was it. My only responsibility, I was 10 years old, I had to take care of family business and take care of five kids. Um, it's that was it. This was just what it was. And I think that's an important note that's very reminiscent of many mothers, specifically mothers in um, more uh, controlling situations where they don't have as much freedom as others. Uh, next, I asked Marta specifically, why were these your responsibilities? She says very simply, porque yo era la mayor, because I was the oldest. That's the only answer I got. Um, the, it was a question that was posed to her by her father at one point, like, ¿Quién va a cuidar las niñas si tú te vas a escuela? If, you, if I let you study who's going to take care of the girls, right? And I think there's an important note of the girls, where Marta was not one of the girls. She was almost a parental figure because she was the oldest. She also continues to say that, es una responsabilidad que me tocó a mí, pero no me arrepiento. It was a responsibility that just fell on her, that it was what it was, but she doesn't regret anything. Uh, Sedma continues that it was my job, it was given to me, and I just did it. I don't see it as wrong, it was necessary. She also continues that she does not resent it, and she says the only thing that she can say about her grandmother is that she was a hard worker. We are workers, right? And that was her sort of reference to older sisters or women in this migrant community, in this largely female migrant community, that their identity is, um, it's almost work to maintain this identity, to maintain this community, and work is their or worker is the main identifying voice or main identifying term they can use to describe themselves. So when we, anal when we look for patterns, uh, the reason we get is because. Because I was the oldest, because it fell on me, because it was what it was. And with that, we understand that there's a generational and unspoken consistency to this term, right? So there's an understanding that the role that migrant women or in migrant older sisters have to take on. There's no speaking of it. It just falls on people, and someone has to do what has to be done. Um, there's an understanding that the role is generational. There's no explicit mention or explanation. Marta never told Sedma, you have to take care of this baby. It was that, well, I'm working all day and all night, and you, the baby's there, so you have to take care of the baby. There's no explicit mention. And both of them made it very clear, this wasn't a part of the question, 
they both wanted me to make it very clear that there's no resentment or regret for what they did. They are proud of what they did for their family. They understand that it is a necessary role that they had to take on. And it made it clear that everyone did what they had to do for this to continue, for this community to sustain itself. It was very necessary that someone picks up the slack, right? So if both parents are working, if there's only one parent, someone has to do the work if you have multiple children. Um, and both of them made that very clear in their responses. Um, so actually, this was an autoethnographic project. I am a part of this community. Uh, Sedma is my mother, Martha is my grandmother, and I am the oldest of two uh, in a largely female migrant community, a community that sustains itself for generations. And so when I conducted this research, it was important to me to understand what they perceived my role to be, how they perceived this role changing generationally, and to acknowledge their voices when they speak. So here's what they said. Marta explains that ser inmigrante no es nada fácil, ser hermana mayor no es nada fácil, pero he disfrutado la vida, he disfrutado mi familia, mis hijas y mis nietos. She continues, this is her saying that the responsibility she took on and the role she took on was one that she enjoyed in the end of her life, and she has no regret for it. Um, Marta makes it very clear that no somos dependemos, no dependemos de nadie, de ningún hombre. Um, when I asked her about my role and what their similarities were, is that my mother, my grandmother, and I are not meant to depend on any man to take care of our families or to sustain this community. We are meant to be able to take care of our siblings on our own, and I am expected to do the same. My mother was very clear and a very blunt individual. She says, you as an older sister have some responsibility over your little sister. She has your job, and you have less responsibility than I did and than Marta did, but it's still your responsibility. And with that, it brings us to the very important point that um, ex there's expected separation from each older sister in this largely female migrant community, that there's a separation between the relationship between a sibling and a parent, and the older sibling is meant to walk the line closer to either sibling or parent, depending on the day, depending on the moment, depending on the generation, location, and anything. There's an emphasis on the independence. I am meant to be independent of my parents if need be. I'm meant to be independent of every man, of any situation that can maybe hinder this family or keep it from sustaining itself that it has done for many generations of migration. Over location, over places, this is a meant, and independence is an important factor in that. Um, there's an emphasis on presentation. Regardless of generation, I am expected to present a certain way in certain spaces. My mother raised me to dress a certain way. I was, grew up dressing my sister a certain way to go certain places, and my grandmother did the same thing. When you're um, occupying a new space, a space where maybe you don't feel entirely welcome, a way of showing respect to both yourself and to others and to maybe gain some more um, acceptance is to present yourself in a way that is respectable. And again, being an older sister is work. It is a job as much as it is an identity, as much as it is a relationship, it is work. And it is work for me. And as closing thoughts, there's a general silence around the migra migratory experience, specifically about the roles taken on by these older sisters. No, there's never an explicit mention to this responsibility, what that impact was. It's almost like asking a mother why she takes care of her siblings, why does the older sister do the same thing. It's a, it's a generationally understood role. Um, and the role that's needed to sustain these migrant communities. When you're coming to a new space and there's a lack of opportunity and a lack of space to take care of these children, someone has to again pick up the slack and do what has to be done. Uh, the expectation is that it stays the same across generation and location, and the expectations maintain the same responsibilities change with the opportunities provided. So the reason I'm not taking care of my sister the way my parents did is because my parents granted me the opportunity to go to a school, and they had the, they had the ability to care for me and my sister on their own. They didn't need my help. But there's an expectation and understanding that if the situation were to present itself, that is still my responsibility. So... That's all I have. I will grant the rest of my time to the rest of my panelists. Thank you all so much for listening. Thanks so much, Sophia, for this uh, initial presentation. Um, I am now delighted to introduce our second panelist, Ariana Palomo. Uh, you will see that their research lines are relatively uh, similar. Ariana is a first-year student at Brown, uh, pursuing a concentration in international and public affairs and studying Portuguese. She was born in Chihuahua, Mexico, and immigrated to the United States with her parents and sister. The communities she's a part of and her identity as a Latina immigrant have influenced the issues she's passionate about, 
studying and advocating for. Ariana has a strong dedication to immigrant rights and criminal justice reform and prioritizes centering the experiences and voices of marginalized communities in this work. She serves as a program leader and mentor for the National Hispanic Institute and associate editor for the Brown Journal of World Affairs and is involved with the Brown ACLU Incarcerated Rights Campaign. Ariana's presentation today is entitled The Disparities in the Immigrant Experience Through and Within Generations. not being shared. Um, how do I share it? Put it in. Okay, okay, gotcha. Okay. Yeah, there we go. Hi everyone, my name is Ariana Palomo. Um, I was born in Chihuahua, Mexico, and I immigrated here with my family when I was three years old. Um, and so the issue of this immigrant identity has always been very, very important to me. And so what I will be talking about today is very personal, and I really look forward to sharing this with you. There are numerous factors that influence the significant change that comes from one generation to the other. And these disparities are greatly influenced um, and exacerbated when you put in this immigrant identity. Now, I was given the opportunity to explore the influence of an immigrant identity in Professor Nahamki's Latin American Caribbean Studies course this past semester, for which I interviewed four different women of different generations. Um, two of the women are mother and daughter, and apart from them, they all came from different countries, speak different languages, and they all have this different journey of growth that they have come to. Whether that growth be you know, self-imposed, forced onto them, or that they decided to do that on their own. So the first individual that I interviewed is Evelyn Hudehart. So Evelyn Hudehart um, immigrated to the United States in 1959 from China, and she is now a professor of American studies and history here at Brown University. Now language is one of the most significant factors that influences these generational disparities in immigrant families. And for Hugh Hart's family, it influenced her relationship with her parents, with her kids after some time to come. And this influence of, of language is present from generation to generation. After arriving in the United States, uh, Professor Hugh Hart's parents had to find a job as many immigrant parents have to do. And now when you are in the position of being an immigrant and have a language barrier and not speaking English, you find yourself in a position in which you're accepting any work that you can. And oftentimes, service work is what people can take because it doesn't require them to know the English language. And so Huda Hart's parents went from being college-educated individuals to now working service jobs. It is a transformative change in lifestyle that immigrant parents often undergo due to this presence of this language barrier. And we refer to this as the immigrant sacrifice. Now, the immigrant sacrifice is not a foreign concept. There's a high level of importance that should be placed on analyzing individual, familial, and societal pressure that is placed on children of immigrants to live up to the sacrifice that their parents made when coming to the United States. And Huda Hart to this raised a question regarding this impact. How do we feel watching our parents working so hard at such menial jobs? And as she got older, she understood the extent of her parents' sacrifice. She understood that her parents chose to come to the United States and live their dreams through their children. And a big part of this was living these dreams through their children's education. And we call this relationship reciprocity. Children work as hard as they can as a way to thank their parents for this sacrifice. And parents feel satisfaction once their children are able to succeed. And as we look forward into the next generation, for Hugh to heart, the influence of language is still very, very significant. So language was really important in connecting Professor Hugh to heart with her family. But when asked whether she passed Chinese down to her children, she said that it was very difficult to do so and that she was not able to. And expressing this 
significant increasing difficulty in passing down the language shows this loss that occurs from generation, generation to generation in immigrant communities. And so the reason is that, unfortunately, Huda Hart's grandma, um, Huda Hart's mother, who is her children's grandmother, passed away too soon. And so their kids didn't have to experience this concept of having to learn a language in order to do the mere act of communicating with a family member. So the American dream is something that represents opportunity for many individuals coming to the United States. And Huda Hart is an accomplished individual to say the least. And she believes that she has attained this American dream. She believes that there's a trade-off that you have to give in in order to achieve it. And this trade-off is that you have to become Americanized. And to this, she says, you do have to learn English and you have to learn it well. It is a language of power and of the system, but you don't have to give up what you bring with you. And she has done exactly that. She has kept her native language, which is Chinese, and added Spanish, German, French, and Portuguese. To which she poses the question, how can anyone say that I am any less capable than an American who only speaks English? You become American in addition to your heritage. Now, the next women that I interviewed are Karen Dangot and Camila Dangot. Um, Karen Dangot is an immigrant from Sao Paulo, Brazil, and she is Camila's mother. And so both women immigrated to New York, and Camila Dangot is actually an undergraduate student here at Brown University, and Karen Dangot is a professional artist. Now, their family immigrated to the United States from Brazil, and similar to Hugh Hart's family, language played a very significant role in this influence on, on the immigrant identity in their family. And so everyone in the Dangot family is proficient in English. However, the only language that is spoken at home is Portuguese. And Karen Dengot, the mother, expresses that when they came here, her and her husband wanted to educate their children in a language that they understood. And part of this education consisted of ensuring that their kids continue to have this connection and these ties to their Brazil culture and to their family. And for Camila, the influence of speaking Portuguese at home was a little bit different. She identifies her home as fully Brazilian and says that she associates this um, identity of her home um, as part of the fact that they only speak Portuguese at home, citing the fact that even when she's communicating with her 16-year-old younger brother, it's always, always just in Portuguese. Now, both women reflected the fact that their immigrant identities caused them to have this, this struggle with their own sense of identity. And so Camila shared that she has this fear of assimilating into the United States, a fear of losing her connection to Brazil, her connection to her family, and her connection to her culture. And she attributes this to the fact that she sees how much her parents value this connection that they have to their home country. And Karen believes that her family will never be American. But however, she does still feel that she is an immigrant when she is going back to Brazil. And so she's stuck in this idea of knowing that her soul is still Brazilian, but feeling as though she does not belong in neither the United States or in Brazil. She believes that the biggest generational disparity that exists in her family is that her kids view Brazil as going on vacation and visiting family while she views it as going, home, as going back home. And her kids will always come back to the United States because this is where their lives are. Now the definition, our belief and our interpretation of the American dream shifts from generation to generation. Karen used to believe in the American dream, but she no longer does. I came here with this very strong ideal, but I think that it is more complicated than just working hard. Now working hard is a narrative that can be pushed as a how to in attaining the American dream that is often viewed in many migrant communities. She believes in the American dream for her children though. I believe in it for their generation, but I don't believe in the American dream for me. And this is a sentiment that is shared amongst many older generations, parents to younger generations, their kids. Parents are seen to come to the United States to live off the American dream, not necessarily for themselves, but for their children. The third, uh, the fourth and final individual that I interviewed is Livia Palomo. 
Livia Palomo immigrated to the United States in 2005 from Chihuahua, Mexico, and she is now a senior tax analyst at McKesson and holds the very special position of being my sister. Um, <laughs> so um, the difference that is created from generation to generation is as we have seen exacerbated through this immigrant identity. However, this difference are, runs so deep in these immigrant communities that in this case, you will see that it falls in and bleeds through into just one generation. And that is the generation of my sister and I. He said, we are the same generation. We both migrated here at the same time and grew up under the same household for over a decade. Yet our experiences growing up have been very, very, very different. Livia reflected on the fact that the role of sustaining the household fell on her and that she had the responsibility to make pivotal decisions with no guidance that wouldn't just affect her, but our entire family. It is something that occurs to what I would like to refer to just immigrant older sisters. I wouldn't even go as far as saying um, older siblings, but older sisters always end up having that responsibility. And so our parents don't speak English, and that has been very significant in my immigrant journey. So it was important that I asked her how that influenced her. Um, and the first thing that she told me was that she had to be the one to learn English and she had to do it fast. She believes that it took many opportunities from her because if your parents don't speak English, then there are many things that they're not going to know, especially considering the fact that you're growing up in, in a foreign country, that you're growing up in different countries and that they don't experience the same things that they would have um, in their own country. And so we call this this margin of learning that, that is created because you have to teach things to yourself. And so there are many things that we are supposed to learn from our parents, but under an immigrant identity, these roles are reversed and instead you have to learn them in order to teach them. And so when I asked um, Livia about language, we also spoke about the loss in translation. And the loss in translation is often linked to language. However, um, well, language is a form through which there's an inability to translate certain things. Um, disparities within generations are also this loss in, in translation because you can't translate one aspect of your life from your generation to possibly your parents or even to your kids. So it's especially a difficult action when taking into account how growing up in different countries just widens this gap between you. And so there's not just a loss in translation from English to Spanish or Spanish to English, but from experience to experience. There are many things that are not only a loss of translation in language, but they are part of culture. They're a part of your lifestyle, how you grow up, the everyday experiences that you have. And you simply cannot explain that to someone who hasn't lived it because it's lived experiences. And so when I asked Livia about the idea of this immigrant sacrifice, she said that she didn't believe that it was about living up to a sacrifice that your parents had taken. Um, she said that you should make everything that happened worthwhile and that you can't do anything less than that. And that if there was a sacrifice or difficult experience to not let that go in vain. And she said that you're not going to come to another country to do the same or less than what you would have done in your own country. And so as I began this project, it was about the way that this immigrant identity exacerbates these differences from generation to generation. And while that does remain true, I want to conclude by shedding light on the beauty that an immigrant identity holds. This identity is so powerful that it is able to unite women from different countries who came to the United States for different reasons. They speak different languages and have different roles within their community, all going through different journeys. Because even with such different experiences across each story, we saw women believing in the American dream for their children, even if it meant giving it up for themselves. We saw children experiencing an internal and external battle of what they had to do in order to live up to what their parents did to come here, to live up to that sacrifice that they made. And we saw the deep impacts that language had across every single individual and intersection, intersecting relationship that was present. And even while these gaps are widening and widening, and we feel ourselves distancing from our family members, this migrant identity that we hold has the ability to bring us all together as we share this experience of having these disparities that be so influential in our lives.
And for that moment in which we are realizing that these similarities and similarities in these decisions that are made by people across different generations, time periods, nationalities, we are able to bridge that gap. So I wanna thank everybody for being here. Um, and especially I wanna thank the migrant woman who allowed me to interview them because this would not have been possible without them. One of them is in the audience, this is Gambila. Um, so thank you so much. And thank you, Erika and Lucila for everything. Thank you so much, Sophia and Mariana, for the very moving um, presentations. Um, I think it's very clear to everyone that um, these are oh, sorry, I'm very, these are first year students, and they're really sharing very um, deep stories. I'm, I'm really sorry, I was not supposed to react in this way. And I will quickly go to the questions. Um, every time that I hear these stories, every time the reaction is very, very difficult. Um, so I don't know if there are uh, questions already in the audience, or maybe I can just uh, start with someone, some questions. Yeah, Karina. Um, we've, uh, we have the chance to have here today um, the writer and journalist Karina Sainz Borgo from Venezuela. So she will be the first asking question. Thanks, Karina. Thanks to you. Well, Sophia, Ariana, it was absolutely, uh, it touched me so much, your explanation, because you're trying to explain in a rational way something that has to do with feelings in a way. And <clears throat> I have the same question for you both. Uh, when I first for Sophia, when I saw your the family tree, uh, I, I started taking pictures of the of the because there's only women. That doesn't mean you have a father. Of course, you need a grandfather and a father. But the, the main the, the main narrative it belongs to women. And you said, uh, what do you expect from me uh, as a as a sister? As a that's. I want you to ask me that, and I want to ask Ariana in the same way. You're only, and you're always talking about mothers and daughters, mothers and daughters. So <clears throat> I really need you, uh, an exp I want to, to listen from you. It Obviously, it's part of the facts, but you you made a, a decision. You took a choice to, to those narratives. I would love to listen to you both explain me about that. Um, oh, oh, I don't have to push it. Um, that's an, a great question, and thank you so much for asking it. I um, have always taken a lot of pride uh, being from a largely woman migrant community. We often joke in my family that they we just don't have boys. Um, my great-grandmother had uh, seven children and only one son. My grandmother had three daughters, and she just recently had her first uh, grandson, and it is his, she, he is his, her eighth. So when it came to do this, when, it, when I began time to do this project, I, it didn't even phase me that I didn't focus on the femininity of this community, of the importance of the women in this community, because I always grew up around that. When I'm asked about my, um, about the way it impacts me presently, it's that I've, um, always been taught from a young age the importance of independence, um, independence from men. Um, as I referenced in my project, there's an emphasis placed on that this community has sustained itself with women for four generations now, and I'm expected to do the same. And I think that gave me a lot of um, confidence, uh, responsibility, but confidence as a child. Um, and it's, it's um, especially important to my identity as a student at Brown here, what that looks like. Similar to Sophia, um, I, I honestly, I was thinking about it, and at no point did I ever consider interviewing a man for, for this. And even when I think about the immigrant experience, I always think about it um, through women and through this feminine gaze of such an, an important identity that we all hold. Um, my grandma had nine kids and one son. So, <laughs> um, yeah, it, it's... I do also come from a family that is largely filled by women, but
But I don't think that that changes so much because I think even if it was filled with men, the woman would be the one to, to always lead. And I see that in other immigrant communities that, you know, I mentioned that um, I have this, this big, I'm a big fan of any immigrant older sister because I think that they have, like they know how to do everything because they have been forced to have to learn how to do everything. I'm gonna have this huge admiration for them beginning with my sister because th they're put in this role of completely taking over the household. Um, and so even in families that when, when there is an older son, they don't have that role. This idea to take care of your family, to care for, for your family and, and to do what they can't do, especially in a country where you may not, your parents may not speak the language, falls on women. Um, and so when I, I associate the immigrant experience with the ability for, for women to just take on any challenge that is placed on them, and I honestly always will. Thank you for your question. Thanks so much, Karina, for emphasizing this in importance of the gender and uh, of these uh, female migrant communities. Um, across generations, not only the grandmother, the mother, the sister, and now uh, you guys, I mean, you are really continuing uh, this, uh, this um, um, pattern of responsibilities uh, in a different way, but you still are. I have a question about this, in fact, but I would like to know if there are questions online, maybe, um, or here among the audience, please. You have a question? This is maybe less of a question and more of a comment, but just to begin to just tell you how powerful and compelling your presentations were, and I hope you are incredibly pleased with yourselves because we are really blown away. The comment I had, maybe to consider for future research, um, particularly I was thinking for Sophia, but maybe also for Ariana, is to do some comparison between the because a lot of what you described about sisters the because a lot of what you described about sisters taking over and and caring for the families and elder sisters struck me as also relevant in impoverished communities that are not immigrants so i think of you know in during the irish potato famine there were lots big families parents out working the whole time and elder siblings particularly elder sisters caring for the families. I do think that's a different experience, but it would be interesting if you were to continue this research to maybe contrast with impoverished families that are not migrants and see how that plays a role in their experiences. I think Ariana's research perhaps sheds a lot of light on that because not only are these elder sisters taking care of the family, but they're also making decisions and functioning in the outside world as parents when, in a one location that might not happen so much, but I do think that would be um, fruitful future research. Thank you so much. I, I, I'd like to continue doing this research and I definitely like to um, make it more global, I guess is a good term for it. Yeah, no, thank you. I really appreciate it. I think that, uh, that's something that we could definitely take into consideration for future research. And as she speaks about global, we could also definitely explore different migrations, just not just in Latin America. Well, okay, I think that we can now move to the second uh, section of the panel. So, Professor Neham, please. Hi, thanks a lot, Erika, and thanks, Sofia and Ariana, for the brilliant presentation. It's now my honor to introduce the speaker of the second half of the panel. Brown senior student, Sami Plesia and Robbie Combs. Sami Plesia is a senior from Middleton, Rhode Island, studying public health and Hispanic studies. Sami worked as, as a research assistant at Brown Center for Health Promotion and Health Equity, volunteer of a medical interpreter of the Rhode Island Free Clinic and recently intern with Project Hope's humanitarian aid team in Colombia. Her honor thesis explored the impact of migration 
on Latin America immigrant women's eating habits and beauty's ideal. After Brown, she will be attending a psychology PhD program and working toward developing cultural and informed mental health intervention for individuals from minorized population. Some in presentation today is entitled, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's difficult <laughs> to me, if we don't eat our cultural food, does that mean we're less Latina? A qualitative investigation among Latin American immigrant women in the US. I will share my screen if that works for everybody. Oops, I apologize. Would I be able to have potential assistance? Whenever I pull it up, I just see. Is this working? Should be good. Yep. Okay, thank you all. All right, so as Lucila kindly mentioned, my name is Sammy. I am a senior here at Brown studying public health and Hispanic studies. And thank you all for being here today, whether it be in person or remotely via Zoom. The title of my honors thesis, as Lucila said, is if we don't eat our cultural foods, does that mean we're less Latina? A qualitative investigation among Latin American immigrant women in the US. And before we get into the presentation, I wanted to share a bit about what led me to um, start this project. If I can move the slide. Do it again. It seems like it may have just frozen. That is me right there. Oh, I think that might be our problem. Got it. I'll give it a go again. Okay. All right. So, getting back to what led me to this project, and that actually starts in 2018 in Mexico City. I was fortunate to volunteer with a nonprofit organization called El Pozo de Vida, and they run several different programs and services for survivors of trafficking, primarily from Central America. Um, so they have a safe house, they have a baking program to provide alternatives to engaging in sex work if individuals were interested in that. Um, and where I spent most of my time was co-facilitating group therapy sessions with survivors of trafficking. And what really caught my attention is the women were disclosing these really heavy topics related to gender-based violence and receiving threats from male clients. And alongside those, they disclosed experiencing body dissatisfaction because in the Mexico City economy for sex work, women that were living in larger bodies and had darker skin colors were compensated less than their colleagues. Um, with that idea in mind, I became really interested in this topic of body image and that moved on over to eating behaviors. So you'll see at the end of the slide is where I work now at Rhode Island Free Clinic. It's a volunteer run clinic that serves individuals here in Providence that do not have health insurance and that are living below the federal poverty level. So most of our patients are Spanish speaking Central American migrants and immigrants, and I primarily do nutrition interpreting. So I've been able to have an active role in these clinical interactions discussing eating habits among immigrant populations. Knowing that I wanted to explore those more, I developed the research questions for my honors thesis. And the first being focusing on women's relationships with food. So we see in the literature, we know there are changes in diet. We know there's an increase in processed foods. There's a decrease in access to fresh produce. But I really wanted to get into, well, how do women feel about that? What are their relationships with what they're eating opposed to exclusively what are they eating? My second question was exploring body image and beauty ideals and looking into how migration might have impacted um, their conceptualizations of beauty. And this third question is getting at what I've always wanted to ask patients at the clinic is, how has this experience been for you? What was successful? What are areas for growth in the clinical interaction? So with those questions in mind, I took several steps. 
The first is I was fortunate to partner with my two incredible faculty advisors, Dr. Kalani Olson, a clinical psychologist, and Dr. Jennifer Nazareno, a medical sociologist. And we also um, found a cultural consultant to work with. I am not Latina, neither of my advisors are Latina, and it was really, really important for us to have someone on the study team who could bring that expertise in Latina migrant health in um, and provide feedback on our study materials, analysts, and all analysis, all of that. I also earned a research grant because it was really in me to be able to compensate women for their time for sharing their stories with me. So every single person that was interviewed for this project received a $20 gift card afterwards. I recruited participants from all different sources. My goal was to have as diverse of a group as possible, considering it was all done virtually. Um, and I was able to use all of the research grant. I conducted 20 interviews last semester. And at the start of this semester, I finished data analysis. And I used something that's called template style thematic analysis. So what that is, essentially, in non-public health research terms, is I used inductive codes. So all of the themes that I'll be presenting to you today came directly from the participants' words that they shared. So my goal was really to just display and analyze their stories in the most authentic way possible. A little bit about the 20 participants who I want to take a moment to thank because this project would not be here without their generosity to share their stories with me. Their average age was about 32 years old, and they had been in the US for very varying lengths of time. So as short of an amount of time as three months to as long as 35 years, with an average of about 13 and a half years. They primarily came from Colombia and Mexico, um, and they lived all over the US. Um, half the participants lived in New York, but I do want to note that four different towns and cities in New York were represented among those 10, so it wasn't uh, everyone in the same area. Then transitioning onto my themes and figuring out, going back to that core question is, did immigration impact women's relationships with foods? And I found that the answer was yes. It specifically changed cultural and emotional roles. Um, the first sub-theme I wanted to highlight was food's power to evoke feelings of comfort and nostalgia. Um, so this first participant here in the first quote is a 30-year-old Guatemalan participant who is living in Rhode Island. And she was discussing about since migrating to the U.S., she's developed a palate for all different kinds of food, and she'll eat anything, she'll enjoy anything, but nothing she enjoys more than Hispanic dishes, specifically the foods that her mom used to make. And it gives her a feeling of nostalgia. It's more like a comfort food. And the same exact sentiment is echoed by a 37-year-old Mexican participant who's living in Texas saying eating picadillo brings her back to her mom or her grandmother's cooking. And even if she makes it herself, it still doesn't have the same impact because it's not her family's cooking. Another change was food really taking on a larger role as a stressor in participants' lives. So this first quote here from a Peruvian participant in New York is referring to her time as a master's student in the US. And there were not resources for her. She wasn't able to access um, a lot of the things that some of her other students were able to. And so there are times where she could not eat. And that obviously led to experiencing a lot of physical stress as well as mental and emotional. And what we also saw is the alternative of that is having an abundance of food access was also a source of stress. So this participant, a 26-year-old Colombian participant in New York, was explaining that in Colombia, there's one really large dairy brand. And when she goes to the store, she has maybe two or three options to pick from. She knows what she wants. It's a simple experience. She moved to New York, and then it's multiple brands with multiple products under each brand. And it was a lot to figure out, OK, well, which one of these products is going to meet my needs? Um, so that process, specifically for her husband, was really stressful. And I think putting these two quotes next to each other shows the complexity of when we're discussing eating habits, there are all these other factors that are influencing what people are deciding to eat. It's not always as simple as uh, just, oh, people are eating this for its nutritional value. So we saw that there are all these changes that occurred. And then what I also saw was Latin American immigrant women pushing back against them to reclaim aspects of their sociocultural identities. And one of the large ones was pushing against the commodification of food and really rooting their value in food in its power to bring people together. Um, so in this culture in the US of it was described as a pressure cooker by one of the participants of just such an emphasis on convenience, on having everything fast, having it now, 
that took away what was something that was once really important to them, which is having meals with their families, and particularly participants that migrated here with exclusively their partner or their nuclear um, families. It was really important for them to carve out that time so they could spend it together. Um, so both of these quotes are referring to that. And I do want to note, sometimes participants were forced to assimilate more times than not. So a lot of participants enjoyed having, in their countries of origin, a large meal at 3 p.m., for example. And due to school schedules, work schedules, all these other factors, that wasn't possible. So they had to adapt and then move it to a time like 6 p.m. Um, so find that compromise to do that. And then something else that goes back to the title of this presentation, if I don't eat my cultural foods, am I Latina enough, is participants had to relearn their relationships with their cultural foods. Because due to this culture and issues surrounding access to ingredients, time to commit to making complex dishes, participants didn't find themselves cooking um, cultural foods as often as they'd like. And they really grappled with that question of, well, if I'm not having mole sauce, for example, am I less Mexican? Um, and what participants figured out through conversations with friends, with family, through a process of unlearning and analyzing all that, is it, no, it doesn't. It's you can show your appreciation for your cultural identity in other ways. This first participant, a 33-year-old Mexican participant living in California, went on to talk about how she'll buy store-bought salsa. And for a while, that brought her shame. And now she said, that's what works for me in my lifestyle. I'm going to continue doing it. And then we see this participant, the 20-year-old Mexican participant who's living in Rhode Island, was talking about growing up watching movies in the US. And rarely was there Mexican food featured in it. And if Mexican food was featured, it was an appropriated version of it. So she was never taught to desire it. So she had to unlearn everything that the media had taught her to realize that she does, uh, it says right here, I began to acknowledge that and appreciate it. So through this continuous process of learning and unlearning, participants were able to reclaim that aspect of their identity and find an appreciation for their cultural foods that works with their lifestyles. And now transitioning onto the themes of beauty ideals, something that came up was existing in between this Eurocentric ideal here in the US and then the Latina beauty standard. And I want to note specifically with the Latina beauty standard, there is so much diversity in Latin America and among Latin American communities. So this was kind of a compilation of what participants reported, while of course acknowledging that's going to look different everywhere. So when thinking of this traditional Eurocentric ideal in the US, it's tall, thin, blonde, white, blue eyes. And then the Latina beauty standard takes a more curvy ideal is what it's been labeled. So larger chest, um, smaller waist and hips, larger rear, um, tanned skin, but not too dark. And so what happened is when immigrant women came here, particularly as adolescents, and if they were at predominantly white institutions at any level in their schooling career, they were surrounded by students who didn't look like them. And then the media, they had this quote unquote ideal Latina woman where that physique is not attainable naturally for most women. And then they were put in this situation that the Guatemalan participant says can create a lot of anxiety, a lot of probabilities for depression, even body dysmorphia. And so what we know in the literature is that feeling as if one cannot obtain one beauty ideal results in a lot of hardship. And then in the case of Latin American immigrant women, my participants at least that um, were kind enough to share their stories, is then they had the hardships of not fitting either ideal, which exacerbated some of these symptoms. And then the last theme I'm going to present today is really getting at my question that I've, like I said, I've always wanted to ask patients. I will note, I did not interview any patients from the clinic, so they're not referring to any of our nutritionists. Um, except what I found is that the healthcare offerings right now for nutrition are not meeting Latin American immigrant women's needs. Um, it's specifically because they're failing to consider patients' cultural backgrounds. So this Dominican participant has traveled all over trying to find a nutritionist that works for her. And then she'll go in and she'll get a standard list of ingredients that that nutritionist gives to every single patient, regardless of their cultural identities. There isn't conversation about what foods the patient, in this case, the participant is eating. And this participant was later labeled as non-compliant by the provider because they didn't adhere to the list, the recommendations 
of culturally irrelevant foods. And so this participant is saying, I'm asking you to tell me about the foods that I eat. And they, the nutritionist, has no idea. Whereas they're telling me to eat foods that I don't eat. So here they are putting in the energy, putting in the resources to receive help, and the system is failing them. And what we also see goes back to my first research question is that there aren't discussions on the cultural and emotional roles of food. So it says they don't understand the nostalgia that goes along with it. A nutritionist made a recommendation to a Guatemalan participant to have half the amount of tortillas, but there was no conversation about what role that tortilla has aside from its nutritional components. There was such a focus on calories, protein, fat, carbs, all of that, but it wasn't how do you feel when you're eating this? Why are you eating this? There was no conversation in that regard. So this brings me to what I'd like to call next steps because I truly believe this project is the first of many of how I hope to spend my career um, continuing this work. So I think a great way to do that would be conducting focus groups to get at the specifics of what would Latin American immigrant women like in interventions that are going to promote healthy eating in a culturally relevant and accessible way. And I want to be clear, when I say healthy eating, I'm referring to healthy eating in every single sense. So it's fueling one's body, one's soul, one's mind, it's fitting into their lifestyles, all these different factors aside from just the nutritional components of food. And from that information, I'd love to develop trainings for nutritionists and other healthcare providers on ways they can better integrate culture, nutrition, and public health into appointments. So culture being all these things we discussed today, including culturally relevant beauty ideals, including the culture surrounding times of day that people are eating, the culture surrounding social events and what's acceptable to eat there, not eat there. Nutrition in the textbook definition of the actual nutritional components of food, and then public health, and if you're giving an individual a list of recommendations and they're experiencing food insecurity or they are so overwhelmed by an abundance of options in the store that's making it difficult to find what they want to eat, there are going to be barriers to engaging in these treatment recommendations. On that note, I have a few thank yous that I'll leave up here for a moment, um, specifically again to all of the participants as well as the research at Brown Grant for funding my thesis. And thank you all for listening. Uh, thanks so much, Sami, for your presentation, and now I'd like to present Robbie. Robbie Combs is Senior Concentrating in International and Public Affairs and Hispanic Studies. Robbie has worked at an immigration law firm for the past four years, working almost exclusively with Latin clientele. Robbie current research center of state response to organized criminal violence the usage of nature as an obstruction tactic to prevent migration, and the impact of migration on the home communities which asylum seekers have left behind. Although Robbie studied migration across all duration, his particular interest is Central America. Robbie's presentation is entitled today, Ruth Causes of migration, guns, violence, and the political politic of negotiation. First of all, thank you very much for uh, for that lovely introduction, Professor Nahamkis. And now I will attempt to at least. Oh boy. Stop the What's that? You can stop sharing too. I can't find the mouse. Oh. <laughs> you can tell I'm very technically um, advanced here. Okay, there we go. Step one. Okay. I believe so. Let's see. Is it done? Oh, good. Okay. Can it move? The slides don't change. Oh, there we go. All right. Oh, I can't go back now. Oh, there. Okay. I've lost my notes, but that's all right. We're good. Uh, anyway, I just wanted to, to thank Professor Nehemkis and Professor Durante for inviting me uh, to speak here today. It's, it's very much a privilege to be able to speak to you all, and thank you all for coming out. This is, it's, I, I 
uh, wondered if I would be speaking to an empty room, so it's very nice to see to see all of your faces. And I also wanted to just say it's a very it's it's a privilege of mine to to share the floor with such amazing panelists. Uh, I was really inspired hearing your stories as well, and 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 to be here as uh, uh, you know, I certainly don't feel like I should uh, share the floor as a you know an American researcher who doesn't hasn't share, uh, shared in any of those experiences. So. Um, so as, as Professor Nehampia said, my name is Robbie Combs. I'm studying International Public Affairs uh, and Hispanic Studies. Um, and the, the reason I'm here today is because of my work at uh, an immigration law firm where I've worked for the past four years. And so over the time I've worked there, I've spent uh, hours and hours uh, speaking to hundreds uh, of clients about their experiences uh, of migration uh, mostly, and, and most of our clients, uh, they're predominantly from Central America. Uh, so uh, I've, I've heard a lot about their experiences with gang violence, with gender-based violence. Uh, and so my uh, presentation today will really be focusing on, on gang violence and, and a few uh, responses and some thoughts that I've had uh, over the, the years uh, uh, speaking to these, uh, these clients. And so first, I'd like to turn to talk a little bit about the current political climate uh, and about the current Biden administration plan. So the Biden administration has a plan to, the term they use is STEM migration. And obviously, that implies that migration is a problem that needs to be solved. That's not necessarily something I agree with, but that's a moral issue that we're, we're going to set to the side for the purposes of this presentation. Um, so the roots-based, uh, they're employing what they term a root causes strategy. Uh, and a root causes strategy is a good idea. because It's shifting the focus onto the countries of origin and onto solving a lot of the problems that lead people to migrate in the first place. And you can see here that they've outlined some strategies that they believe will, will help this. And so uh, I've, I've, high, I've, I've bolded the last two because those these two, which are gang violence and gender-based violence and, and domestic violence, are the two reasons that are most often cited to me uh, when I'm speaking uh, with my clients. So, But my, my uh, presentation will focus mostly on gang violence. But I think we have to interrogate this idea of root causes a little bit, because root causes implies that these sort of, uh, I, uh, the, the, the situation in these countries, in El Salvador, for example, exists in isolation. And it doesn't explore how we got to this place. So I think the right question to ask is, what are the root causes of the root causes, right? So I think uh, in order to, we have to uh, take a little bit of a historical perspective in order to answer this question. And so for, uh, unfortunately, Central America throughout its history has very much been defined by its proximity to the United States. And that is not a good thing. Uh, uh, starting uh, in 1823 with the Monroe Doctrine, the United States really established a sphere of influence throughout all of Latin America. This continued with documents like the Roosevelt Corollary and, and uh, a bunch of other policies that I don't really want to, to get into. But the, the really important point uh, is starting in the history uh, in the 20th century with the development of US commercial interests in, in Central America. And when I'm speaking about US co commercial interests, I'm referring to the United Fruit Company and other fruit company uh, and other uh, companies in the region. And this gave the United States a pretext to justify intervention in Latin America. And this is something that they did time after time after time, overthrowing uh, different governments uh, at will, basically, in order to preserve U.S. interests. And so I th uh, it's also then when you add in the Cold War uh, as well, that gave the U.S. A, a, yet another justification uh, for intervening in Latin America. And so if we're uh, focusing, narrowing down on El Salvador here, it's important to consider the Salvadoran Civil War, which is a very, very bloody conflict from 1979 to 1992. And the Salvadoran Civil War was a conflict between the FMLN uh, guerrilla rebels versus the government. And the government was, was completely supported by the United States. The Reagan administration viewed it as uh, an ally in, in the global Cold War fight. And so the... the um, so the Reagan administration provided it with funding, aid, it trained a lot of the soldiers, and the result of this was 75,000 dead civilians massacred by the Salvadoran government. And so the U.S. certainly played quite a role, or certainly contributed uh, to this. And then so uh, as one expects, as we're seeing in Ukraine, for example, right now, when there's a war, people are going to leave to try to find safety. So the root causes of the first waves of migration, really, uh, the U.S. has contributed to them uh, to a large extent. The, before the Civil War, there were uh, no, pretty much, there are very, very few Salvadorans in the United States, and that number rose to 500,000 uh, at the conclusion of the war. And then I think it's also important to talk about the, the gangs and, and the, the history of the gangs a little bit as well. Now, looking at this picture, uh, you might assume that that's downtown San, San Salvador. And this is a picture from the 1990s. But in fact, that's actually downtown Los Angeles. The gangs actually formed in Los Angeles in the United States. And so these uh, the gangs were... Uh, Salvadorans who had fled the Civil War, who were seeking refuge in the United States. 
they had a lot of trouble assimilating into, uh, into the, uh, the United States culture and with other Latinx communities throughout uh, the United States. So they formed these communities as spaces of belonging. There are places where they would listen to rock music, smoke marijuana occasionally. They were not uh, at, at the outset violent. Uh, they did become violent later on. There was a rivalry between the MS-13 gang and the Barrio 18, the 18th Street gang. Um, and what happened here is at the conclusion of the Civil War in the 1990s, the U.S. essentially deported uh, all of the, uh, all of the uh, gang members to, back to El Salvador. And now you have to remember, this is a country that's just survived a very bloody war. The democratic institutions are not yet in place. And here the gangs are essentially being transplanted uh, into this, uh, this environment, which allowed them to flourish and grow, unsurprisingly. So again, the point is, when we think about the root causes of the root causes here, the, very, the, the US has created quite a lot of the problem that it, that it says it has right now. And so just a little bit of background about gangs today. Uh, the, it's a bit hard to estimate the number of gang members uh, in El Salvador, but uh, so there are some estimates uh, say as many as, as 60,000, and that's in a population of 6.4 million. So that's almost 1% of the population of El Salvador is affiliated with the gangs in some way. Uh, you can see they, they often wear baggy clothing, they have tattoos, they, they can wear uh, face coverings before COVID. Um, uh, but uh, anyway. The, the gangs exercise a large degree of territorial control throughout the country. They, have, they, they man checkpoints. They control the flow of people uh, uh, through different communities. Um, and a lot of people assume, that, just based on the Mexican cartels, that the gangs are primarily, primarily make their money through drug trafficking. And that's not the case at all. These gangs are extortive. So, that, so they're using extortion as the main tactic to, to make money. And so that is what is called in El Salvador la renta the rent. In Honduras, they call it impuestos de guerra, or war taxes. So these are the ways that gangs make money. They have a, they have a saying here, ver, oír y callar. That means that anybody who sees something, who hears something, has to be quiet and cannot tell the authorities, or otherwise there will be serious consequences. Uh, and just, just a quick note about recruitment. It's also important to note that the gangs are recruiting children. They, are the, 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 they find children the most vulnerable and the most likely uh, to be incorporated into their networks. So they, they target children uh, in, uh, starting in primary school. So these are very young children. They coerce them into doing errands, uh, threatening to kill their parents if they do not. They also target young women and girls. Um, uh, and and the, the term they use is to make them be their girlfriends. That's the term that they use. And I think I just want to touch on this idea, which I call the <laughs> migration gang cycle. There have been lots of studies over the years uh, talk, talking about reasons that, that uh, people join the gangs. And one reason that is commonly cited is a lack of familial structure because other people uh, in the family are already in the United States or have already migrated elsewhere. So, for example, if a parent or both parents are, are in the United States, this is often a reason that will uh, lead people to join the gangs. So what that does is it creates a, a self-reinforcing cycle, right? The gangs drive a lot of the migration, yet that also reinforces the gangs. And so I think at this point I'll turn to some of the strategies that the Salvadoran government has employed uh, in order to, to combat gang violence. And the most well-known strategy is known as mano dura. And I think if you all can see the pictures, that will give you quite, quite some idea of what mano dura is. All of the terms I've listed here, these are various forms of the same thing. So mano dura was essentially a, a, a tough on crime rhetoric. The, the idea was to deter, to, to be very tough on crime and essentially deter uh, people from joining the gang. So they would put them in these sorts of conditions. Uh, they would arrest gang, uh, they would arrest people suspected of being gang members. So based on the clothes they were wearing or, the tattoo, uh, or, or their tattoos, they would arrest them without knowing whether they've committed a crime or not. Uh, and they would put them in these sorts of, uh, of situations. Now, the interesting thing is that you would expect being tough on crime to yield results, right? You would expect there to be a decrease in crime, knowing that there's a deterrence here. But that hasn't been the case at all. After, uh, after the, the uh, uh, Mano Dura was, uh, was first put in place, violence actually increased by 70%. So not only, and, and paradoxically, Mano Dura, these policies were cited as being one of the reasons that violence increased. So essentially what the government would do is by putting gang members in these sorts of situations, they would allow them to connect a lot better and organize better, right? So Mano Dura actually caused a lot of the, the problems to be exacerbated, essentially. 
the interesting part about this is not only we have a, counter, uh, a uh, policy that's counterproductive, that's making things worse, yet it was incredibly popular in El Salvador. And at times, 70, and I'm sorry, 95% of the Salvadoran population uh, has agreed that Manaluda is a good idea and wants to see more of it. So that's, that's a bit of a dilemma there. And so then the only other strategy that we've really seen is what's known as the gang truce. And first I want to take a minute to think about this idea of a truce. Because when we think of a truce, we think of armed conflict or wars, right? That, that, the, the idea of a truce comes from that. Yet here it's being taken and used in situations of criminal violence. And that's, that's something that I'm going to get into a little bit more. But so the, the gang truce was, was negotiated by President Mauricio Funes uh, in, in 2012, and it was negotiated in a clandestine manner. So the population did not know this was going on. It proved very, very successful. There was a 53% decrease in homicides. And, uh, and to, to put that in human terms, there were 1,800 fewer murders in 2012 than in 2011. So 1,800 families had their loves, loved ones uh, as, a, as a result of this policy. And the truce unraveled because of lack of popular support. Eventually, the news did break uh, about what had happened. Uh, and 60% of the population was against, uh, the, uh, against negotiating with the gangs. And 70% had absolutely no confidence in its e efficacy. So remember, we have 95% supporting Manudura, which is counterproductive, and very little support for the gang truce, which presents a bit of a dilemma, doesn't it? Right? How do we get people on our side, uh, but at the same time employ a policy that actually works? And so I think the, the, the research question that's informed much of my research is this. Are there any other negotiation tactics from armed conflict, because truce came from armed conflict, that could be refashioned and applied in this context? And I'm, I'm looking for things that might be a little bit more palatable uh, to, to the population that, that they might be more likely to accept as well. Um, and I think at this point, I, sh I, I should note that I'm not trying to say that negotiations are a good thing, right? It's not ideal that negotiations are the only thing that's worked so far. I'm just suggesting that, uh, that it's, it's something that we should consider and something that we should think about because there is, it's the only thing that has worked thus far. But not that it's ideal. Again, I, negotiating with criminals is not something I think is a great thing to do and that, that I would advocate for in general. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the other thing I should note is that uh, I am a, a white American researcher, and so the, all of the, my suggestions are, are predicated on the idea that of if, on Salvadorans accepting this and thinking that this is a good idea too or something good to try. I, I would not be in a position to judge if they said that, oh, that, that they would rather not negotiate with gangs and that, and that they would prefer uh, trying other solutions or, or keeping things the way they are. That, that would not be my, my position to judge. And so I know this seems slightly crazy, so bear with me. I'm mean, looking at the title, the idea of politically integrating gangs into, into, uh, into, into Salvador and life may seem slightly, slightly nuts, but bear with me for a minute. Uh, again, this is an idea that's taken from how we, how we deal with armed and insurgent groups. And one of the things that we do is try to transition them after a conflict into political parties, for example. And one great example of that happened in El Salvador already with the FMLN after the, the Civil War. Uh, the FMLN became a major party party in El Salvador, and until about three years ago was the party, uh, the ruling party. And so my question is, uh, there are several other examples. I think the Shining Path movement in, in Peru uh, is another example. There are, there are loads of them. Um, so my question is, can this be translated to criminal groups? And obviously, there's a big difference, right? The political party, uh, uh, political armed groups, for example, they have a popular base. They have a position. They're, they're advocating for something. And obviously, that's not the case in terms of gangs. But it actually has worked in the past. And there are a few examples here. So in Mali, the Grand Traficants, these are, these are drug traffickers, uh, were essentially enlisted by the, the, the government to negotiate with the Tuareg rebels and to act as intermediaries. And they liked the position of power. It gave them an incentive here, but having some power, and they left their criminal activities. The same thing happened in Afghanistan when members of the Mujahideen were, uh, uh, were also offered positions in the government. So obviously these have to be positions that the government is offering them because they won't get any popular support otherwise. And in El Salvador, we already, there's already, uh, it already shows that this might work in El Salvador, given that during the gang truce, gang leaders themselves uh, would uh, release, uh, would give press releases or appear on talk shows. So they, sh uh, they showed uh, that they, were, they really wanted to be involved in the political process. Another strategy uh, is job creation and social reintegration. So this looks, again, at the root causes of why people are in gangs, right? So the composition of gangs are young people who are poor, they have very little education, and they have no marketable skills. 
So Colombia noticed the same of, of, of FARC members, uh, for example, so they decided to provide job training, provide psychological services, because obviously being in a war, even uh, in being associated with criminal violence, is something that, that's very traumatic. And they provided uh, economic opportunities as well. So this could be something that would work. And then finally, uh, is my idea here is to try to repurpose gang networks. It would be quite detrimental, actually, to break up the gangs because they formed as spaces of belonging, spaces where uh, people could get together and, and, and find a community. So, uh, so if, we, if we don't want to break up these networks, how could we repurpose them in productive ways that the society might actually appreciate, such as manning checkpoints, delivering mail, or even acting as community health workers in, 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 during this COVID pandemic? And now I understand also, and, and feel someone, I don't have much time, so someone please bring this up in the questions if you feel like it, uh, that it's important to, to consider, obviously the gang truce fell apart because people, there was not enough popular support, so why would this be any different? I have a few ideas on, on how to make things more palatable, so again, feel free to bring that up. I'm setting myself up for a question here, so hopefully I can answer it. Um, and then, oh, sure. Oh. Oh. <laughs> I, well, I, I'll just skip to the end. Uh, Continue, continue. No, you're good, you're good. I'll just skip to the end here. Uh, I, I want to just point out that all of this is focusing on the countries of origin, and that's not to say that the U.S. doesn't have a lot of responsibility here and ha in creating better mechanisms of reception as well. And so if we look here uh, at the chart, you can see that the, uh, the most and least successful asylum seekers in immigration court, and you can see that those coming from situations of criminal violence are all the way at the bottom. These are the least successful uh, petitioners. So El Salvador is just about 20% of people receive asylum. So what we need to do is have better mechanisms of reception, uh, right? Because the, it, clearly criminal violence is not seen as a legitimate cause for entry. So that's another uh, thing that is, we don't just have to change the, uh, some of the, the situation in El Salvador itself, but how we receive uh, migrants as well. Thank you. Sorry for running over. Thank you. Thank you, Robbie. Uh, we will now open to the floor to question for the audience. Uh, if you are attending this seven online, please feel free to pose your question uh, wherever you wish you see in the Q&A future on Zoom. If you are here in the audience, please use the micro microphone to ask your questions. Yes, Patsy. Thank you for these really very impressive presentations to the four of you. It's always a pleasure to have our students present. You guys are always surprising in a very good way. So I just want to thank you, to thank Erica and Lucila for organizing this really great panel. My question is for Robbie. Can you tell us a bit about the terms on which the negotiations with the gangs took place? What were their grosses, their demands? To give us an insight into what some of the challenges they experienced that allow them to be so marginalized from the society are, and how the state responded in a way that addressed these. Thank you. Thank you. This, this, okay, thank you very much for the question. That's, that's a really good question. Uh, so the first thing I will say is it's a little bit hard to know what sort of terms they took place on because, as I mentioned, these were, were conducted in a clandestine manner, and it was only leaked after the fact. And I should mention that negotiations between gangs and the current government of Naib Bukele, that's also happening as well, also being conducted under the table. So it's a little bit hard to, to know. But essentially what, what, what we think happens is that the government asks for a reduction in homicide rates, right? Uh, and what they, the gangs get in in return are a lot of privileges uh, in prison. So what, what can happen is they'll get uh, telephone access, and so they'll be able to order what, uh, to other gang members who they want killed, what sort of things they want done. They'll get, they'll get telephone access in prison. Uh, and a lot of the conditions that you saw uh, you know, on the slides, those will be relaxed. So there was a period when they were mixing, the, the current government was mixing uh, Barrio 18 members with MS-13 members, and uh, essentially they after negotiations, th that was relaxed. They were back to, to their own communities, and so there was a lot less violence within the prison. So it's these sorts of um, special requests, uh, and, and, a lot, and the gang leaders themselves often get, have a lot, of, a lot more freedom. Even when they're, they're in prison, they, they are able to exercise their power much more freely. So these are the sorts of things that, that gangs technically uh, usually ask for. Hello, Robbie. Um, I'm curious about something. When you identify this gang violence as one of the main issues as a migrant uh, study, I, 
I don't get to understand if you are referring to the process in which other people run away from and they escape from gang violence or this gang violence has some economic or activity or even they re, re, reunion themselves, they, they get again, uh, they get each other near uh, the gang's uh, members uh, across the border. Sure, that's a great question as well. Um, I, when I've been referring to it, I've been thinking of gang members being the reason that people flee. So gang members uh, threatening families, you know, saying, if you don't pay me X amount of money, I'm going to kill your whole family. These are sorts of threats that unfortunately are very common and that I hear very frequently. But as to the, the other part of your question, I actually think that's another reason. It, I think it's very much hard to separate gang violence from Salvadoran society because it's such an ingrained uh, aspect of Salvadoran society. So gang violence absolutely affects economics, uh, economic growth, it affects so many different aspects of society. So, the, you know, the direct cause may be the threat, but gang violence is affecting all of it uh, as well. In fact, uh, one of the most commonly threatened groups are business owners. So if someone opens, you know, like a pupuseria, for example, just e even at their house. They, I, I spoke with a client um, last week, and uh, he had a carpentry shop that the gang members burned down. For example, so this is so those who own businesses are in much more risk uh, than others as well. So the answer is both. Thank you. Now we have some question from Zoom. Uh, yes, I'm going to read a question for Sammy that was submitted by uh, James Janine, uh, and he says, "For Sammy, any differences between subjects who were more or less assimilated into wider American populations and their social their social circles or schools, etc." Am I on? Oh, amazing. Firstly, thank you for the question. That was something I'm hoping to analyze more, um, doing potentially a mixed method study in the future. So I think one of the strengths of qualitative is you get a lot of really in-depth information on individuals, but then you have some limitations of these comparisons that you can make due to smaller sample sizes. Um, I will say, I think the thing that stood out to me the most out of all of the data um, was specifically the time of migration. So um, I think all of the participants that I did interview had at least to some extent some Latinx or Latin American communities surrounding them, um, and most reported being in relatively homogenous areas with a few exceptions. Um, but time of migration, specifically during adolescence, seemed to have the largest impact on mental health, particularly related to beauty ideals because of those quotes that I highlighted of being surrounded every single day with individuals and institutions that did not look like them. Okay, we have another question. Yes, uh, so Anne Amory asked two questions. I think, Robbie, you kind of answered the first one um, about why the population in El Salvador does not agree with the truce. Um, set up and then the other question is do you see any parallels between Mano Guda and other Latin American tough on crime programs and the US war on crime war on drugs and zero tolerance campaigns and why don't these work Sure, absolutely. So why don't these work? That's that's uh, that that the answer to that is a book, really, um, because there there are so many studies about these these sorts of policies. And an answer, uh, the, are there a lot of parallels between all of these policies? Absolutely. So when we re when we reference Malagura, uh it's it's a policy that I believe the the name at least came from from the Salvadoran context. But it's a policy that you see all over uh, Latin America in in Brazil, for example, in the favelas, where there's a lot of gang violence as well. So this is something. So Mano Dura is a, is a policy that's employed uh, across the board, really. And I, I think it certainly does have a lot of uh, parallels to the war on drugs. Um, and in terms of why doesn't this work, I think the, the main reason, at least in the Salvadoran context, was the, the intermingling of gang members and putting them all in the same space where they were, were able to organize uh, a lot better. Um, there's a lot of, I think there's, there's probably sociological research on this topic as well, you know, the impact of, uh, you know, I, I think you could also look at just prison sentences as well. You know, the United States has a very high incarceration rate. We have very high prison sentences in, in Europe, for example, that those prison sentences are much lower and there's a much lower, uh, my understanding is that, that people are much less likely to reoffend because there's a lot more rehabilitation. Um, and so I think it's really a focus on, on punitive tactics versus rehabilitative tactics. Um, and, and so, so yeah, there are lots of, again, you could go into a lot more detail on this one, but that's, that's a, a basic answer, at least. Uh, thank you so much again to our four speakers for sharing this research uh, and insight. And thank you, too, to the audience here and online. 
a special thanks also to the team of the Center uh, for Latin American and Caribbean Study at Brown University for hosting this panel in the context of the conference Histories of Migration and Violence in Latin America and the Caribbean. Thank you very much again, everyone. Goodbye, and thank you, Erika, to share with me the panel. The next panel will start in 15 minutes. I saw that one as a game. Oh, wait, that's so nice. Yeah, I saw that one as a game. Wait, where's my phone? I want to take a photo of it. Kristen, There's are you there? I would love more. Hello, <laughs> can you hear me? Oh, Anna, that one's that one's that one's that one's that Hello, Kristen, are you there? Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, that was actually, I volunteered in Vietnam with him like five, six years ago. Wow. You should write to him. I didn't even, I, because I had posted it on my social media. But wait, that's. Dame unos minutitos, ¿eh? es que estoy esperando a que me pelen porque no, no me hacen caso. Ya ves que están en la foto y todo eso. Ah, es que no has podido entrar, ¿verdad?
No me pelan, oye. Pues estos cuates, mira ya todos los mensajes que le mandé a esta mujer. Y sí me contestó el primero. Y mira lo que me dicen, ¿cuánto termina el primer panel? Y ahora no me pelan. Y Ana Patricia no puede entrar. Sí, está en la misma sesión. Está compartiendo Cristian, ¿no? Ajá. ¿Ah, ya entró? Sí. Ah. Sí, sí. Ah, entonces, pero ya está en la... Sí, ah, bueno, la asignación ya no me preocupa tanto. Sí, pues yo estoy igual, yo tampoco tengo la interpretación habilitada. Dile que se espere, que ya no dé la lata. Que ya le dije tres veces que me espere. Hasta que, hasta que llegue. Ah, sí. Ok. Eso es lo que importa, exactamente. Ya que entramos las dos a la sesión, ahorita la habilitan. Nada más necesito que me contesten. Ya se acabó la sesión y ahorita por lo que veo están ahí nada más. Chachalaqueándole.
don't have the interpretation enabled, we need Kristen to help us out. Uh, Do you have any way to communicate with her? Um, yes. Yes, I do. One second. Thank you. Let me just fill in the chat. I sent her a chat already. Okay. I can do the phone. Oh, I she's answering now. Okay, so we're ready to start. Um, Kristen, can you please enable the interpretation? I'm so sorry. Maybe she forgot. Okay, I just texted her. Um, can we start while they're figuring it out? Okay, good afternoon, everyone. For those of you just joining us, my name is Patsy Lewis, and I'm the director of the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies at, here at Brown University. It is my pleasure to welcome you to our seventh panel, Lessons for Migration Studies, Centering Embodied Experience in Scholarship. I would start by introducing, and I will introduce everyone at once, and then you will, you will appear in the name in which you, you, you appear on the program. Um, please know that Tivia Collins is no longer able to join us. Kamala Kempadu and Angelique Nixon are presenting together. The title of their presentation is Caribbean Migration and Sexual Politics, Challenging Heteropatriarchy, Racism and Trafficking. Kamala Kempadu is professor in the, de the Department of Social Science at York University, Canada. She teaches Caribbean studies, black radical and black feminist thought, sex work studies and critical anti-trafficking studies and has published extensively on the Caribbean sex trade and global anti-trafficking discourses. She is co-editor with Halima A.F. Deschamps of the recently published collection, Methodologies in Caribbean Research on Gender and Sexuality and is completing an edited book on white supremacy, coloniality, and anti-trafficking with Brown University professor Elena Shi. She was also a COGOT and will be again, a COGOT visiting professor to our center um, last year and next fall, hopefully. Angelique Nixon is a lecturer and researcher at the Institute for Gender and Development Studies at the University, ahora tenemos en la Universidad. University of the West Indies, St. Augustine, Trinidad and Tobago. Her research and teaching areas include Caribbean and post-colonial studies, African diaspora literatures, gender and sexuality studies, tourism and diaspora studies, and transnational migrations. Her research and creative work are widely available. She is the author of the, uh, the award-winning scholarly book, Resisting Paradise, Tourism, Diaspora, and Sexuality in Caribbean Culture. Nicole Ramsey's presentation is entitled Belizean Migration Shuns, Disaster and Diasporic Imaginings. Nicole Ramsey is an interdisciplinary scholar from Los Angeles, California, whose research examines formations of blackness, identity, and nation in Latin America and the Caribbean. As a postdoctoral fellow at the Carter G. Woodson Institute for African American and African Studies, she is currently working on her first book, A Transnational Study of Black Articulations of Belizean Identity through Postcolonial Performances of National Commemoration 
visual culture, migration, and the popular culture. Angelica Alvites Baedera is presenting Merades desde Sur Global sobre subjectividades migrantes y políticas, prolifer proliferación de fronteras y violencias, perspectives from the global south on migration and political subjectivities, proliferation of borders and violences. She is currently a researcher at the International Studies Institute of the Universidad Arturo Prat, Chile, and a research assistant at the Consejo Nacional de Investigaciones Cientific Científicas y Técnicas, CONICET, Argentina. She earned her doctoral degree in political science from the Center for Advanced Studies in the Social Sciences Department at the University the Universidad Nacional de Cordoba and her licenciatura in sociology from the university, sorry, the Universidad Nacional de Villa Maria. Dr. Alvites Bayadera's work focusing on, focuses on themes related to international migrations, the politics of migratory regulation and border and migration governance in South America. She has participated in collaborative and in individual research and outreach projects published in international scientific journals and written books and book chapters. She currently published International Migrations, Borders and States, How Do We Interpret Border Governance from South America? And she co-authored Being a Migrant in Argentina in COVID-19 Times, Mobilizing Strategies During an Immobility Mandate. Our final presenter is Thais de Sant Ana Machado, whose presentation is the stereotype of the Mae Preta in Brazil. And please forgive me for my poor pronunciation, <laughs> the invisibility and naturalization of violence against black women in a national project. Thais de Sant Ana Machado has a PhD in sociology from the University of Brasilia she was a visiting research fellow at Brown University in 2019-2020 and is a researcher at the National Institute of Educational Studies and Research, Aniceo Teixeira. She holds, uh, since 2013, sorry, she holds a bachelor's degree and a master's degree in sociology from the University of Brasilia. Thais has experience in the areas of sociology of race relations and critical food studies with an interest in the topics anti-Black racism, culinary work, and intersectionality. She also works with the production and analysis of gender and race data in the field of education. She is currently working on a book project based on her dissertation, A Foot in the Kitchen, a socio-historical analysis of the work of Black women working as cooks in Brazil. So I now invite Kamala and Angelique Nixon to start. Thank you, uh, Patsy. It's good to be back again, even though it's virtual. Um, nice to see everybody as well here. Um, um, Angelique and I have prepared a, a presentation. We're working on this together as a paper that I hope um, that's the, a paper in progress, if you like. But um, really, and I've got to keep my part as short as possible because we have very little time. Um, so we're, we're thinking through how it is that Caribbean migration um, and sexual politics are challenging some of the kind of regimes around sexuality that exist in the region. And we're thinking it through from our, from our work from several decades that are attached to um, sex workers, movements, migrations, as well as um, uh, LGBTQI um, persons who both live and move around the region. Um, one of the areas that um, I've been particularly concerned about and Angelique is also taking up in her work is about the impacts that um, not just laws, and policies have on the migrations, the existing laws and policies in the region, but also how anti-trafficking policies um, also contribute to certain kinds of violence um, 
that uh, that are enacted on uh, the bodies and persons of migrant sex workers and LGBTQ persons. Um, so, um, and but we're really also um, sort of concerned about about how these the violence that both in these anti-trafficking policies, but also in the criminalization of sex work and same-sex sexual practices work together, um, as well as how they are supported, if you like, through um, a widespread respectability politics um, in the Caribbean. Um, and these are particularly attached to, you know, how we think about um, um, sex work, queer sexualities. Can we go on to the next? Um, but what we are concerned about in this paper particularly um, is not just about the violence and unjust treatment or the, the sex and homo and transphobia that these sexual minorities uh, face, um, but with questions about how LGBTQI people uh, and sex workers offer ways to think about decolonizing Caribbean sexualities how in thinking through from the struggles, subjectivities, and everyday practices of people who are commonly perceived to be sexual outcasts, sexually, socially degenerate, indecent, and unrespectable, we can gain better insight into both oppression and we can gain a perspective on sexuality that may be liberating. And this is the kind of work we've been doing for, you know, this is what our work really addresses, not just the violence, but also the liberation, the, 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 the struggles against um, these kind of violences. Um, we are offered ways of thinking about Caribbean sexuality that embraces queerness, non-monogamousness, if you like, or promiscuity, and importantly, feminine sexual agency. Um, and, um, we can learn to and how we can learn to appreciate sexual practices as not always tethered to notions of romantic love, which is often through a sort of colonial and post-colonial paradigm, especially with regards to women. As I said, respectability in the Caribbean, um, which has long been shaped by colonial gendered paradigms that privileges certain sexual behaviors and identities and diselects others is challenged and in part redefined through sexual minority practices, both through migrations as well as um, everyday life. So let's go next one. Um, and in an e any effort to, de we, we, we understand that any effort to decolonize Caribbean sexuality must also speak about decolonizing ideas about race because of the entanglement with race and sexuality, particularly in the way in which brown, brown women's bodies and black men's bodies have been also associated with a sort of hypersexuality in the region, as well as the ways in which um, migrant women's sexuality becomes hyper eroticized very quickly. And, um, and so in thinking about decolonizing Caribbean sexuality, um, we necessarily then think this also challenges the sort of xenophobias and constructions of citizenship that rest on notions of racial and national purity that are embedded in these laws and anti-trafficking um, policies. As I said, anti-trafficking is one mechanism in the 21st century that is mobilized to police borders and migrant sexuality and sustains um, xenophobias and racism. Um, and one of the things that we are particularly concerned about also is how um, very recently um, LGBTQ vulnerability is also being taken up by the U.S. Trafficking in Persons Report um, as experiences of LGBTQI plus people doing sex work in complex ways because of migration hardships and being kicked out of their home because of homophobia and queerphobia um, are being taken up through the framework of trafficking. And this has um, been also um, reiterated in um, another report, um, a Western Hemisphere report recently, um, where it's stated, and I 
and where they identify, and I quote, key trafficking trends across the region include an increase in Venezuelan victims and concerns with other vulnerable migrants, internally displaced persons, indigenous peoples, and lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and intersex LGBTQI populations. Hence, we might want to question and consider how LGBTQI plus vulnerability will also be introduced in the Caribbean region's policies and ideas about sex trafficking. It's something that I think we really need to keep our eyes on, and we, we would like to also think about that. Um, we may not get to it much today. Um, but I think... Um, but, so anti-trafficking as well is also contested by everyday sexual practices of these Caribbean populations, be it migrations that involve sex work or transactional sex, LGBTQI plus subjectivity or same-sex desire. And on to the next ones. Um, and in particular, I'm going to hand it over to Angelique now because she is going to talk about some of the work that she's doing through the community-based research with Kaiso. Um, as an example of some of the ways in which um, we can build this other way of thinking about sexual, sexual praxis and sexuality. Anjali. Thank you so much. Uh, so so uh, please forgive me if I turn off my video. So I just want to give out two examples of the ways that uh, I think looking at Caribbean sexuality as, uh, as Kamala and I are suggesting that if we think about the everyday praxis of people, if we look at the complicated lives and experiences of people on the ground, and also the kind of work uh, that I think uh, many organizations who work with migrant and LGBTQI people are doing. So I just wanna raise two examples, one through uh, a project recently finished called the Sexual Culture of Justice that I led. And we interviewed 18 working class LGBTQI plus people um, a number of whom had different kinds of migration. So these are not registered. There's no way to completely understand these experiences. And so I just wanted to point out that at, at least two of the participants talked about survival sex and they talked about experiences of being, having to struggle either as trans people or young queer people navigating, uh, either leaving their homes, literally homes in Trinidad and Tobago or homes elsewhere in the Caribbean and coming to Trinidad and the different complexities of that experience is, and surviving uh, and understanding the work that they do as work, you know, and the ways that uh, even in situations where it might be forced work or coerced work or even chosen work, that it, there's no way for trafficking paradigms to even remotely understand the complexity of the day-to-day -day living uh, and, and, that's, and, 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 and the ways that people are surviving and finding ways to navigate and negotiate different experiences across the region. Uh, the other set example I wanna offer today is through the work of Kaiso Sex and Gender Justice, where I'm a director and I've been working with Kaiso as a feminist LGBTQI organization for the, uh, since 2016. And we do a lot of different organization for the, uh, since 2016. And we do a lot of different kinds of work. And so I just wanted to share in particular uh, that our vision and our, uh, and our movement building has been one that's certainly local to Trinidad and Tobago, but also very regional. And we also are grounded in a decolonial and feminist approach to how we think about rights and how we think about freedoms. Uh, and we do that work in a number of ways. And so I want to specifically uh, highlight that because of the values that we have, when we approach and think about services, when we approach and support communities, we do so in a way that is holistic. And I think that is the kind of example when we think through how we approach the problems and the issues. I mean, some of it can be quite overwhelming. Uh, but one of the things that we've done in the last uh, two years, that we've started a program called Wholeness and Justice. And this is just giving you a sense of that work. Uh, we started Wholeness and Justice because we wanted, it was a long turnout in Tobago, faced by people because of their migration status, because of gender identity, and because of informal work, generally informal sex work. And so we focused on the social services and community support specifically for trans people and sex workers, regardless of sexual orientation. And I wanna highlight this because we recognize the ways that people uh, who do sex work, whether they're straight or not, 
are made vulnerable because of sex, because of ideas and respectability politics and the criminalization of sex work. And we also recognize the ways that in particular trans people end up doing different kinds of sex work because they cannot get formal kinds of jobs. And Trinidad and Tobago has become a place where sometimes people come to Trinidad from other parts of the region to different, to different kinds of work. Uh, and so we engaged in this support services for focusing on trans uh, people and sex workers. And we supported 67 clients over the course of the May to October in 2020. And we provided emergency support with food cards, with hampers, with rental assistance where we could and supplies such as gloves, masks, hand sanitizers, soap, lube, uh, condoms, and so on, recognizing well, one, you know, it was really difficult for sex workers to do work because of the lockdowns. Trinidad and Tobago had really extreme lockdown measures as other places and curfews. Uh, and so during that time, we really focused on during that time, we really focused on the immediate needs of people and not in any way moralizing or trying to police people, which is what a lot of the social services navigations do. And of course, there's, there's the ways that police are picking up people off the street. And if you're a migrant, you can easily be deported. This happened in Barbados uh, and it happened here in Trinidad and Tobago and other places as well. So we focus specifically on how do we support people during this process? We specifically on how do we support people during this process? We also had the case, and I have to speak very generally, of course, because specifically on how do we support people during this process. We also had the case, and I have to speak very generally, of course, because of confidentiality. Formal work becomes uh, a site for a need, and we want and we try to provide inter interventions to provide people with whatever they need for healing and resistance and self-advocacy, which is a really big part of our work. And so in that process, we have done, we focus on two different areas. Uh, one, the food assistance and community emergency support for communities continue. We support around 15 to 20 people per month. Most of them are sex workers and or trans people. That's our priority. And then another way we've done two different kinds of migrant support groups. We have one for Spanish speakers and that has been continuing over the past few months. And we also did an LGBTI migrant advocacy training with Living Water Community, which is a group here in Trinidad and Tobago that works exclusively with migrants. And we also support people depending on if they are trying to apply for asylum here in Trinidad or they need that status in order to be able to stay in Trinidad. Of course, these things are tricky with legal uh, challenges. So I wanted to just share this as a model of what we've been doing at Kaiso to provide this idea of homeless and justice, how we've included sex workers and migrants and how those particular vulnerabilities are not ones uh, that can easily, easily be understood in, within state, regional, or even international ways that uh, you know, trafficking and addressing the problems of migration just simply don't. Uh, the folks just fall through the cracks quite literally and uh, are left to fend for themselves. Uh, and so I just can can you wrap up with yes I will yes so I just wanted to move quickly through um, what uh, some of the work of Kaiso we do uh, organize through this idea of about intersections and so in closing I just wanted to show a little bit of Kaiso's work how we ensure that we're thinking about bodies and sexualities and gender expressions. Uh, and the part of the work is working both in terms of how do we transform laws, how do we do that advocacy, but also how do we shift and transform our cultures and our understanding of sex and sexuality. Thank you. Nicole? Yes, thank you. Um, do I have permission to share my screen? Okay, perfect. There we go, and can everyone see the screen okay? Yes. Okay, yes. thank you. Um, yes, um, so thank you, good afternoon. Um, thank you for having me here and thank you to the organizers for planning this wonderful conference. I've learned so much in the span of these two days, so I'm really grateful. 
Um, and I'm really looking forward to sharing some of my preliminary work um, in progress. Um, so the title of my presentation um, is Belizean Migrations, Disaster and Diasporic Imaginings. And this is part of a larger project, um, working on my first book project on Blackness, identity formation, performance, memory, and nationalism in Belize, um, and Caribbean or West Indian migration to the United States. And in particular, I'm interested in questions surrounding visibility and erasure um, within the Belizean community and within the context of predominant depictions of Central American migration, as well as regional Black diasporas and Caribbean identities in the United States. And furthermore, I look at the role of disaster, specifically through the lens of Hurricane Hattie, as both the foundation of more recent contemporary Belizean displacement, as well as how it is utilized within collective memory and formations of the community. Right. So I begin first with contextualizing Belize and its place within the social and regional landscape. Understandings of race and identity in Belize, a former British colony and the only country in Central America with English as an official language, have raised questions as to what category or region the relatively young nation belongs. Belize's status as a Caribbean country in Central America situates the nation as somewhat of a central site of diasporic convergences. And I argue that Belizeans in Los Angeles in particular is an important site for Black Central American and Caribbean experiences in the West, and particularly an arena in which Black Belizean identities are negotiated in the context of Black and Brown Los Angeles. Given that roughly one out of every three Belizeans lives abroad, with the majority residing in Southern California, Belizean Los Angeles encapsulates what Caraboy Davies refers to as Caribbean spaces, stating, quote, these are social and cultural spaces that extend the understanding of the Caribbean beyond small space, fragmented identities, and captures ontologically ways of being in the world. October 31st, 1961, with winds of up to 160 miles per hour, Hurricane Hattie made landfall near Belize City, a city that sat just at sea level with only a small seawall and coral reefs as its only defenses. When the storm passed over a total of 300 and seven Belizeans were reported dead with damage to the country's infrastructure, crop industries, and sugarcane production totaling over 60 million. The destruction was so widespread that the capital um, was moved from the coast, Belize town, 50 miles inland to Belmopan. Hattie's, de Hattie's devastation was experienced on all levels and shortly after Belize city declared martial law, and due to the high death toll, mass cremations were carried in hopes of stopping additional diseases from spreading. Many city residents were also faced with homelessness. And as a result, Hattieville was established as a temporary refugee camp and it ultimately became a permanent town in Belize district. Hattie as sustained in the public collective memory was expressed through such songs such as Hurricane Hattie by Jamaican reggae musician, Jimmy Cliff, where he compares his adoration and eagerness for his love interest as intense and forceful as a Hurricane Hattie. And due to the destruction and loss of life attributed to the hurricane, the name Hattie was also retired by the World Medi Meteorological Organization. But this was not the first time that the Belizean population was severely devastated by natural disaster in the form of a hurricane. 30 years earlier on September 10th, the hurricane of 1931, which had been called the worst hurricane in living memory, plummeted into Belize town, destroying quote, three quarters of the town's housing and killed roughly 2,500 Belizeans. Can be traced to this movement and migration wave in the mid 1960s with its peak in the 1970s. As Christina Sharp writes in the wake, living in the wake means living in the history and present of terror from slavery to the present as the ground of our everyday black existence. And it is an apt conceptual framework of what living blackness across the diaspora means and looks like within diaspora in Belize through the unfolding aftermath of chattel slavery and colonial subjugation and neglect. These events also produce radicalized colonial subjects living in the wake of 1931 and 1961. Within the global and pan-African context of the radical and post-colonial 1960s, the Hattie generation 
um, as it was dubbed, was used to refer to teenagers and young adults who came of age and were politicized through these events. And by events, I'm not only referring to the actual hurricane itself, but the infrastructure and colonial neglect um, of Belizeans prior, as well as the response, economic depression, and lack of resources that came after. Um, so an immigrant community formed and constructed through a hurricane and its wake is, also, is not unique to the Belizean experience. One only needs to look at Haiti, Puerto Rico, and other Caribbean contexts to recognize the interconnections between movement, displacement, and natural disaster. Belizeans as a transnational community residing between the United States and Belize and forged by multiple movements and migrations prompts us to think of this exodus within a framework of displacement, exile, and homemaking. Particularly thinking of the Belize movement and migration is useful for thinking about various processes of racialization in Latin America and the broader Caribbean. For example, Although new road links through Mexico, which Belizeans term as deem as um, coin as migrating through the back, provided the means and financial affordability, Jerome Strand writes that the challenge for Black Belizeans was far greater than Mestizo Belizeans due to language and physical similarities. However, once at the U.S. border, the challenge diminished through claims um, of a Black American identity. This reveals an intricate and unique process of hypervisibility and invisibility as it intersects with Black immigration and nation state logics of surveillance. Furthermore, the absence of countries like Panama and Belize from scholarship on Central Americans in the United States, you know, imaginary, and, that, and one that also centers the African diaspora. Ben mi pantalla? Sí. Perfect. Bueno, como decía la presentadora, mi nombre es Angélica Alvites, soy del Instituto de Estudios Internacionales de la Universidad Arturo Prat en Chile, al sur sur de América Latina. Así que hoy voy a presentar una ponencia titulada Miradas del Sur Global sobre Subjetividades Migrantes y Política, Proliferación de Fronteras y Violencia. La propuesta es eh, realizar un análisis sobre la relación entre subjetividades migrantes, políticas y fronteras a partir de diferentes eh, reflexiones de un trabajo de campo en curso en el norte de Chile. No me di cuenta de hacer la presentación en inglés y cuando vi la presentación de las compañeras dije yo hubiera sido pertinente para la próxima vez. Era. Así que esta propuesta, eh, las fotos que, vamos a, que voy a ir presentando son parte del trabajo de campo, salvo que no tenga una cita abajo, las fotos son de mi autoría y propio trabajo de campo, sino son de compañeras eh, de, de Lint. Así que ahí dice, por ejemplo, la foto de Sara Pardo de Marchi, que es el quien me prestó la, la fotografía. ¿no? Y algunas particularidades del trabajo de campo es primero hacer eh, que este trabajo es un trabajo etnográfico que está en curso, eh, que lo vengo desarrollando en diálogo con Marcela Tapia y Romina Ramos, que son colegas del INTE, con las que compartimos eh, líneas de investigación que se llama Fronteras, Movilidades Humanas y Prácticas Sociales Transfronterizas, y asimismo también este trabajo entra con, en diálogo con los trabajos de Bianca de Marchi, que si bien ella tiene otras preocupaciones en torno a las fronteras, hemos compartido, la, ella comentaba, que lo, eh, lo sinteticé en tres eh, grandes momentos. Por un lado, habitar el tránsito, las violencias sufridas, encarnar el control. El segundo momento tiene que ver con la idea de los reforzadores y cruzadores de fronteras, cómo gobernar a través del miedo, y el tercer ítem que analíticamente construí tiene que ver con la idea de movilidad y movilidad, la idea de entrampamiento, que es una categoría nativa, y el origen nacional como centro de disputa. Si ustedes ven la imagen que está a la izquierda, es eh, el cruce eh, de Colchane, eh, el que las piezas del cruce por paso eh, no habilitado, que ahí vamos a, se los voy a ir presentando. Bueno, como les decía, acá al costadito les puse un pequeño mapa eh, del norte de Chile, eh, que está ubicado, en, para que tengan una referencia un poco más geográfica de, del punto y de observación en el que estamos trabajando con las compañeras. Eh, la particularidad que tiene Chile, menos que entraron por paso no habilitado, en la mayoría de los casos son venezolanos provenientes de Colombia, Ecuador y Perú, es decir, no son 
venezolanos que vienen de Venezuela, sino que han tenido un tránsito o han residido en alguno de estos tres países por un tiempo de uno, dos, o tres o cuatro años en, ese, en este contexto. Eh, una particularidad es que de este grupo de que se está moviendo, un tercio son niños y niñas o lactantes, y como les comentaba, el paso está totalmente eh, habilitado en el norte de Chile, sigue cerrado hasta el día de hoy. Además, una particularidad en este contexto de pandemia es que han fallecido eh, 21 personas en lo, por cruzar por pasos no habilitados. Eh, digo, esto es una particularidad en la región eh, y las estadísticas van en crecimiento. Entonces también es alarmante eh, por, ese, por esa situación. ¿no? Desde mediados de septiembre del 2021 se han intensificado las manifestaciones, prácticas racistas y xenófobas antimigrantes Particularmente les voy a mostrar algunas imágenes de algunas marchas anti-inmigrantes en las que participé, eh, que la verdad es que terminé un poco afectada en lo afectivo y en lo corporal también. Y eh, esto se da en un contexto, como dicen algunos autores eh, del, no, del sur, eh, en el marco de una estrategia gubernamental de segurización migratoria influenciada por la doctrina de seguridad nacional y una espectacularización de las expulsiones administrativas. Yo, para no eh, profundizar en esta contextualización, les dejo a algunos autores y autoras que vienen trabajando las cuestiones del norte de Chile y en Chile en general, y después más abajo les dejé algunas intervenciones de académicos en tiempos de COVID, principalmente por la situación que se vive en Colchán y en toda la región norte. Entonces, eh, acá eh, les, les voy leyendo algunos eh, pedacitos de entrevista. Dice, vengo desde Perú, el de Colombia, nos cruzamos en el camino y vamos juntos con otros por seguridad. Desespera el maltrato, dice Ramona, sumale la altura y la arena. Más o menos Colchón está a unos 3.500 metros de altura y, el, y la arena es terrible. Ahora está lloviendo particularmente, o sea, hay mucha lluvia. Eh, otra cita de, de Rosa, de origen boliviano, dice, a mí el carabinero no sé qué me dijo, o sea, la persona que hace el control migratorio, y como no le entendí, me mandó por el bofedal. Caminé como cinco horas, casi me muero. Ese cruce, que está, la, la imagen que ustedes están viendo, es parte de una zanja que se hizo en el año 2017 y está al lado del complejo fronterizo, el control fronterizo estatalmente establecido. Y el bofedal queda unos kilómetros más allá y es muy peligroso porque es agua con barro, es lodoso y es más, muchas de las personas que les comentaba que habían fallecido, fallecieron en ese, en ese territorio porque se, se pueden ahogar las personas. ¿no? Eh, otra, Raquel nos come, me comentaba, dice, en esto puse algunas frases de chilenos, peruanos, bolivianos y también de venezolanos para no, no, no romper con la dicotomía nacional que son los, los chilenos y los venezolanos, sino que hay una combinación y es más complejo lo que una querría que fuera. ¿no? Eh, entonces, Emanuel dice, allí están los seres de luz de una, en una forma despectiva. Los derechos humanos son para ellos, son vagos, quieren todo de arriba, como en Venezuela. Josefina Peruana dice, tenemos que tener cuidado en este, me, me aconsejan, porque como yo también soy migrante, y entonces como para orientarme en la ciudad también me... me... La expresión no fue de la marcha anti-inmigrante. Dice, tenemos que tener cuidado, tenés que tener cuidado en esas calles, más de noche, porque están los venezolanos pidiendo y te roban. Otro, otro consejo que me da un señor eh, boliviano es, yo te recomiendo que no les des comida ni dinero, se abusan, porque justo yo les había, eh, me, me pidieron plata y yo les, les entregué dinero, entonces él me recomendaba, al verme mi, eh, un poco turista también, me recomendaba, en donde decía que había una mirada nocéntrica eh, desde destino, desde Estados Unidos, y a su vez que se había hecho, eh, se había enfatizado en la imagen del cruzador de frontera, eh, como la imagen considerada paradigmática de toda la experiencia fronteriza, y dice casi olvidando por completo la posibilidad de que muchos habitantes de la, front de la frontera quieren reforzarla. Entonces por eso también, cuando yo veía esta situación, por eso también traje a colación eh, no solamente entrevistas de chilenos y, y comentarios de chilenos, sino también de peruanos y bolivianos que hace un tiempo que viven en la ciudad de Iquique, que trabajan en la ciudad de Iquique y que también son eh, migrantes. ¿no? Entonces la idea de reforzar, eh, de, de, los refor de, empezar, de que tenemos que empezar a mirar a aquellos que quieren reforzar la frontera y no solamente de los que cruzan eh, la frontera. ¿no? Y a su vez esto está conectado con la idea de gobernar a través del miedo, 
porque eh, algo interesante es que, eh, siguiendo la propuesta de, de Boucheron y Rabin, ellos marcaban que la idea, si bien el miedo es constitutivo a la autoridad política, señala cierta eficacia del control, eh, de controlar el miedo y construir al otro como una amenaza. Entonces, los chilenos se sienten amenazados por los venezolanos, los peruanos y bolivianos se sienten amenazados por esta nueva migración, y los venezolanos se sienten amenazados por aquellos que son nativos, chilenos, o, o que hace mucho tiempo que viven acá, porque puede correr el riesgo su vida. O sea, hay como una tensión, hay una amenaza constante entre los grupos, entre, la sociedad, entre los habitantes de, del territorio. O sea, la amenaza, o sea todo el, se ve al, al otro como una amenaza, y no solamente al venezolano en el contexto de la marcha anti-inmigrante, eh, tratando de defender de la situación de que ella era ladrona, de que ella venía a quitar el trabajo, de que vendían droga y demás. Entonces Angelica, ella decía... ¿sí? Angelica, no tenemos más tiempo. Ah, ah termino rapidísimo. Permiso. Ok. Muchas gracias por su... No, por favor. Gracias. Así que bueno, ahí, ahí termino y les dejo la última imagen para, eh, para seguir trabajando y seguir discutiendo. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Sorry, I'm, I'm sorry to be rushing everybody, but we really don't have a lot of time. Um, I'd like to invite Thais de Santa Ana Machado. Thank you. Hello, in African Studies uh, in 2019. And especially after having had to rush back to Brazil almost exactly two years ago due to the pandemic. So after saying that I really miss the Black diasporic intellectuals who welcomed me to this country, I will begin my presentation, which deals with an excerpt from my dissertation about the history of Black women working as cooks in Brazil. I want to start this presentation with a picture from 1913. It doesn't seem to be anything very special about it at first glance, as it looks like an ordinary record from its time. The brief description of the photograph let us know that this is a black woman working as a nanny holding a white baby. And the way they are framed by the photographer The centrality of the photograph is the baby with his round cheeks and also impeccable white clothes, which reflect the nanny's care and the likely wealth of his parents. The nanny does not look at the camera, which reinforces the centrality of the baby. But the woman's presence is immortalized by the portrait. This photo could be of any Black woman working as a domestic worker about whom we would know nothing, and little do we know in fact, but a caricature which would have been inspired by her became nationally known in Brazil in the early 20th century. Quote, that's ignorance itself. That is, ignorant properly, no. Science and more bookish things that she ignores completely. But in the practical things of life, she's truly an Anastasia, one of the most well-finished examples of the stereotype of the with the image of the mummy is no accident, especially considering the transits and the connections of white Brazilian intellectuals with the United States. But it's of interest to mark here the importance of the caricature in the Brazilian national and racial project in the post-abolition period. The stereotype of the Mãe Preta is fundamental to the idea of Jesus in 1975 about her life in the early 20th century, how to find better conditions of work. And also the book, Me, Domestic Worker, published by the author Preta Hara in 2019, reveals the longevity of the violent and precarious working conditions. It is important to think that about how they also show the way in which Black women have been confined to domestic work throughout the second conditions, 
are quite long-standing since the first record of domestic workers' movement organizing dates back to 1926 in Brazil. However, until 2013, the echo of this narrative is so strong that Black domestic workers had no access to any, any of the labor rights guaranteed to all Brazilian workers, despite the, their intense political organization. The achievement of rights since then, however, has not mean, meant the end of precarious and violent working conditions, and consequently of how this is a function performed mostly by Black women. As the average of the income in 2019 shows, it is clear why one of the biggest goals of domestic workers is still to quit their jobs, being to do anything else, or to ensure that their daughters don't have to perform this function. The coronavirus pandemic has further exposed the fragility of um, Sorry, uh, torture and rescues of workers in situations analogous to slavery. While Monteiro Lobato's great granddaughter is busy trying to defend her great grandfather's work or to artificially remove racism from his books by excluding openly racist passages, the stereotype of the Maipreta remains alive and the omission of the Brazilian state to protect this group reveals the continued continuity of a national project that depends on the essential work of black women while maintaining them in the worst working condition. So thank you very much. Don't forget to cite black women, please. Thank you so very much, Thais. We have 15 minutes for questions. I'll try to grab a couple more. Um, but we may not have many. Okay, I have, um, okay, great. I'll, I'll read Kristen Collins's summary because I don't have the time to summarize. Thank you for this one and Brazil. So many good insights into migration, race and gender and the types of violence and also, but also resistances that are present. And I'll add to that to say that these were I'll add to that to say that these were some incredibly rich um, presentations. And I just want to jump in to ask each of you a question. Angelis aggravates the migrant experiences. Um, you mentioned withholding food, withholding water, and it, it raises the questions, the question of well, what other ways are, are, um, are black people? negatively affected as our uh, experience migration across Chile differently, but also where are the support structures? Are there any? Um, and for Thais, can you speak more about how the state worked to marginalize Black women and give us a, a temporal sense? Um, because um, to make it clear of how the extent to which some of the, 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 the state policies towards Black women may have changed over time or remain the same. Uh, and if um, there are new contemporary challenges that um, are experienced. So I will start with Angelina and Kamala, if you'd like to answer. Angelique, you were going to say something, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, we can both dive in. I was writing a response in the chat, <laughs> but I think I'll just say very quickly, I think, you know, this is really building on uh, Kamala's work and long identifying the ways that Paula were, were affected. So for queer people who are already doubly and triply marginalized in different societies because of all of the reasons we know are going to experience that marginalization and vulnerability even more, and might not even benefit from some of these so-called protections that could happen in the process of applying for asylum or trying to seek support. They might end up, of course, being deported or targeted in the process. Um, and this is particularly true for trans sex workers who 
uh, who are hyper visible in the sex industry and doing work on, you know, in public spaces. And thank, thank you, Angelique. And I should just add very, very quickly that our concern now is explicitly taken up in the US by the US State Department as a category that can is trafficked. And um, we think that that is also going to enter into the kind of, going to enter into the kind of policies that circulate in the Caribbean because of the way that uh, the US monitors the world on trafficking. So we want to pay attention to it and to tr try to um, the women factor into that as well, given that, you know, the subjectivity in reference to survival and being tough and kind of this pride that comes with surviving, I'm very interested to see the gender dynamics of that as well. Hopefully that answers the question. <laughs> Thank you. And those of you who are on screen, please just use the raise hand function to jump in. Okay. Angelica, yes. Bueno, agradecerles a todas eh, las expositoras, a, a Kamal, a Angelique, Ana y Nicole por sus presentaciones y particularmente con el tema de la racialización del sol. Tengo una compañera que trabaja esos temas, pero particularmente acá se conecta la racialización con el origen nacional. Yo me siento más blanqueada por ser de origen nacional argentino que si fuera venezolana. Si yo fuera venezolana, mi condición de blanqueamiento cambiaría eh, por eh, el, la, lo, los prejuicios y los condicionamientos que hay sobre mi origen nacional. Es como que se conecta lo racial con el origen nacional y uno, eh, eh, hay como grados de blanqueamiento en función de ese origen nacional. La Argentina está caracterizada por esa condición del origen nacional y hoy por hoy las personas venezolanas están racializadas eh, más que todo por esa condición de ser de Venezuela. Eh, es una hipótesis, tampoco eh, es parte del trabajo eh, etnográfico y los aportes de, 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 de las presentaciones de las compañeras me, han, me van a servir para seguir pensando y seguir reformulando ideas. Así que muchas gracias por el espacio. Works in the destination. Yes, thank you for that question. Um, I, I guess I'll speak to both. Um, thinking of Belize and migrants um, more broadly, which entails um, mestizo Belizeans, Mayan indigenous as well. Um, so you kind of have all those uh, particularities of the um, Belizean migrant experience in the United States. And then I'll try to kind of give a living in California for six months and then Belize city for six months, especially those who have retired. Um, so I kind of have this kind of living in between um, being both of the United States and um, Belize. Um, and then I'm also thinking, you know, in terms of the Belizean society as being cultural, uh, multicultural and kind of like a cultural pluralist society where each kind of ethnic group adds to this um, national and collective Belizean identity. Um, forms of like racism, um, particularly thinking about um, anti-Blackness through um, non-Black Belizean groups um, is very, I guess, thinking in the context of Central American um, migrants to the United States, it's very particular given um, thinking of language. There's literature out there where mestizo Belizeans often um, find themselves um, living in Black communities in Los Angeles given their proximity to Blackness in Belize. So there's a lot of different dynamics happening um, within Belizean migration to the United States. Um, it was really productive. This was great. This was fabulous. Thank you. Now, I think this was an exceptional panel. Um, I don't know, I'm biased, but I, you know, I, I just thought the, the issues you guys raised were incredible. And, you know, there, there was so much, um, so many resonances across the different experiences um, that, you know, that really, you know, add to the richness of it. And there's, there's much more we can, we can talk about how, how you identify people by their sexual orientation for protection in really homophobic countries, you know, how does that work? Um, how do Belizeans who are increasingly also Guatemalans, 
how do they relate Caribbean? When do they relate as Caribbean? When do they relate as Central American? I mean, of course, there are lots of other questions you can answer, but this was very rich. And I feel really badly that I'm rushing everybody like this because, you know, I'd love for the conversation to continue. But the next panel, we have to give um, our communication team Hola a todos y a todas. Vamos a empezar. Um, tenemos un público aquí en presencia y un público online. Nosotros estamos en el Watson Institute, en la Universidad de Brown, aquí en Providence, Rhode Island. Pues, um, bienvenidas, bienvenidos. Terminamos este congreso del Centro de Estudios Latinoamericanos y Caribeños de Brown con una entrevista pública a dos escritoras que, pues, con sus novelas se han convertido en dos voces muy poderosas y carismáticas, y carismáticas de la literatura latinoamericana ultra contemporánea. Es realmente un gran honor eh, para mí como, como lectora eh, y para todos nosotros compartir hoy la pasión y el asombro que han suscitado muchos de nosotros, lectores, eh, Karina Sainzborgo, eh, y la novela Come Tierra, de la escritora argentina Dolores Reyes, que tenemos la suerte de tener online, no desde Argentina, un, para el Festival Internacional de Literatura, con otras escritoras argentinas. Pues nuestro panel de esta tarde noche eh, va a dar en español. Están aquí en y quieren escuchar las intervenciones eh, en inglés, pueden utilizar audífono. Eh, desde su teléfono o computadora. Bueno, pues antes de conversar con Karina eh, Sainzborgo y Dolores Reyes sobre su obra y sobre la experiencia de la migración y de la violencia de género como parte integrante de sus obras, de las historias de los personajes que ellas relatan, eh, quisiera eh, introducir cada una de ellas, de ellas y agradecerlas una vez más por aceptar esta invitación y formar parte de este panel. Empezaré con Karina Sainzborgo. Pues Karina nació en una Caracas de 1982 cuando todo estaba a punto de incendiarse. Aunque escribe a todas horas, 
trabaja como periodista especializada en temas culturales y columnista en el diario español ABC, Senda y Onda Cero. Ha publicado los libros de periodismo Caracas y Hip Hop, 2007, en Caracas, y Tráfico y Guaire, El País y, los y sus Intelectuales, Caracas, 2007. También el volumen Crónicas Barbitúricas, Círculos de, Círculo de Tiza. Su relato, Tijeras, fue publicado por la prestigiosa revista Granta y reconocido con el premio O. Henry, el mayor y más antiguo galardón de ficción corta de Estados Unidos. Felicidades. <risa> Su primera novela, La hija de la española Luma, en 2019, fue aclamada por la crítica y los lectores, obtuvo el Grand Prix de l'Héroïne Madame Figaro y el International Literary Prize, fue finalista del Kulturset Stedt Stern Stockholm y fue nominada al Liberatur Prize. Considerado y griego y culturas clásicas con Victoria Juliá y Leandro Pinkler en la UBA. Trabajó su novela Come Tierra con Selva Almada y Julián López. La novela fue publicada en 2019 en Argentina y España por la editorial Sigilo y en Colombia por Rey Naranjo. La novela fue finalista premio de la novela Fundación Medife Filba, finalista premio memorial Silverio Cañada, finalista premio Mario Vargas Llosa y finalista premio nacional de novela Sara Gallardo. Muchas felicidades también. Come Tierra se tradujo y publicó al inglés por Harper Collins, al italiano por Solferino, al francés por Edición de l'Observatoire, al sueco a través de Palabra Forlag, al polaco por Mova y se encuentra en proceso de traducción y publicación al holandés griego, portugués, noruego y danés. En la actualidad, Dolores Reyes dicta talleres de escritura. Escribe un libro de cuentos y está finalizando Miseria, la, la novela uh -huh, que será la segunda parte de Come Tierra. O sea, que ya aquí la estamos esperando Dolores. Además, trabaja en el proyecto Untold Microco Microcosms para el British Museum de Londres y el Hay Festival. A publicar... Pues... Ustedes ven el honor que tenemos esta tarde. Eh, y para empezar, pues yo quisiera pedirles a cada una de ustedes, Karina y Dolores, mir brevemente sus novelas para aquellas personas que en el público todavía no las han, no han tenido la oportunidad de leerlas. Yo creo que esta breve contextualización... Pues, ¿Ya? No. Cuando me dicen ellos, yo te digo. No, yo no, yo tengo que estar así. Eh, Dolores, ¿puedes intentar hablar de vuelta? Por supuesto, bueno, buenas noches. Ok, a te todos. escuchamos, bien. Bueno, buenas noches a todos desde acá, desde Suecia, desde Umea. Bueno, Come Tierra, esta es. Eh, es la primera, la edición de, de Argentina, y aquí tengo la de Suecia, que acaba de nacer hace poquito. Y es la historia de una, una vidente eh, que cuando empieza la novela es muy niña, tiene cinco o seis años, cuando descubre que puede, saber, puede ver lo que pasó con un cuerpo o una persona muerta comiendo tierra que habitó ese cuerpo. ¿no? Hay una suerte de premisa que contradice nuestra tradición católica en el libro, ¿no? Eh, pensar que cuando nos morimos el cuerpo, la sangre, los pelos y las uñas van a la tierra y algo que llaman alma iría a, a, al suelo, ¿no? como es, al cielo, como esa concepción bastante platónica de Leidos. Bueno, como tierra revierte eso, ¿no? Y, y considera que en realidad la historia, el espíritu también va a la tierra, ¿no? Sigue, sigue al cuerpo y a la, a la materia en descomposición. Y lo que pasa cuando comienza la novela es que justamente obligan a esa nena a seguir el cortejo fúnebre de su madre hasta un cementerio. Eh, su madre acaba de morir, es, nadie le explica por qué, qué es lo que ha pasado. Miles de mujeres que han desaparecido o, o niños por violencias machistas muchas veces en nuestros países latinoamericanos. ¿no? Entonces empiezan como a peregrinar buscando a Cometierra para que les dé una respuesta que quizás llevan décadas buscando. Sin, uh, sin ninguna transición voy a pasar. Gracias, Dolores. Eh, sin, uh, sin ninguna transición voy a pasar de la palabra a Karina y ustedes van a ver qué pasa entre estas dos historias y cómo se dan la mano. 
escuchando a, a Dolores, que además para mí es un verdadero honor compartir con ella porque es una escritora inmensa en el sentido del poder que tiene, ¿no? De, de generar imágenes. Y creo que las dos nos comunicamos muy bien en la idea de tránsito, imágenes. Y creo que las dos nos comunicamos muy bien en la idea de tránsito, porque tanto su la identidad de, de, yo creo que no estoy haciendo, yo hasta ahí no, no, no creo que esté revelando mucho, pero eh, en el sentido de que es una vecina extranjera, eh, española, que, que muere y ella decide robar la identidad. A partir de ahí vamos a empezar a ver cómo ella comienza a convertirse de víctima, pasa a ser verdugo, el, el, la sensación de la violencia, la violencia ejercida por mujeres en este libro es muy importante eh, para mí, eh, quizás porque a diferencia de Dolores, eh, yo tengo la sensación de que podía con la ficción uh, resarcir y reparar eh, las mujeres en la sociedad en la que yo crecí, que es una sociedad de Caribe, caribeña, tienen dentro de casa un poder que no, no se les reconoce fuera, son los pilares de las casas, los hombres no existen, no existen en la realidad y no existen en mis novelas. Siempre son fantasmagorías y eso está muy claro en La Hija de la Española, que es una historia básicamente de tránsito, ¿no? de destierro, de desarraigo. Es alguien que se va de un sitio que, que ya, del que ya no se siente parte. Y El Tercer País, que es la, la, la novela más reciente, parte de, de una experiencia también de tránsito en una frontera. Se llama El Tercer País justamente por eso. Porque el cementerio donde ocurre esto, que es un cementerio ilegal, donde una sepulturera eh, muy particular, con un carácter muy vistoso, ¿no? muy dicharachero, muy hedonista. Es una relación entre visitación eh, Salazar y Angustias Romero, de amistad, oposición, ella intenta convertirse también en enterradora, entonces se vuelve ahí una novela de, de compasión, donde ellas van a dedicarse a, entregar, en, a enterrar a los migrantes que mueren en el camino o que no tienen quien los entierre, entonces como darles una digna sepultura. Y yo creo que de alguna manera entre esas dos novelas sigue estando ahí presente ¿no? esa obsesión de, de, del desarraigo, del, del desesperado, del, del que no tiene a dónde ir y, y empuja hacia adelante. Bueno, yo creo que eh, cada uno acá se ha dado cuenta de lo, de lo poderosas que son esas historias y de cómo pueden realmente cambiarnos como... No, no somos lo mismo ¿no? cuando entramos a estas obras y cuando salimos de ellas, porque en realidad no salimos, o sea, no se puede salir de estas novelas. Eh, ya dijeron, anticiparon eh, de lo que vamos un poco a plantear hoy en esta conversación juntas, y yo la verdad las quiero agradecer muchísimo por también a, a, a haber aceptado esa idea. Manos y... Um, y, 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 y dos escritoras eh, pues que, que justamente mm, aceptan, eh, vuelvo a decir, literatura de la diáspora entre migración forzada y violencia de género. Yo sé que en el caso de eh, Dolores no estamos en una situación de diáspora, también esta noción de diáspora sabemos que es problemática también para los escritores eh, y el pueblo venezolano, eh, pero si hablamos de... Eh, migración forzada y violencia de género, eh, ¿les parece que hay como una ecuación entre estos, estos, esos dos, um, dos términos, esos dos fenómenos, eh, van de la mano siempre en la historia de la migración dentro de América Latina y del Caribe? Bueno, eh, quizás... Eh... Primero quiero decir que también estoy muy contenta de, de estar en esta mesa con Karina, que me acercó su libro La, la hija de la española, bueno, su editora muy, muy eh, enfáticamente me dijo que la leyera, ¿no? La hija de la española ya, María Fase, eh, en Madrid o en Barcelona, yo no recuerdo, y que ahí tuve la, la oportunidad de, de leer es, esa novela enorme realmente. Y que por otro lado, bueno... Pensando su libro, quizás eh, esto, ¿no? la diáspora, sea mucho más visible, ¿eh? pero mm, quizás con Cometierra es, es más sutil, pero también está muy presente. ¿no? Vengo a Suecia y a Noruega, en países tan lejanos que no pensé que nunca iba a visitar, del otro lado del mundo, y lo que me encuentro es una enorme comunidad de eh, hijos eh, de exiliados de los 70, ¿no? Yo nací en el 78 en, en Argentina, eh, donde, bueno, quienes escribían, quienes tuvieron la política sueca, bueno, es en Argentina, ¿no? Porque la confundieron, en realidad, 
con una miembro de Montoneros y nunca quisieron devolverla ni cuando estaba viva y sabiendo que habían cometido un error, porque era poner de manifiesto a nivel internacional las eh, desapariciones forzadas de personas que estaban ocurriendo de a mil en, en esos momentos. ¿no? Entonces, vuelvo a decir, la figura de, del desaparecido que está tan presente en Come Tierra de principio a fin, ¿no? Eh, también eh, de alguna forma tiene que ver con esta diáspora, ¿no? que yo creo que todos los lato latinoamericanos conocemos eh, mayor o menor medida, ¿no? antes o después eh, todos conocemos exiliados, ¿no? No, es, eh, y hemos vivido esa, esa situación no del paseo, ¿no? sino re realmente de, de países muy expulsivos por la cantidad de, miser de miseria y de violencias que tienen que atravesar bueno, los ciudadanos. Vuelvo a decir que Come Tierra está atravesada por algo que es una necesidad absoluta, absolutamente humana y que por eso aparece en, la, en las tres novelas por lo que estoy viendo, ¿no? que es la necesidad de enterrar a nuestros muertos, algo que parece tan básico y que está en una y otra vez en toda Latinoamérica, eh, ese orden natural absolutamente quebrado, ¿no? No solo son los padres los que muchas veces tienen que enterrar a sus hijos, sino que encima son quienes tienen que salir a buscar a sus hijas y a sus hijos en la tierra, ¿no? Totalmente de acuerdo con, con Dolores. De hecho, eh, quería aprovechar para dar las gracias tanto a Brown, eh, a ti, Erika, al centro, porque esta experiencia en estos días ha sido para mí realmente... Eh, me ha removido mucho, ¿no? Porque muchas de las cosas que yo creo que puedo responder en esta, en esta, en esta conversación la han contestado una serie de estudiantes en, en una mesa previa donde hablaban y para reconstruir su historia de migración sus árboles familiares estaban compuestos por mujeres solamente, ¿no? Entonces eso no es casual. Yo creo que tanto en La Hija de la Española, que hay un tema evidente de migración, está ambientada en la Venezuela contemporánea, cosas que yo omito cada vez que puedo, eh, porque creo que aunque es un rasgo importante, es universal, es decir, la violencia y, la, y el desarraigo y, y la persecución, como dice Dolores, no te vamos a dejar ni dónde enterrarte, ¿no? porque además a la madre de Adelaida le roban las, las letras, en el, es una sociedad absolutamente colapsada, ¿no? donde la violencia eh, para mí es importante porque la, eh, to, los individuos, independientemente de hombres o mujeres, son, están a merced de quien, de quien los vigila, de quien los persigue, sin embargo, sí hay una violencia que se puede, por ejemplo, hay muchísimas violaciones a chicos, eh, uh -huh. como los violan con un fusil, ¿no? en, mientras los torturan, que además eso está documentado eh, en, en derechos humanos, ¿no? en, en informes de derechos humanos, pero también vemos esa violencia nada a través del, del feminismo como los derechos, igualdad de derechos, ¿no? sin embargo la revancha me puede. Eh, hay una sensación de agravio, ¿no? que yo creo que, que es probablemente se parezca mucho a, a los árboles de generacionales que... Eh, sí, ahí está Sofía. Eh, que realmente ya decía, hay una invisibilidad de los hombres por completo. Pero en este libro hay decisiones muy particulares, es decir, son, tenemos dos heroínas que son las que se enfrentan a un territorio hostil, eh, incluso entre ellas suelen ser hostiles, pero, pero son solidarias. Pero hay cosas, por ejemplo, hay, hay un personaje del libro que como buena, como buena adolescente que cruza la frontera y queda desguarecida es objeto de abuso de concentración de despojo, y de despojo no de te voy a volver absolutamente polvo las circunstancias vuelven polvo a quienes caminan, por eso es que Angustias dice tierra, tierra, yo solo llevo tierra encima porque no tengo una, 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 una tierra propia, solo el polvo que me viene en el camino, no y yo creo que esa es la sensación de todo el que se marcha y cada vez que veo a la gente de Ucrania saliendo corriendo, o cuando veía la, a Kabul, o cuando veía la, la calle de Kabul, sí. o, o, o todo el tema de Centroamérica, veo lo mismo. O sea, veo, veo, veo rebaños de gente huyendo. Y ya para, para no extenderme, hay un, hay un episodio que a mí sí me gusta, es, bueno, no es que me gusta, sí, sí lo hice conscientemente. Hay, hay muchos niveles del mal en este libro, donde muchas veces la víctima, el verdugo, realmente es una víctima. Y, y yo invito a tener compasión y de repente sentirse emocionado con el tío que lleva toda la novela temorizando a los personajes y te, mm. se van a dar cuenta de algo, ese por un lado, otro por el otro, la redención, creo que esta novela es un poco más, un poco más luminosa que la hija, porque por lo menos hay redención, pero ya para redondear, hay una violación masculina en el libro que yo quería que fuera deliberadamente lenta, quería recrearme deliberadamente, porque yo tenía la sensación, cuando leía novelas del boom, que si aparecía, bueno, del boom, digamos, no voy a ser injusta, digamos, gallegos, el criollismo, toda mi tradición eh, 
eh, bueno, y, tam y también en las novelas de Carlos Fuentes, que yo sabía que si veía un petate y una india iba a una violación segura. Y que, iba, y que iban a pasar dos o tres, que no pasa nada, ¿eh? O sea, que yo también me gusta Philip Roth, me gusta la literatura, pero sentía que culturalmente había un approach, que los hombres nunca eran objeto de ninguna agresión de ese uh -huh. tipo, ¿no? Siempre morían con cierta heroicidad o cobardía, pero morían en otro contexto, ¿no? Y hay una violación que, que está deliberadamente hecha, eh, porque además hay una humillación implícita en esa. Y bueno, sí fue mi idea. Um, que... Esta idea ¿no? de, de, de juntarlas en este tándem eh, por su relación, la relación evidente, su escritura con la migración. Y, y yo quise preguntarle a Karina y a Juan: pues me gustaría que otra escritora también pues, estuviera eh, en, este, en, este, en este diálogo. Y pensamos, o sea, y ellos pensaron en Dolores Reyes, que en aquel momento no había leído y no había tenido el, el, la revelación. ¿no? Y entonces ahí. Pues eh, Juan Milá dijo, pues Dolores no trabaja directamente con la migración, si quieres a ese nivel como Karina, pero sí, ella trabaja con violencia de género, después lo hablamos aquí eh, con mi colega Kate Goldman, y, y ella justamente que trabaja con eh, migrantas y, y, y violencia de género, Kate dijo, pues la violencia de género es uno de los factores mayores de migración desde América Latina, y ahí me dio la clave justamente para seguir adelante con este proyecto que como ustedes ven es un proyecto de reflexión comunitaria. Entonces, eh, Dolores, damos la palabra para leer y después sigue Karina eh, con eh, un pasaje de La hija de la española, traducida al inglés por Elizabeth Breyer, eh, Harper Collins, y el título de La hija de la española en inglés es It would be night in Caracas. También leerá después Ani. Gracias, Ani. Que además hace una tarde tan hermosa de sol que yo agradezco que Ani esté aquí. Yo estaría en los jardines de la universidad uh, tomando el sol. Bueno, eh, Dolores, mejor que ella esté en la habitación, porque vimos, vemos en Instagram ahí que en Umea hay muros de nieve. Sí. Lo que estás filmando son ríos. muros de nieve. ¿Cómo? Hay ríos, hay castillos de hielo directamente por las calles. Es algo muy impresionante para nosotros. Me imagino para Karina y, y el Caribe, ¿no? Pensar algo así, ¿no? El agua afuera se congela en el trayecto antes de, de llegar al suelo, es muy impresionante. No hablo de nieve, ¿eh? ya hielo. Bueno, Pasa lo a... mismo aquí, nosotros estamos acostumbrados, te entendemos y lo sufrimos y recién nos, liber nos liberamos. Eh, bueno, o sea que ya bueno, no tenés a... miedo al frío. Voy a leer el capítulo 26 de Cometierra. ¿Qué dice? Te escuchamos. Había una botella rara con una tarjeta y un número de teléfono. Aunque era de día y pegaba mucho el sol, cuando la levanté y la leí pensé en una noche larga. La habían puesto adentro. No quise dejarla en el jardín, entre las plantas y las otras botellas. Me la llevé a la pieza y terminé poniéndola al lado de la cama. Me gustaba agitarla, que se mezclara todo y después mirar cómo la tierra quedaba abajo y el agua arriba, como en un juego de cruzar cosas para que se acomodaran solas. Algo fácil, algo que a mí. No me pasaba nunca, pero la tarjeta tenía el nombre de una chica y sabía bien que ese nombre venía con una historia y que esa historia ya no iba a gustarme tanto. Si no dejaba la botella en el jardín, en algún momento manos, brazos, piernas peleaban por escaparse del agua. Lo que se perdía era el aire que daba ella, la chica, en el fondo del agua que a fuerza de tocarla toda la iba borrando de mis ojos. Antes de volver a abrirlos porque me dolían, Pensé que la noche y el fondo del agua se parecían bastante. An odd bottle with a card and a phone number. Even though it was day and the sun was bright, when I picked it up and read it, I thought of a long, dark night. The bottle had appeared at the gate a few days ago. It was the color of water and of the earth inside it. I didn't want to leave it in the garden among the plants and the other bottles. I took it to my room and set it next to the bed. I liked giving it a shake and watching everything mixed together, the earth settling at the bottom and the water on top. Like a game where things are tossed up but then fall in line on their own. Something simple, the sort of thing that's never happened to me. But on the card was a girl's name. And I knew there was a story behind that name, a story I wouldn't like. If I didn't leave the bottle in the garden, I'd have to deal with it eventually. 
uncap it, eyes. Before I opened them again, my eyes stung. I thought of how alike they were, the night and the watery depths. Yo voy a leer de la hija de la española. <coughs> Robaron el florero y ocho letras del epitafio. De la tumba de Adelaida Falcón arrancaron completa la palabra descansa. Quedó él en paz como una deuda que nadie pagaría. También faltaba el apellido y la consonante del pueblo donde ella nació y en el que yo crecí por temporada. Las habían arrancado una a una hasta dejar letras apagadas, tartamudas como la F de Falcón en el rótulo de la pensión de mis tías. Por perder, perdimos hasta el nombre. Ellas, nosotras, las Falcón, las reinas de un mundo en trance de morir. Tuve que coger el jarrón vacío de otra lápida para que los claveles blancos no se secaran en la solana de mi propia vergüenza. Había transcurrido un mes desde su muerte, y a pesar de que yo ya no era la misma, quise serlo ante ella. Quise decirle cuánto la había amado, pueblo, Hermoso y salado, pero al fin y al cabo un lugar pequeño, asfixiado. Que prefirieras otras cosas al bingo de la hora de la plaga y los guarapos de ron y canela que adormecían el alma de quienes vivían en Ocumare de la costa. Me gustaba que no te parecieras a tus hermanos, que fueras discreta y desconfiada, que despreciaras la superstición y la tapiedad, que leyeras y enseñaras a los demás a hacerlo. Te parecías, mamá, al país que yo di, por cierto, al de los museos y teatros a los que me llevaba, al de los que cuidaban la presencia y los modales. No te gustaban las personas que comían o bebían demasiado. Tampoco las que daban voces o lloraban a gritos. Odiabas el exceso. Pero las cosas han cambiado. Ahora todo se desborda. La suciedad, el miedo, la pólvora, la muerte y el hambre. Mientras agonizabas, el país enloqueció. Para vivir tuvimos que hacer cosas que jamás imaginamos que llegaríamos a hacer. Predar o callar. Saltar al cuello de alguien más o mirar hacia otro lado. Me tranquiliza que no vivas para verlo. Y si ahora me llamo de otra forma, no es porque haya querido abandonar el país que tu nombre y el mío formaban. Si lo hice, mamá, fue porque me pudo el miedo. Y yo, ya lo sabes, nunca fui tan valiente como tú. Nunca. Hablaban un planeta que se amplifica ahora en mi memoria. Te cambié el tiempo. Está bien. Está bien, They'd stolen the vase, as well as four letters from the epitaph. They'd wrenched the word descansa from Adelaida Falcone's grave. The end pause remained, like a debt that no one would ever pay. Her surname was missing too, as well as the, as well as the consonants from the town where she was born and where I spent part of my childhood. They had wrenched them off one by one until only extinguished letters remained, stammered like the F in Falcone in the sign at my aunt's guest house. For losing, we even lost our name, the Falcones, queens of a world that was in its death throes. I took an empty vase from another tombstone so that the white carnations wouldn't wither in the heat of my own shame. It was a month since she died. And even though I was no longer the same person, I wanted to be Adelaida Falcone while I stood before her. I wanted to tell her how much I loved her. Like my mother, I was dead too. She was below ground, I was on the surface. Eh, es como la única forma que tienen esas mujeres de, de resistir eh, a la violencia, de comunicarse más allá de la violencia, de, de sobrevivir creando comunidad, instaurando esta solidaridad que es sororidad. ¿Cómo, cómo pensamos? O sea, no hay personajes femeninos que ustedes dejen solas. Están, se acompañan entre ellas, se, 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 se sobreviven juntas. Eso me salió simplemente al escucharlo, no lo tenía pensado. Bueno, en el caso de, de Cometierra siento que es, eh, como todas las mujeres aquí en Argentina, una sobreviviente, eh, que en realidad eh, hay algo muy pequeño y, y caprichoso para que una esté habitando sobre la tierra y la otra esté descomponiéndose abajo, ¿no? que es justamente el azar de no haberse encontrado con el macho asesino. Eh, siento también que hay en la tierra una sabiduría que ha sido muy, muy castigada justamente y, y reprimida, 
que tiene que ver con las culturas antiguas, ¿no? Desde Grecia, Gaia, ¿no? La Teonía, o Demeter, o, bueno, las, las culturas americanas, la Pachamama y demás. La Tierra es un principio femenino, y es un principio femenino de, de sabiduría que engloba no solo la vida biológica, sino también la muerte, ¿no? Como el ciclo completo. Y que de alguna forma, en esa suerte de comunidad a la que estás haciendo referencia, bueno, también eh, iba a ser parte de, bueno, de ahí también eh, la marca de ese nombre, ¿no? Ella nunca dice yo soy come tierra, sino que come tierra es para los otros una y otra vez, ¿no? Eh, pero separo esos personajes de, del mundo de los adultos porque siento que también tienen un lado eh, absolutamente vitalista y que son, bueno, ellos los que tienen al menos la oportunidad de cambiar algo. Yo, yo creo que, que Dolores tiene toda la razón, es decir, esta, estos personajes son eh, una, una superviviente, ¿no? siempre terminan resistiendo, y yo por eso no creo que, nunca, no es que nunca las deje sola, es que ellas se las apañan, ¿no? eh, y en el caso del tercer país, o sea, Adelaida se apaña por sí misma, y realmente Adelaida es la gran, es la gran desesperación del que huye, pero en el caso de, de, de Angustia Romero y Visitación Salazar, la enterradora y la madre que va a enterrar, eh, y en eso lo pensé, no sé si lo, dijí, lo dijo Dolores o lo dijiste tú, que la tierra encierra una sabiduría, ¿no? Y tiene una cosa muy alegórica. Y cuando yo leí la Antígona, a mi, a mi Antígona siempre me ha llamado la atención, una persona que desobedece una ley arbitraria de un tirano, por supuesto, eh, bueno, dentro de la ley, dentro de la tragedia de Sopocle, para enterrar, ¿no? A, a su hermano. Eh, la, la Antígona tuvo muchísimo impacto en la guerra civil en, en toda la diáspora de la guerra civil española por aquella idea de dos hermanos que se matan y quien no entierra. Y cuando yo leí la versión de la Antígona hace años que hizo Bergamín, en la quijada se me cayó, se me, se me, se me desmontó. Además, Bergamín es un exilado mexicano, un, eh, perdón, español en México. Y él dice algo así como Antígona, desterrada del mundo de los vivos se ha mudado a vivir entre los muertos. Entonces yo encontraba que esta idea ¿no? de, 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 de poder enterrar a tus muertos, que es lo que dice Dolores, además nosotros estamos acostumbrados a una cierta indignidad, de, 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 en, no vale la vida y vale todavía menos. ¿no? Caprichos del tirano de turno, ¿no? a leyes, llamémosla de la naturaleza, de, de, según las creencias de cada uno, ¿no? de los dioses, de, de la humanidad, bueno, en aquello que depositemos nuestra fe, eh, es una ley superior al... al al tirano de turno, la necesidad de enterrar a nuestros muertos, ¿no? la de soplar palabras dulces para despedirlos, ¿no? por eso existen las lápidas, los epitafios y los cementerios son absolutamente universales, yo siento que esto va muchísimo más allá que Latinoamérica, ¿no? pensaba también en el origen de la teogonía y cómo se rompe ahí eso que Sosiur demuestra, ¿no? lo inmotivado de, del signo, el, el género inmotivado, ¿no? y ¿Por qué digo esto? Porque eh, en el principio fue el caos y después eh, la separación, ¿no? El cielo como principio masculino y la tierra como principio femenino para todas las culturas antiguas, ¿no? Entonces, de alguna forma, esa tierra no solo es la de la hija de la española, por supuesto, y come tierra, pero siento que es una tierra muchísimo más universal y que quizás eso es algo que consciente o no eh, hace también a la lectura de estas novelas en justamente otras tierras, ¿no? en otras costas, en otras lenguas, en otros idiomas, en, en otras eh, culturas, ¿no? en otras experiencias vitales. Hay algo de estas historias que llega de todas formas, ¿no? Como llega un exiliado o como Come Tierra se va, ¿no? Junto a, al Walter y a, a Miseria, ¿no? Este desplazamiento que a veces responde también, bueno, a una infinidad de violencias, ¿no? No hay un exilio porque los personajes no se van de Argentina, ¿no? Pero sí hay un exilio de ese mundo que conoce. En Cien Años Solares, Juan, Juan Gabriel Vázquez lo, re, lo recontextualiza. Uno es del lugar donde están enterrados sus muertos. ¿no? Y después me dijo Fernando Iguaz aquí un amigo, no, Karina, no. Uno es del lugar donde nacen sus hijos. Eh, no lo sé, la verdad, ¿no? Porque Porque tú, pero tiene, tiene algo de eso, ¿no? Pero sí es verdad que la Tierra te, te, de alguna manera te, te remite a aquello que a lo que siempre vuelves, es que vas a volver a la Tierra. 
nada, vas a regresar, es el único uh -huh. sitio seguro al que, al que vas a volver. Y lo que me parece que, que a lo mejor, no sé si en el caso de Dolores, pero a mí sí, a mí lo que me intranquiliza es que esa tierra de repente nadie te puede quitar la tierra pero pasa, ¿no? Entonces, o, o por ejemplo, en el tercer país, eh, uh -huh. la enterradora Visitación Salazar se dedica a enterrar eh, muertos porque ella le daba pena de pequeña ver cómo la gente volvió a la tierra sin ninguna dignidad, porque que les caía la tierra en la cara y en los ojos. Y en la... Entonces, hay una serie de cosas ahí que yo también creo, coincido con, con Dolores, que hay mucho más que eso, ¿no? Hay como una angustia, una angustia ahí como de... Mmm, ¿Dónde me voy a morir? O sea, ¿qué me va a pasar? ¿no? ¿Qué, ¿Qué van a hacer? Por conversar, nosotros vamos a seguir estudiando sus, sus libros. Yo creo que sería um, realmente muy interesante pues, seguir um, pensando en todas esas conexiones, también articulándolas con otras escritoras que también están diseñando, digamos, un, dentro de la literatura pues, latinoamericana contemporánea, un poco cuestiones, pensamos desde luego, pues aquí todos en Mariana Enrique, de la cual hablamos y que va a venir a visitarnos pronto, yo creo, pues lo mismo, uh, no sé, eh, Fernanda Melchor, que hemos leído también recientemente, o sea, hay, hay como, sea cual sea, digamos, el lugar en el cual eh, acontecen esas historias, hay como realmente un diagrama ahí muy, um, muy claro ¿no? que se está diseñando, pero que, que lo, lo estamos mapeando, pero, pero y ustedes nos ayuden realmente a ir más al fondo y entenderlo mejor, porque, porque es, es también eh, como algo o sea, muy, muy, muy difícil un poco de, de, de entenderte del todo, del todo, porque se está dando a una escala así muy fuerte, muy poderosa, y, y a veces se nos escapa porque estamos un poco también eh, arrasados por, ese, por esas lecturas. Uh -huh. Entonces, quisiera un poco ver, eh, aquí recoger alguna pregunta del, del, del público, eh, si, si es que las hay. Eh, eh, empezamos entonces con Micaela. Hola, ¿me escuchan? Sí, sí. Sí, y Dolores creo que la ves también, ¿no? La escucho. Sí. Perfecto. Escucha. Okay. ok. Bueno, hablo despacio para que me oiga, pero eh, quisiera volver a algo que dijo la fabulosa Erika Durante al iniciar este panel. Eh, ella dijo que, que entramos en estas obras y no, no salimos. Y esa palabra entrar me hizo pensar en como dar algo tan fijo, tan concreto, tan coherente como como un libro, mientras que los temas que traten son todo lo contrario. Y también especialmente la experiencia de, de Karina, de alguien desterrada, la experiencia de crear algo en el que los lectores se pueden quedar cuando esa fue una cosa que usted no pudo hacer. Dolores, tú, tú primero. Sí. Bueno, eh, de alguna forma yo siento que eh, la literatura, o esto de contar historias, ¿no? a veces a través de un cuento, eh, y a veces a través de una novela, bueno, yo soy muy, muy lectora de Mariana Enríquez, que eh, coincidió conmigo en Oslo, aunque no nos pudimos juntar por las distintas eh, actividades, y justamente vengo de comer con Fe Fernanda Melchor y con Camila Sosa Villada, que estamos las tres acá en este momento en Umia, o sea, siento que esto que decía Erika realmente está sucediendo, ¿no? En, en concreto, siento que la literatura es una herramienta, ¿no? No puede solucionar... Eh, quizás las cuestiones que estamos abordando como nos gustaría, ¿no? Por supuesto, pero sí es una experiencia conformadora, ¿no? Es una experiencia simbólica, esto de atravesar un libro o que el libro atrape a un lector y lo obligue a hacer un recorrido de lectura, a quedarse en el libro, como, como está preguntando acá, quien pregunta... Eh, y salir de alguna forma transformado, ¿no? Siento que la literatura... Estamos de acuerdo que yo te estoy planteando una ficción. Tú lo tomas o lo dejas. Eh, y en ese aspecto creo y coincido plenamente con Dolores. Uh, absolutamente.
Eh, Dolores, tenemos una pregunta aquí de alguien que yo creo que vas a reconocer. Hola, ¿qué tal Dolores? Soy Victoria, compartimos un taller con, con Selva hace un rato, eh, hace unos años, eh, y, y, y escuché Come Tierra cuando, cuando estabas eh, ahí en el taller, así que es un placer increíble que, que nos encontremos acá. Y bueno, quería que nos cuentes, eh, bueno, las dos un poco acerca de, de sus decisiones estéticas, pero también políticas, creo, a la hora de elegir cómo cómo narrar la violencia contra las mujeres. Eh, en Come Tierra creo que bueno, aparecen estas, estas, eh, estas escenas, en, en las visiones de, de Come Tierra, pero están muy cuidadas, ¿no? Y, 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 mí, y yo pensé que son como una contranarrativa, ¿no? de, de, justamente del discurso de los medios, especialmente los de Argentina, que suelen... Eh, poner como un cierto espectáculo alrededor de, de esos cuerpos violentados. Entonces, bueno, quería saber cómo, cómo pensaron eh, cómo contar esa, esa violencia. Bueno, qué sorpresa más agradable e inesperada también, ¿no? <risa> sí, los, los caminos estos de, de la escritura. Yo, entonces, ahí... Yo sabía que quería presentar eso desde otro lugar, ¿no? desde, claramente desde de otra forma, y ese cuidado al que se mención tiene que ver con bueno, la perspectiva. ¿no? Yo elijo contar en la novela desde la hija de un feminicidio, ¿no? y en, en Argentina en particular vienen dándose casos en, bueno, de, de hijos de, de femicidios. Voy a poner un ejemplo corto para que se den cuenta. Hay un libro que se llama La oscuridad dentro de mí, de Aguirre, ¿no? que es también un escritor que es poeta y es periodista, y que este libro es no ficción, ¿no? él va a, a, a entrevistar feminicidas a la cárcel. ¿no? Pero más allá de esto hay un caso en el que no se explican por qué una chica de 20 años... Eh, al ser asesinada a cuchillazos por su pareja, no tiene lesiones eh, de defensa, ¿no? No, no, no se ha movido del lugar, ni tiene carne de ese cuerpo agresor debajo de sus uñas, ni pelo, ni nada, y descubren bueno, que ella es también la hija de un feminicidio. ¿no? O sea, su madre ha sido estrangulada cuando eh, ella era una niña, y la, con, la investigación continúa y determinan que bueno, no, hay, no hay estos movimientos de defensa porque ella en el momento de ser acuchillada está teniendo a su hijo entre sus brazos, no, no lo suelta, entonces bueno, eh, no, no aparece ninguna de estas cuestiones que son comunes en los cuerpos violentados de esa forma. Entonces yo decido tomar esas voces, ¿no? porque siempre me pregunto, bueno, ¿qué pasa con esas vidas, esa historia, con esa erotización y ese morbo horroroso que muchas veces vemos ¿no? de, sobre los cuerpos violentados de las mujeres? Ella narra y cuenta desde su experiencia que es otra, ¿no? entonces da cuenta del dolor, de la pérdida, de la desolación por justamente todas esas mujeres que nos faltan. ¿no? Y eso es... Yo siento que es importante a la hora de escribir la literatura no solo contar una historia, sino hacer un, un trabajo con el lenguaje, ¿no? con la lengua, que cada novela tiene ten, que tener un trabajo particular y una voz y una lengua, y decidí darle voz bueno, justamente a esto que no estaba encontrando en ningún lado, ¿no? la voz de los hijos de los feminicidios. Y de hecho yo me voy a permitir... Eh, no voy a contestar, voy a repreguntar, eh, porque lo que dice Dolores es cierto, es decir, hay una idea de la repetición y de la enumeración de las víctimas que a mí me parece que convierte la tragedia individual en una especie de amontonamiento, y no, bueno, yo no, no, no quiero, bueno, no, a ver, Bolaño, eh, el tratamiento que hizo Bolaño de los feminicidios en 2666, eh, a mí técnicamente me resultaba, me, me, me generaba hartazgo y empacho, porque además terminaba, te, te, terminaba aburriéndote, como si venga uno más, venga uno más, y me llamó la atención porque además Roberto Bolaño fue un gran fenómeno en su traducción a Estados Unidos, o sea, realmente y Bolaño se desplegó, ¿no? Ese, ese paisaje de feminicidio, creo yo, desde una decisión técnica que terminó aplanando el tema, eh, y es lo que, lo que dice eh, Dolores, es decir, 
a mí ahí me, me llama muchísima atención, sobre todo me llama la atención el elemento casi eh, de, de Cassandra que tiene como tierra. No Cassandra. En, en, al menos en esa, la parte de los crímenes, ¿no? Pero más allá de esa novela pienso en, bueno, los detectives salvajes, ¿no? El significado de Caborca y por qué una mujer que se va a vivir sola, una poeta, tiene que vivir con un arma, aunque sea con un arma ah. vieja, y por qué María y las hermanas Fon tienen cuchillitos o arma, pequeñas armas también que tienen que eximir, o sea, sacar para que no las violen, incluso en un cementerio, ¿no? Siento que al menos estaba viendo eso y, y dando cuenta, por supuesto que, bueno, necesitábamos contar nosotras, ¿no? Por supuesto que nosotras vamos a dar cuenta de todo esto desde otro lugar, mucho más eh, en primera, cercano, empático, viendo un montón de cosas. Yo siento aquí en Argentina que en particular hay un, un libro que es bisagra, como vos dijiste, que justamente es, eh, bueno, no es un libro muy conocido afuera, pero es de Jorge Barón Visa, El desierto y su semilla, ¿no? Eh, porque es la primera vez que de nuevo ¿no? se cambia el eje de los hombres y cómo narran los feminicidios, pienso que está en, bueno, en la intrusa de Borges, ¿no? la, la sí. visión bien clara de los hombres ¿no? que se quieren sacar de, de encima a esa mujer y que le, 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 la comparten su cuerpo como si fuese una cosa y, y le quitan el nombre y la identidad y finalmente la matan cuando ya ni siquiera prostituirla o abandonarla o, o golpearla le, le satisface, bueno, terminan matándola y dejándola su cuerpo insepulto para que se lo coman los animales. Eh, cuando, o sea, eso era la narración de los feminicidios, ¿no? Por los grandes escritores de nuestra tradición, hasta el decir la última audiencia de divorcio, y ella empieza a desfigurar ese absolutamente ante la mirada y la presencia de sus abogados y posteriormente de su hijo, quien escribe esta historia en clave de novela, pero bueno, absolutamente autobiográfica, ¿no? Como esa mujer Clotilde Sabatini se va desfigurando hasta morir suicida, ella igual que el feminicida, y más adelante igual que ese hijo que escribió la historia en ese libro, ¿no? Cómo empieza a darse cuenta, bueno, a darse vuelta, digamos, la, la, la voz de quien narra, ¿no? Y a contar, no desde los violentadores, sino desde, bueno de quienes fueron víctimas testigos, y de, dando cuenta de la corporalidad de la mujer y de que la lleva a la muerte, ¿no? Pues yo creo que aquí además de, eh, ya vamos cerrando, eh, yo creo que aquí además de, de haber conocido a dos escritoras, eh, ustedes también conocieron a a dos lectoras, a dos críticas de sí mismas y a dos, a dos mujeres escritoras que realmente están también, yo creo, lo que nos están mostrando ahora es cómo pues, desde, desde sus lecturas, desde sus elecciones poéticas, eh, pues están eh, reconfigurando realmente esta, esta literatura eh, de hoy eh, en una, de una forma inédita ¿no? eh, y un poco también eh, eh, sacándole la verdad a, y, 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 y casi diría de los pantalones pues, a los que eh, pues, han escrito de una forma que hasta cierto punto nos sorprendió porque estábamos acostumbrados pero al escuchar sus, sus voces y, un poco, y a todos ustedes esa oportunidad podamos eh, pronto realizarla aquí, ojalá que Brown se pueda volver un, un lugar, hay much somos muchísimas, en eh, sí son de femenino, eh, quienes trabajamos eh, sobre eh, cada vez más sobre escritoras mujeres, porque es lo que es donde la literatura se hace, donde creemos que realmente merece la pena hoy, y, y ojalá pues podamos volvernos nosotros el próximo lugar festival de el, escritoras latinoamericanas y volver a tenerlas a ustedes dos que fueron pionera, pioneras en, este, en esta ah, iniciativa de, de y, y a todas las demás escritoras realmente compañeras que, que nos alimentan eh, y en las cuales encontramos nuestra casa ¿no? como acabamos de decir les vamos a dejar porque es medianoche ya um, <risa> Y aquí nos acercamos ya del final de la medianoche de este congreso. 
Y pues muchísimas gracias de verdad, Dolores Karina, por hacer el camino hasta aquí, desde Madrid hasta Providence. Eh, realmente providencial tenerlas la, a las dos. La Providencia. Existe. Eh, este sitio es la Providencia. Existe porque ustedes están acá y, y nosotros, tam nosotros también. Eh, una palabra final para agradecer a todo el equipo de CLAX, a todos los colegas, estudiantes, profesores, eh, amigos, queridos, eh, compañeros, compañeras que han venido pues, eh, hoy hasta estas horas del viernes. Y, y a la, eh, muchísimas gracias de nuevo. Gracias. Gracias. Gracias a ti. Gracias. 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 Gracias.